Introduction of Great Epics in American History, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Great Epics in American History, Volume 2. The Planting of the First Colonies, 1562 to 1733, by Francis Whiting Halsey. Introduction. The Planting of the First Colonies. After the discoverers and explorers of the 16th century came, chiefly in the 17th, the founders of settlements that grew into states, French Huguenots in Florida and Carolina, Spaniards in St. Augustine, English Protestants in Virginia and Massachusetts, Dutch and English in New York, Swedes in New Jersey and Delaware, Catholic English in Maryland, Quaker English and Germans in Pennsylvania, Germans and Scotch-Irish in Carolina, French Catholics in Louisiana, Oglethorpe's debtors in Georgia. To some of these came disastrous failures, to the Huguenots and Spaniards in Florida, to the English in Roanoke, Cuddyhunk, and Kennebec. Others who survived had stern and precarious first years, the English in Jamestown and Plymouth, the Dutch in New York, the French in New Orleans. Chief among leaders stand John Smith, Bradford, Penn, Bionville, and Oglethorpe, and chief among settlements, Jamestown, Plymouth, New York, Massachusetts Bay, Wilmington, Philadelphia, New Orleans, and Savannah. The several movements, in their failures as in their successes, were distributed over a century and three quarters, but since the coming of Columbus, a much longer period had elapsed. From the discovery to the arrival of Oglethorpe lie 240 years, or a 100 years more than the period that separates our day from the years when America gained her independence from England. Each center of settlement had been inspired by an impulse separate from that of others, alike as some of them were, in having as a moving cause a desire to escape from persecution, religious or political, or otherwise to better conditions. They were divided by years, if not by generations, in time. The settlers came from lands isolated and remote from one another. They were different as to race, form of government, and religious and political ideals. And, once communities had been founded, each expanded on lines of its own and knew little of its neighbors. The Spaniards who founded St. Augustine continued long to live there, but of social and political growth in Spanish Florida there was none. Spain, in those eventful European years, was fully absorbed elsewhere in continental wars, which taxed all her strength, especially that furious war waged for forty years against Holland, and from which Spain retired ultimately in failure. In those years also was overthrown Philip's Armada, an event in which the scepter of maritime empire passed from Spain to England. Of the French settlements, the chief was New Orleans, French from the beginning, and so to remain in racial preponderance, religious beliefs, and political ideals for a century and a half after Bienville founded it. So, in fact, it still remains in our day. But elsewhere, the French gave to the United States no permanent settlements. Numbers of them came to Florida only to perish by the sword. Others in large numbers settled in South Carolina, only to become merged with other races, among whom the English, with their speech and their laws, became supreme. On Manhattan Island and in the valleys of the Hudson and Lower Mohawk settled the Dutch, a few years after the English at Jamestown. They erected forts on Manhattan Island and at Albany, Hartford, and near Philadelphia. They partitioned vast tracts of fertile lands among favorite patroons. They built up a successful trade in furs with the Indians and sent the prophets home. Real settlements they did not found, at least not settlements that were infused with the spirit of local enterprise or animated by vital ambitions looking to growth in population and industry. After 40 years of prosperity in trade, they had failed to become a settled and well-ordered colonial state, looking bravely forward to permanence, expansion, and eventual statehood. The first free school in America is credited to their initiative, 
and they were tolerant of other religions than their own, but they planted no other seeds from which a great state could grow. As Coligny before him had sought to plant in Florida a colony of French Huguenots, so Raleigh, who had served under that great captain in the religious wars of the continent, sought to found in Virginia a Protestant state. Much private wealth and many of his best years were given by Raleigh to the furtherance of a noble ambition, but all to futile immediate results. Raleigh's work, however, like all good work, nobly done, was not lost. Out of his failure at Roanoke came English successes in later years. John Smith at Jamestown, the Pilgrims at Plymouth. Oldest of permanent English settlements in America is Jamestown, but the English failures at Cuttyhunk and Kennebec antedate it by a few years, and the failure at Roanoke by a quarter of a century. At Jamestown, ten years after the arrival of the first settlers, a legislative assembly was organized, a miniature parliament modeled after the English House of Commons, and the first legislative body the New World ever knew. Here, too, in Jamestown, began Negro slavery in the United States, and in the same or the next year. Thus, legislative freedom and human slavery had their beginning in America at the same time and in the same place. Plymouth and Massachusetts Bay, next among the English settlements, followed in due time the failure of Gosnold at Cuttyhunk, and the description of New England John Smith wrote and printed in 1614, after a voyage of exploration along her coast. After several years, Plymouth contained only about 300 souls, but the Bay Colony, founded ten years later, increased rapidly. By 1634, nearly 4,000 of Winthrop's followers had arrived, many of them college graduates. From this great parent colony went forth Roger Williams to Rhode Island, Hooker to Hartford, Davenport to New Haven, so that by the middle of the 17th century, five English colonies had been planted within the borders of New England. Long after all these came the Maryland and Pennsylvania settlements, founded by Lord Baltimore and William Penn as Lord's proprietor, owners of vast tracts of land and possessing privileges more extensive than ever before were bestowed on British subjects. In the new century arrived Oglethorpe, with his insolvent debtors, soon to find Spaniards from St. Augustine hostile to his enterprise. But Oglethorpe was a soldier as well as a colonizer. He had served in continental wars, and, after laying siege to St. Augustine, further aggressions from that source ceased. Thus at last in the New World, the English race, their flag, their language, and their laws, had displaced the Spaniards in that world-important contest for dominion and power, of which the second issue was soon to be fought out on many bloody fields with France. F. W. H. End of Introduction Section 1 of Great Epochs in American History, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Dykstra, Farragut, Iowa. Great Epochs in American History, Volume 2 The Planting of the First Colonies, 1562-1733 By Francis Whiting Halsey Section 1 The Founding of St. Augustine and the Massacre by Menendez 1562-1565 1. The Account by John A. Doyle In 1562, the French Huguenot Party, headed by Coligny, made another attempt to secure themselves a refuge in the New World. Two ships set sail under the command of Jean Ribot, a brave and experienced seaman, destined to play a memorable and tragic part in the history of America. Ribot does not seem to have set out with any definite scheme of colonization, but rather, like Abidas and Barlow, to have contented himself with preliminary exploration. In April, he landed on the coast of Florida. After he had laid the foundations of a fort, called in honor of the King Charlotte Ribault returned to France. 
he would seem to have been unfortunate in his choice alike of colonists and of a commander. The settlers lived on the charity of the Indians, sharing in their festivities, wandering from village to village, and wholly doing away with any belief in their superior wisdom and power which might yet have possessed their savage neighbors. France was torn asunder by civil war, and had no leisure to think of an insignificant settlement beyond the Atlantic. No supplies came to the settlers, and they could not live forever on the bounty of their savage neighbors. The settlers decided to return home. To do this, it was needful to build a bark with their own hands from the scanty resources which the wilderness offered. Whatever might have been the failings of the settlers, they certainly showed no lack of energy or of skill in concerting means for their departure. They felled the trees to make planks, moss served for caulking, and their shirts and bedding for sails, while their Indian friends supplied cordage. When their bark was finished, they set sail. Unluckily, in their impatience to be gone, they did not reckon what supplies they would need. The wind, at first favorable, soon turned against them, and famine stared them in the face. Driven to the last resort of starving seamen, they cast lots for a victim, and the lot, by a strange chance, fell upon the very man whose punishment had been a chief count against de Peria. Life was supported by this hideous relief till they came in sight of the French coast. Even then their troubles were not over. An English privateer bore down upon them and captured them. The miseries of the prisoners seem, in some measure, to have touched their enemies. A few of the weakest were landed on French soil. The rest ended their wanderings in an English prison. The needs of the abandonment of the colony did not reach France till long after the event. Before its arrival, a fleet was sent out to the relief of the colony. Three ships were dispatched, the largest of a 120 tons, the least of 60 tons, under the command of René Ladonier, a young Poitvin of good birth. On their outward voyage, they touched at Tenerife and Dominica and found ample evidence at each place of the terror which the Spaniards had inspired among the natives. In June, the French reached the American shore south of Port Royal. As before, their reception by the Indians was friendly. Some further exploration failed to discover a more suitable site than that which had first presented itself, and accordingly, a wooden fort was soon built with a timber palisade and bastions of earthen work. Before long, the newcomers found that their intercourse with the Indians was attended with unlooked-for difficulties. There were three tribes of importance, each under the command of a single chief, and all more or less hostile to the other. In the south, the power of the chiefs seemed to have been far more dreaded, and their influence over the national policy more authoritative than among the tribes of New England and Canada. La Donniere, with questionable judgment, entangled himself in these Indian feuds, and entered into an offensive alliance with the first of these chiefs whom he encountered, Saturiona. A new source of trouble, however, soon beset the unhappy colonists. Their quarrels had left them no time for tilling the soil, and they were wholly dependent on the Indians for food. The friendship of the savages soon proved but a precarious means of support, the dissensions in the French camp must have lowered the newcomers in the eyes of their savage neighbors. They would only part with their supplies on exorbitant terms. La Donniere himself, throughout, would have adopted moderate and conciliatory measures, but his men at length became impatient and seized one of the principal Indian chiefs as a hostage for the good behavior of his countrymen. A skirmish ensued, in which the French were victorious. It was clear, however, that the settlement could not continue to depend on supplies extorted from the Indians at the point of the sword. The settlers felt that they were wholly forgotten by their friends in France, and they decided, though with heavy hearts, to forsake the country which they had suffered so much to win. Just, however, as all the preparations for departure were made, the long-expected help came. Robot arrived from France with a fleet of seven vessels containing 300 settlers and ample supplies. This arrival was not a source of unmixed joy to La Donniere. His fractious followers had sent home calumnious reports about him, and Robot brought out orders to send him home to stand his trial. 
Rabot himself seems to have been easily persuaded of the falsity of the charges, and pressed La Donniere to keep his command. But he, broken in spirit and sick in body, declined to resume office. All disputes soon disappeared in the face of a vast common misfortune. Whatever internal symptoms of weakness might already display themselves in the vast fabric of the Spanish Empire, its ruler showed as yet no lack of jealous watchfulness against any attempts to rival her successes in America. The attempts of Cartier and Roberville had been watched, and the Spanish ambassador at Lisbon had proposed to the King of Portugal to send out a joint armament to dispossess the intruders. The King deemed the danger too remote to be worth an expedition, and the Spaniards unwillingly acquiesced. An outpost of fur traders in the ice-bound wilderness of Canada might seem to bring little danger with it, but a settlement on the coast of Florida, within some eight days' sail of Havana, with a harbor whence privateers might waylay Spanish ships and even attack Spanish colonies, was a rival not to be endured. Moreover, the colonists were not only foreigners, but Huguenots, and their heresy served at once as a pretext and stimulus to Spanish zeal. The man to whose lot it fell to support the monopoly of Spain against French aggression was one who, if we may judge by his American career, needed only a wider field to rival the genius and the atrocities of Alva. Pedro de Menendez, when he had scarcely passed from boyhood, had fought both against the French and the Turks, and had visited America and returned laden with wealth. He then did good service in command of the Spanish fleet in the French War, and his prompt cooperation with the land force gave him a share in the glories of St. Quentin. A second voyage to America was even more profitable than the first, but his misconduct there brought him into conflict with the Council of the Indies, by whom he was imprisoned and heavily fined. His previous services, however, had gained him the favor of the court. Part of his fine was remitted, and he was emboldened to ask not merely for pardon, but for promotion. He proposed to revive the attempt of De Soto and to extend the Spanish power over Florida. The expedition was to be at Menendez's own cost. He was to take out 500 colonists and, in return, to be made governor of Florida for life and to enjoy certain rights for free trade with the West Indies and with the mother country. The military genius of Menendez rose to the new demands made upon it. He at once decided on a bold and comprehensive scheme which would secure the whole coast from Port Royal to Chesapeake Bay, and would ultimately give Spain exclusive possession of the South Seas and the Newfoundland fisheries. The Spanish captain had a mind which could at once conceive a wide scheme and labor at the execution of details. So resolutely were operations carried on that by June 1565, Menendez sailed from Cadiz with 34 vessels and 4,600 men. After a stormy voyage, he reached the mouth of the St. John's River. Rabot's party was about to land, and some of the smaller vessels had crossed the harbor, while others yet stood out to sea. Menendez hailed the latter, and after some parley, told them that he had come there with orders from the King of Spain to kill all intruders that might be found on the coast. The French being too few to fight, fled. Menendez did not for the present attack the settlement, but sailed southward till he reached a harbor which he named St. Augustine. There the Spaniards disembarked and threw up a fortification destined to grow into the town of St. Augustine, the first permanent Spanish settlement north of the Gulf of Mexico. Various attempts had been made, and with various motives. The slave hunter, the gold seeker, the explorer, had each tried his fortunes in Florida, and each failed. The difficulties which had baffled them all were at length overcome by the spirit of religious hatred. Meanwhile, a council of war was sitting at the French settlement, Charlotte War. Ribot, contrary to the wishes of La Donniere and the rest, decided to anticipate the Spaniards by an attack from the sea. A few sick men were left with La Donniere to garrison the fort. All the rest went on board. 
Just as everything was ready for the attack, a gale sprang up, and the fleet of Rabot, instead of bearing down on St. Augustine, was straggling in confusion off an unknown and perilous coast. Menendez, relieved from immediate fear for his own settlement, determined on a bold stroke. Like Rabot, he bore down the opposition of a cautious majority, and with five hundred picked men marched overland through thirty miles of swamp and jungle against the French fort. Thus each commander was exposing his own settlement in order to menace his enemies. In judging, however, of the relative prudence of the two plans, it must be remembered that an attack by land is far more under control and far less liable to be disarranged by unforeseen chances than one by sea. At first it seemed as if each expedition was destined to the same fate. The weather was as unfavorable to the Spanish by land as to the French by sea. At one time a mutiny was threatened, but Menendez succeeded in inspiring his men with something of his own enthusiasm, and they persevered. Led by a French deserter, they approached the unprotected settlement. So stormy was the night that the sentinels had left the walls. The fort was stormed. La Daniere and a few others escaped to the shore and were picked up by one of Ribot's vessels, returning from its unsuccessful expedition. The rest, to the number of 140, were slain in the attack or taken prisoners. The women and children were spared. The men were hung on trees with an inscription pinned to their breasts, not as to Frenchmen, but as to Lutherans. The fate of Ribot's party was equally wretched. All were shipwrecked, but most apparently succeeded in landing alive. Then began a scene of deliberate butchery, aggravated, if the French accounts may be believed, by the most shameless treachery, as the scattered bands of shipwrecked men wandered through the forest, seeking to return to Fort Caroline, they were mercilessly entrapped by friendly words, if not by explicit promises of safety. Some escaped to the Indians. A few were at last spared by the contemptuous mercy of the foes. Those of the survivors who professed themselves converts were pardoned. The rest were sent to the galleys. Ribot himself was among the murdered. If we may believe the story current in France, his head, sawn in four parts, was set up over the corners of the fort of St. Augustine, while a piece of his beard was sent as a trophy to the king of Spain. Dominique de Gorgier had already known as a prisoner of war the horrors of the Spanish galleys. Whether he was a Huguenot is uncertain. Happily in France, as the history of that and all later ages proved, the religion of the Catholic did not necessarily deaden the feelings of the patriot. Seldom has there been a deed of more reckless daring than that which Dominique de Gorgier now undertook. With the proceeds of his patrimony, he bought three small ships, manned by eighty sailors and a hundred men-at-arms. He then obtained a commission as a slaver on the coast of Guinea, and in the summer of 1567 set sail. With these paltry resources, he aimed at overthrowing a settlement which had already destroyed a force of twenty times his number, and which might have been strengthened in the interval. Three days were spent in making ready, and then de Gorget, with a hundred and sixty of his own men and his Indian allies, marched against the enemy. In spite of the hostility of the Indians, the Spaniards seemed to have taken no precaution against a sudden attack. Menendez himself had left the colony. The Spanish force was divided between three forts, and no proper precautions were taken for keeping up the communications between them. Each was successively seized, the garrison slain or made prisoners, and as each fort fell, those in the next could only make vague guesses as to the extent of the danger. Even when divided into three, the Spanish force outnumbered that of de Gorgier, and savages with bows and arrows would have counted for little against men with firearms and behind walls. But after the downfall of the first fort, a panic seemed to seize the Spaniards, and the French achieved an almost bloodless victory. After the death of Ribot and his followers, nothing could be looked for but merciless retaliation, 
and de Gorgier copied the severity, though not the perfidy, of his enemies. The very details of Menendez's act were imitated, and the trees on which the prisoners were hung bore the inscription, not as Spaniards, but as traitors, robbers, and murderers. Five weeks later, de Gorgier anchored under the walls of Rochelle, and that noble city, where civil and religious freedom found a home in their darkest hour, received him with the honor he deserved. End of section 1section two of great epochs in american history volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by jim dykstra farragut iowa great epochs in american history volume two the planting of the first colonies 1562 to 1733, by Francis Whiting Halsey. Section 2. The Founding of St. Augustine and the Massacre by Menendez, 1562 to 1565. 2. Mendoza's Account. Footnote. Francisco Lopez de Mendoza was the chaplain of the expedition. His account is printed in Old South Leaflets. End of footnote. We saw two islands, called the Bahama Islands. The shoals which lie between them are so extensive that the billows are felt far out at sea. The general gave orders to take soundings. The ship purchased at Puerto Rico got her ground that day in two and a half fathoms of water. At first we feared she might stay there, but she soon got off and came to us. Our galley, one of the best ships afloat, found herself all day in the same position, when suddenly her keel struck three times violently against the bottom. The sailors gave themselves up for lost, and the water commenced to pour into her hold. But, as we had a mission to fulfill for Jesus Christ and his blessed mother, two heavy waves, which struck her abaft, set her afloat again, and soon after we found her in deep water, and at midnight we entered the Bahama Channel. On Saturday, the 25th, the Captain General, Menendez, came to visit our vessel and get the ordinance for disembarkment at Florida. This ordinance consisted of two rampart pieces, of two sorts of culverins, of very small caliber, powder and balls, and he also took two soldiers to take care of the pieces. Having armed his vessel, he stopped and made us an address in which he instructed us what we had to do on arrival at the place where the French were anchored. I will not dwell on this subject, on which there was a good deal said for and against, although the opinion of the general finally prevailed. There were two thousand Frenchmen in the seaport into which we were to force an entrance. I made some opposition to the plans, and begged the general to consider that he had the care of a thousand souls, for which he must give a good account. On Tuesday, the 4th, we took a northerly course, keeping all the time close to the coast. On Wednesday, the 5th, two hours before sunset, we saw four French ships at the mouth of a river. Footnote. These ships, commanded by Ribot, seven in number, with 500 men besides families of artisans on board, had arrived at the mouth of the St. John's River on August 29, 1565. The four left outside, as seen by Menendez, were at the time disembarking their passengers. End of footnote. When we were two leagues from them, the first galley joined the rest of the fleet, which was composed of four other vessels. The general concerted a plan with the captains and pilots, and ordered the flagship, the San Paleo, and the Chaloupe to attack the French flagship, the Trinity while the first galley and another sloop would attack the French galley, both of which vessels were very large and powerful. All the ships of our fleet put themselves in good position. The troops were in the best of spirits, and full of confidence in the great talents of the Captain General. They followed the galley, but as our General is a very clever and artful officer, he did not fire, nor seek to make any attack on the enemy. He went straight to the French galley, 
and cast anchor about eight paces from her. The other vessels went to the windward, and very near the enemy. During the maneuvers, which lasted until about two hours after sunset, not a word was said on either side. Never in my life have I known such stillness. Our general inquired of the French galley, which was the vessel nearest his, Whence does this fleet come? They answered, From France. What are you doing here? said the Adelantado. This is the territory of King Felt II. I order you to leave directly, for I neither know who you are nor what you want here. The French commander then replied, I am bringing soldiers and supplies to the fort of the King of France. He then asked the name of the general of our fleet and was told, Pedro Menendez de Avilas, Captain General of the King of Spain, who have come to hang all Lutherans I find here. Our general then asked him the name of his commander, and he replied, Lord Gasto. While this parlaying was going on, a longboat was sent from the galley to the flagship. The person charged with this errand managed to do it so secretly that we could not hear what was said. But we understood the reply of the French to be, I am the Admiral, which made us think he wished to surrender, as they were in so small a force. Scarcely had the French made this reply when they slipped their cables, spread their sails, and passed through our midst. Our admiral, seeing this, followed the French commander, and called upon him to lower his sails in the name of King Philip, to which he received an impertinent answer. Immediately, our admiral gave an order to discharge a small culverin, the ball from which struck the vessel amidship, and I thought she was going to founder. We gave chase and some time after he again called on them to lower their sails. I would sooner die first than surrender, replied the French commander. The order was given to fire a second shot, which carried off five or six men. But, as these miserable devils are very good sailors, they maneuvered so well that we could not take one of them, and, notwithstanding all the guns we fired at them, we did not sink one of their ships. We only got possession of one of their large boats, which was of great service to us afterward. During the whole night, our flagship, the San Paleo, and the galley chased the French flagship, Trinity, and galley. The next morning, being fully persuaded that the storm had made a wreck of our galley, or that at least she had been driven a hundred leagues off to sea, we decided that so soon as daylight came, we would weigh anchor and withdraw in good order to a river, Siloy, which was below the French colony, and there disembark and construct a fort, which we would defend until assistance came to us. On Thursday, just as day appeared, we sailed toward the vessel at anchor, passed very close to her, and would certainly have captured her, when we saw another vessel appear on the open sea, which we thought was one of ours. At the same moment, however, we thought we recognized the French Admiral's ship. We perceived the ship on the open sea. It was the French galley of which we had been in pursuit. Finding ourselves between these two vessels, we decided to direct our course toward the galley for the sake of deceiving them and preventing them from attacking us, so as not to give them any time to wait. This bold maneuver having succeeded, we sought the river Saloy and port, of which I have spoken, where we had the good fortune to find our galley and another vessel which had planned the same thing we had. Two companies of infantry now disembarked, that of Captain André Soyez Patino and that of Captain Juan de San Vicente, who was a very distinguished gentleman. They were well received by the Indians, who gave them a large house belonging to a chief and situated near the shore of a river. Immediately, Captain Patino and Captain San Vicente, both men of talent and energy, ordered an entrenchment to be built around this house, with a slope of earth and fascines, these being the only means of defense possible in that country where stones are nowhere to be found. Up to today, we have disembarked 24 pieces of bronze guns of different calibers, of which 
the least weighed 15 hundredweight. Our fort is at a distance of about 15 leagues from that of the enemy, Fort Carolyn. The energy and talents of those two brave captains, joined to the efforts of their brave soldiers, who had no tools with which to work the earth, accomplished the construction of this fortress of defense, and when the general disembarked he was quite surprised with what had been done. On Saturday, the 8th, the general landed with many banners spread, to the sound of trumpets and salutes of artillery. As I had gone ashore the evening before, I took a cross and went to meet him, singing the hymn, Te Diem Laudamus. The general marched up to the cross, followed by all who accompanied him, and there they all kneeled and embraced the cross. A large number of Indians watched these proceedings and imitated all they saw and done. The same day, the general took formal possession of the country in the name of His Majesty, and all the captains took the oath of allegiance to him as their general and governor of the country. Our general was very bold in all military matters, and a great enemy of the French. He immediately assembled his captains and planned an expedition to attack the French settlement and fort on the river with 500 men and, in spite of the opinion of a majority of them, and of my judgment, and of another priest, he ordered his plan to be carried out. Accordingly, on Monday, September 17, he set out with 500 men, well provided with firearms and pikes, each soldier carrying with him a sack of bread and supply of wine for the journey. They also took with them two Indian chiefs, who were the implacable enemies of the French, to serve as guides. I have previously stated that our brave Captain General set out on the 17th of September with 500 arquebusiers and pikemen, under the guidance of two Indian chiefs, who showed them the route to the enemy's fort. They marched the whole distance until Tuesday evening, the 17th of September, 1565, when they arrived within a quarter of a league of the enemy's fort, Carolyn where they remained all night up to their waists in water. When daylight came, Captains Lopez, Patino, and Martin Ochoa had already been to examine the fort. But when they went to attack the fort, a greater part of the soldiers were so confused, they scarcely knew what they were about. On Thursday morning, our good Captain General, accompanied by his son-in-law, Don Pedro de Valdez, and Captain Patino, went to inspect the fort. He showed so much vivacity that he did not seem to have suffered by any of the hardships to which he had been exposed, and, seeing him march off so brisk, the others took courage, and without exception followed his example. It appears the enemy did not perceive their approach until the very moment of the attack, as it was very early in the morning and had rained in torrents. The greater part of the soldiers of the fort were still in bed. Some arose in their shirts, and others, quite naked, begged for quarter. But in spite of that, more than 140 were killed. A great Lutheran cosmographer and magician was found among the dead. The rest, numbering about 300, scaled the walls and either took refuge in the forest or on their ships floating in the river, laden with treasures so that in an hour's time the fort was in our possession, without our having lost a single man, or even had one wounded. There were six vessels on the river at that time. They took one brig and an unfinished galley, and another vessel, which had been just discharged of a load of rich merchandise, and sunk. These vessels were placed at the entrance to the bar to blockade the harbor, as they expected we would come by sea. Another, laden with wine and merchandise, was near the port. She refused to surrender, and spread her sails, when they fired on her from the fort, and sunk her in a spot where neither the vessel nor cargo will be lost. The taking of this fort gained us many valuable objects, namely, two hundred pikes, a hundred and twenty helmets, a quantity of arquebuses and shields, a quantity of clothing, linen, fine cloths, two hundred tons of flour, 
a good many barrels of biscuit, two hundred bushels of wheat, three horses, four asses, and two she-asses, hogs, tallow, books, furnace, flour mill, and many other things of little value. But the greatest advantage of this victory is certainly the triumph which our Lord has granted us, and which will be the means of the Holy Gospel being introduced into this country, a thing necessary to prevent the loss of many souls. When we had reached the sea, we went about three leagues along the coast in search of our comrades. It was about ten o'clock at night when we met them, and there was a mutual rejoicing at having found each other. Not far off we saw the camp fires of our enemies, and our general ordered two of our soldiers to go and reconnoiter them, concealing themselves in the bushes, and to observe well the ground where they were encamped, so as to know what could be done. About two o'clock the men returned, saying that the enemy was on the other side of the river, and that we could not get at them. Immediately the general ordered two soldiers and four sailors to return to where we had left the boats, and bring them down the river, so that we might pass over to where the enemy was. Then he marched his troops forward to the river, and we arrived before daylight. We concealed ourselves in a hollow between the sand hills with the Indians who were with us, and when it became light we saw a great many of the enemy go down to the river to get shellfish for food. Soon after we saw a flag hoisted as a war signal. Our general, who was observing all that, enlightened by the Holy Spirit, said to us, I intend to change these clothes for those of a sailor, and take a Frenchman with me, one of those whom we had brought with us from Spain, and we will go and talk with these Frenchmen. Perhaps they are without supplies, and would be glad to surrender without fighting. He had scarcely finished speaking before he put his plan into execution. As soon as he had called to them, one of them swam toward and spoke to him, told him of their having been shipwrecked and the distress they were in, that they had not eaten bread for eight or ten days, and, what is more, stated that all, or at least the greater part of them, were Lutherans. Immediately the general sent him back to his countrymen to say they must surrender and give up their arms, or he would put them all to death. A French gentleman, who was a sergeant, brought back the reply that they would surrender on condition their lives should be spared. After having parlayed a long time, our brave Captain General answered that he would make no promises, that they must surrender unconditionally, and lay down their arms because, if he spared their lives, he wanted them to be grateful for it, and, if they were put to death, that there should be no cause for complaint. Seeing that there was nothing else left for them to do, the sergeant returned to the camp, and soon after he brought all their arms and flags, and gave them up to the general, and surrendered unconditionally. Finding they were all Lutherans, the Captain General ordered them all to be put to death, but as I was a priest and had bowels of mercy, I begged him to grant me the favor of sparing those whom we might find to be Christians. He granted it, and I made investigations, and found ten or twelve of the men Roman Catholics whom we brought back. All the others were executed because they were Lutherans and enemies of our holy Catholic faith. All this took place on Saturday, St. Michael's Day, September 29, 1565. Footnote when the French government learned of this massacre, the event did not arouse any particular interest. Indeed, the colony seems not to have had any special protection from the home authorities. Had the contrary been the case, it would have been easily possible for the French to have built up a flourishing colony in America nearly half a century before the English were ever established in the New World. End of footnote. End of section two. Section three of Great Epochs in American History, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marcia Epic Harris. 
Great Epochs in American History, Volume 2, The Planting of the First Colonies, 1562 to 1733, by Francis Whiting Halsey. Section 3. Sir Walter Raleigh's Virginia Colonies, 1584 to 1587, Part 1. The Account by John A. Doyle. The task in which Gilbert had failed was to be undertaken by one better qualified to carry it out. If any Englishman in that age seemed to be marked out as the founder of a colonial empire, it was Raleigh. Like Gilbert, he had studied books. Like Drake, he could rule men. The pupil of Colony, the friend of Spencer, traveler soldier, scholar, courtier, statesman, Raleigh, with all his varied graces and powers, rises before us, the type and personification of the age in which he lived. The associations of his youth and the training of his early manhood fitted him to sympathize with the aims of his half-brother Gilbert, and there is little reason to doubt that Raleigh had a share in his undertaking and his failure. In 1584, he obtained a patent precisely similar to Gilbert's. His first step showed the thoughtful and well-planned system on which he began his task. Two ships were sent out, not with any idea of settlement, but to examine and report upon the country. Their commanders were Arthur Barlow and Philip Amidas. To the former, we owe the extant record of the voyage. The name of the latter would suggest he was a foreigner. Whether by chance or design, they took a more southerly course than any of their predecessors. Coasting along for about a hundred and twenty miles, the voyagers reached an inlet and with some difficulty entered. They solemnly took possession of the land in the Queen's name and then delivered it over to Raleigh according to his patent. They soon discovered that the land upon which they had touched was an island about twenty miles long and not above six broad, named, as they afterward learned, Roanoke. Beyond, separating them from the mainland, lay an enclosed sea, studded with more than a hundred fertile and well-wooded islets. Barlow and Amadis returned to England in the middle of September. With them they brought two of the savages, named Wanchis and Mantio. A probable tradition tells us that the Queen herself named the country Virginia, and that Raleigh's knighthood was the reward and acknowledgment of his success. On the strength of this report, Raleigh at once made preparations for a settlement. A fleet of seven ships was provided for the conveyance of a hundred and eight settlers. The fleet was under the command of Sir Richard Grenville, who was to establish the settlement and leave it under the charge of Ralph Lane. On the 20th of June, the fleet reached the coast of Florida, and three days later narrowly escaped being cast away off Cape Fear. In a few days more, they anchored at Wakakon, an island near Roanoke. In entering the harbor, the largest ship, the Tiger, struck a sandbar and was nearly lost, either through the clumsiness or treachery of the pilot, Simon Fernando, a Portuguese. On the 11th of July, Grenville, with forty others, including Lane, Amadus, and the chief men of the expedition, crossed over to the mainland. Taking northerly direction, they explored the coast as far as Sekadin, an Indian town some sixty miles south of Roanoke where they were hospitably received by the savages. It is melancholy after the bright picture of the intercourse between the natives and the English drawn by Barlow to have to record hostilities, in which by far the greater share of blame lay with our countrymen. On the voyage back to Roanoke, a silver cup was stolen from the English at one of the Indian villages. In revenge, the English put the inhabitants to flight, burnt the village, and destroyed the crops. On the 3rd of August... One ship sailed home, and on the 25th Grenville left the colony, followed, as it would seem during the course of the next month, by the rest of the fleet. The site of the settlement was at the northeast corner of the island of Roanoke, whence the settlers could command the strait. There, even now, choked by vines and underwood, and here and there broken by the crumbling remains of an earthen bastion, may be traced the outlines of the ditch which enclosed the camp, some forty yards square, the home of the first English settlers in the New World. If the failure of his colony was likely to deter Raleigh from further efforts, this was more than outweighed by the good report of the country given by both Lane and Harriet. Accordingly, in the very next year, Raleigh put out another and a larger expedition under the leadership of John White. The constitution of White's expedition would seem to show that it was designed to be more of a colony, properly speaking, 
Finn Lane's settlement at Roanoke. A government was formed by Raleigh, consisting of White and twelve others, incorporated as the governor and assistants of the city of Raleigh. Of the hundred and fifty settlers, seventeen were women, of whom seven seemed to have been unmarried. The immigrants evidently did not go as mere explorers or adventurers. They were to be the seed of a commonwealth. On the 2nd of July, the fleet reached Hatterask, the port at which Grenville had landed on his last voyage. There White took fifty men ashore to search for the fifteen whom Grenville had left there. They found nothing but the bones of one man slain, as they had afterward learned by the Indians. The rest had disappeared, and it was not till some time afterward that their countrymen learned any tidings of their fate. Ignorant, no doubt, of the altered feelings of the natives, Grenville's men had lived carelessly and kept no watch. Pemissipan's warriors had seized the opportunity to revenge the death of their chief, and had sent a party of thirty men against the English settlement. Two of the chief men were sent forward to demand a parley with two of the English. The latter fell into the trap, and sent out two of their number. One of these was instantly seized and killed, whereupon the other fled. The thirty Indians then rushed out and fired the house in which the English settlers took refuge. The English, thus dislodged, forced their way out, losing one man in the skirmish, and at last, after being sorely pressed by the arrows of their enemies and by their skill in fighting behind covert, they reached the boat and escaped to Hatterask. After this, neither Indians nor English ever heard of them again. A more hopeful omen might be drawn from the birth of a child five days later, the firstborn to English parents in the New World. Her father, Ananias Dare, was one of the twelve assistants, and her mother, Eleanor, was the daughter of John White. Each event, the birth of Virginia Dare and the baptism and ennobling of Mantio, was trivial in itself, yet when brought together the contrast gives a solemn meaning. It seemed as if within five days the settlement of Roanoke had seen an old world pass away, a new world born. In August, White wished to send home two of the assistants to represent the state of the colony, but for some reason none of them were willing to go. The wish of the colony generally seemed to be that White himself should undertake the mission. After some demur, chiefly on the ground that his own private interests required his presence in the settlement, White assented and on the 27th of August he sailed. Soon after White's return, Raleigh fitted out a fleet under the command of Grenville. Before that fleet could sail, Raleigh and Grenville were called off to a task even more pressing than the relief of the Virginia plantation. Yet notwithstanding the prospect of a Spanish invasion, White persuaded Raleigh to send out two small vessels with which White himself sailed from Bideford on the 25th of April, 1588. The sailors, however, fell into the snare so often fatal to the explorers of that age. In the words of a later writer, whose vigorous language seemed to have been borrowed from some contemporary chronicler, the captains, being more intent on a gainful voyage than the relief of the colony, ran in chase of prizes, till at last one of them, meeting two ships of war, was, after a bloody fight, overcome, boarded, and rifled. In this maimed, ransacked, and ragged condition she returned to England in a month's time, and in about three weeks after, the other also returned, having perhaps tasted of the same fare, at least without performing her intended voyage, to the distress, and as it proved, the utter destruction of the colony of Virginia, and to the great displeasure of their patron at home. Raleigh had now spent forty thousand pounds on the colonization of Virginia, with absolutely no return. In March 1589, he made an assignment granting to Sir Thomas Smith, White, and others the privilege of trading in Virginia, while he proved at the same time that he had not lost his interest in the undertaking by a gift of a hundred pounds for the conversion of the natives. The unhappy colonists gained nothing by the change. For a whole year, no relief was sent. When, at length, White sailed with three ships he or his followers imitated the folly of their predecessors and preferred buccaneering among the Spaniards in the West Indies to conveying immediate relief to the colonists. On their arrival, nothing was to be seen of the settlers. After some search, the name Croadin was seen carved on a post, according to an arrangement made with White before his departure, by which the settlers were thus to indicate the course they had taken. 
Remnants of their goods were found, but no trace of the settlers themselves. Years afterward, when Virginia had been at length settled by Englishmen, a faint tradition found its way among them of a band of white captives who, after being for years kept by the Indians in laborious slavery, were at length massacred. Such were the only tidings of Raleigh's colonists that ever reached the ears of their countrymen. White, with his three ships, returned, and the colonization of Virginia was for a time at an end. Even Raleigh's indomitable spirit gave way, and he seems henceforth to have abandoned all hope of a plantation. Yet he did not, till after fifteen years of disappointment and failure, give up the search for his lost settlers. Before he died, the great work of his life had been accomplished, but by other hands. In spite of the intrigues of the Spanish court and the scoffs of playwrights, Virginia had been settled and had become a flourishing colony. A ship had sailed into London laden with Virginia goods and an Indian princess. Footnote. Pocahontas, married to John Ralph, went to England with Ralph and there died about a year later. She left a son who returned to Virginia, where he left descendants, among whom was the famous John Randolph of Roanoke. John Smith's account of the saving of his life by Pocahontas is printed in Volume 1 of The Best of the World's Classics. End of note. The wife of an Englishman had been received at court and had for a season furnished wonder and amusement to the fashionable world. End of Section 3 Recording by Marcia Epic Harris Section 4 of Great Epochs in American History, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marcia Epic Harris Great Epochs in American History, Volume 2 The Planting of the First Colonies, 1562-1733 by Francis Whiting Halsey Section 4 Sir Walter Raleigh's Virginia Colonies II, The Return of the Colonists with Sir Francis Drake, 1586, by Ralph Lane. Footnote. Ralph Lane went out to Virginia in 1585 with the ships dispatched in that year by Raleigh and commanded by Sir Richard Grenville, a company numbering 100 householders. After landing at Roanoke, Grenville returned to England for supplies, leaving the colony in charge of Lane. Lane had left an important account of the experiences and suffering of the colonists during the absence of Grenville. His return was delayed. Drake, meanwhile coming up from St. Augustine, which he had just destroyed, put in at Roanoke in 1586, and the whole company returned to England with him. Grenville afterward arrived in Roanoke, finding no one there. He then returned to England, leaving on the island fifteen men. In the following year, Raleigh sent out to Roanoke John White. When White arrived, he found that these men had all been massacred by the Indians. Other expeditions were sent out later, but none was able to establish any colony at Roanoke. Lane's account is printed in Old South Leaflets. End of note. This fell out the 1st of June, 1586, and the 8th of the same came advertisement to me from Captain Stafford, lying at my Lord Admiral's Island, that he had discovered a great fleet of three-and-twenty sails. But whether they were friends or foes he could not yet discern, he advised me to stand upon as good guard as I could. The ninth of the said month he himself came unto me, having that night before and that same day traveled by land twenty miles, and I must truly report of him, from the first to the last, he was the gentleman that never spared labor or peril either by land or water, fair weather or foul, to perform any service committed unto him. He brought me a letter from the General Sir Francis Drake, with a most bountiful and honorable offer for the supply of our necessities to the performance of the action we were entered into, and not only of victuals, munition, and clothing, but also of barks, penises, and boats, they also by him to be victualed, manned, and furnished to my contentation. The tenth day he arrived in the road of our bad harbor and coming there to an anchor the eleventh day, I came to him, whom I found in deeds most honorably to perform that which in writing and message he had most courteously offered, he having aforehand propounded the matter of all the captains of his fleet, 
and got their liking and consent thereto. With such thanks unto him and his captains for his care both of us and of our actions, not as the matter deserved, but as I could both for my company and myself, I, being aforehand prepared what I would desire, craved at his hands that it would please him to take with him into England a number of weak and unfit men for any good action which I would deliver to him, and in place of them to supply me of his company with oarmen, artificers, and others. That he would leave us so much shipping and victual, as about August then next following would carry me and all my company into England, when we had discovered somewhat that, for lack of needful provision and time left with us as yet, remained undone. That it would please him withal to leave some sufficient masters not only to carry us into England, when time should be, but also to search the coast for some better harborough, if there were any, and especially to help us to some small boats and oarmen, also for a supply of cavaliers, hand weapons, match and lead, tools, apparel, and such like. He, having received these my requests, according to his usual commendable manner of government, as it was told me, calling his captains to counsel, the resolution was that I should send such my officers to my company as I used in such matters, with their notes to go aboard with him, which were the master of the victuals, the keeper of the store, and the vice-treasurer, to whom he appointed forthwith for me the Francis, being a very proper bark of seventy ton, and took present order for bringing a victual aboard for her a hundred men for four months, with all my other demands whatsoever to the uttermost. And further he appointed for me two penises and four small boats, and that which was to perform all his former liberality toward us, was that he had gotten the fullest sense of two of as sufficient experimented masters as were any in his fleet, by judgment of them that knew them, with very sufficient yings to tarry with me, and to employ themselves most earnestly in the action, as I should appoint them, until the term which I promised of our return into England again. The names of one of those masters was Abraham Kendall, the other Griffith Hearn. With these things in hand, the provision aforesaid being brought, and bringing aboard, my said masters being also gone aboard, my said barks having accepted of their charge, and mine own officers, with others in like sort of my company, with them, all which was dispatched by the said general, the twelfth of the said month, and the thirteenth of the same, there arose such an unwonted storm, and continued four days, that had like to have driven all on shore, if the Lord had not held his holy hand over them, and the general very providently foreseen the worst himself, then about my dispatch putting himself aboard, but in the end, having driven sundry of the fleet to put to sea, the Francis also with all my provisions, my two masters, and my company aboard, she was seen to be free from the same, and to put clear to sea. This storm, having continued from the thirteenth to the sixteenth of the month, and thus my bark put away as aforesaid, the general coming ashore made a new proffer unto me, which was a ship of a hundred and seventy ton called the Bark Bonner, with a sufficient master and guide to tarry with me the time appointed, and victualed sufficiently to carry me and my company into England, with all provisions as before. But he told me that he would not for anything undertake to have her brought into our harbor, and therefore he was to leave her in the road, and to leave the care of the rest unto myself, and advised me to consider with my company of our case, and to deliver presently unto him in writing what I should require him to do for us, which, being within his power, he did assure me, as well for his captains as for himself, should be most willingly performed. Hereupon calling such captains and gentlemen of my company as then were at hand, who were all as privy as myself to the general's offer, their whole request was to me, that, considering the case that we stood in, the weakness of our company, the small number of the same, the carrying away of our first appointed bark, with those two special masters, with our principal provisions in the same, by the very hand of God as it seemed, stretched out to take us from thence, considering also that his second offer, though most honorable of his part, yet of ours not to be taken, insomuch as there was no possibility for her with any safety to be brought into the harbor, seeing furthermore our hope for supply from Sir Richard Grenville so undoubtedly promised us before Easter not yet come, neither than likely to come this year, considering the doings in England for Flanders, and also for America, 
that therefore I would resolve myself with my company to go into England in that fleet, and accordingly to make request to the general in all our names that he would be pleased to give us present passage with him, which request of ours by myself delivered unto him he most readily assented unto, and so he sending immediately his penises unto our island for the fetching away of a few that there were left with our baggage, the weather was so boisterous, and the penises so often on ground, that the most of all we had, with all our cards, books, and writings, were by the sailors cast overboard, the greater number of the fleet being much aggrieved with their long and dangerous abode in that miserable road. From whence the general, in the name of the Almighty, weighing his anchors, having bestowed us among his fleet, for the relief of whom he had in that storm sustained more peril of wrack than in all his former most honorable actions against the Spaniards, with praises unto God for all, set sail the 19th of June, 1596, and arrived in Portsmouth the 7 and 20th of July, the same year. End of Section 4 Recording by Marcia Epic Harris Section 5 of Great Epochs in American History, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bill Mosley, Llano County, Texas, USA. Great Epochs in American History, Volume 2 the planting of the first colonies, 1562 to 1733, by Francis Whiting Halsey. Section 5. Sir Walter Raleigh's Virginia Colonies, Part 3. The Birth of Virginia Dare, 1587, by John White. Footnote. Virginia Dare was the first child of English parentage born in America. Her father was Ananias Dare. She was named Virginia after the colony which had already received the name in compliment to Queen Elizabeth. End of footnote. The two and twentieth day of July we came safely to Cape Hatteras, where our ship and pinnace anchored. The governor went aboard the pinnace, accompanied by forty of his best men, intending to pass up to Roanoke. He hoped to find those fifteen Englishmen whom Sir Richard Grenville had left there the year before. With these he meant to have a conference concerning the state of the country and the savages, intending then to return to the fleet and pass along the coast to the Bay of Chesapeake. Here we intended to make our settlement and fort according to the charge given us, among other directions in writing under the hand of Sir Walter Raleigh. We passed to Roanoke, and the same night at sunset went ashore on the island, in the place where our fifteen men were left. But we found none of them, nor any sign that they had been there, saving only that we found the bones of one of them, whom the savages had slain long before. The governor, with several of his company, walked the next day to the north end of the island, where Master Ralph Lane, with his men the year before, had built his fort with sundry dwelling houses. We hoped to find some signs here, or some certain knowledge of our fifteen men. When we came thither we found the fort raised, but all the houses standing unhurt, saving that the lower rooms of them, and of the fort also, were overgrown with melons of different sorts, and deer were in rooms feeding on those melons. So we returned to our company without the hope of ever seeing any of the fifteen men living. The same day an order was given that every man should be employed in remodeling those houses which we found standing, and in making more cottages. On the 18th, a daughter was born in Roanoke to Eleanor, the daughter of the governor, and the wife of Ananias Dare. This baby was christened on the Sunday following, 
and because this child was the first Christian born in Virginia, she was named Virginia Dare. By this time our shipmasters had unloaded the goods and victuals of the planters, and taken wood and fresh water, and were newly caulking and trimming their vessels for their return to England. The settlers also prepared their letters and news to send back to England. End of section 5. Recording by Bill Mosley. Section 6 of Great Epics in American History, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sidney M. Great Epics in American History, Volume 2, The Planting of the First Colonies, 1562-1733, to by Francis Whiting Halsey. Section 6, Bartholomew Gosnell's Discovery of Cape Cod, 1602, 1, by Gabriel Archer, one of his companions. The said Captain Gosnold did set sail from Falmouth the day and year above written, accompanied with thirty-two persons, whereof eight mariners and sailors, twelve purposing upon the discovery to return with the ship for England. The rest remained there for population. The 14th of April following, we had sight of St. Mary's, an island of the Azores. The 15th day of May, we had again sight of the land, which made a head, being as we thought an island, by reason of a large sound that appeared westward between it and the main, for coming to the west end thereof, we did perceive a large opening, we called it Shawl Hope. Near this cape we came to anchor in fifteen fathoms, where we took great store of codfish, for which we altered the name, and called it Cape Cod. Here we saw skulls of herring, mackerel, and other small fish in great abundance. This is a low, sandy shoal, but without danger. Also we came to anchor again in sixteen fathoms, fair by the land in the latitude of forty-two degrees. This cape is well near a mile broad, and lieth northeast by east. The captain went here ashore, and found the ground to be full of peas, strawberries, whortleberries, etc., as then unripe. The sand also by the shore somewhat deep. The firewood there, by us taken in, was of cypress, birch, witch hazel, and beech. A young Indian came here to the captain, armed with his bow and arrows, and had certain plates of copper hanging at his ears. He showed a willingness to help us in our occasions. The sixteenth we trended the coast southerly, which was all champagne and full of grass, but the island somewhat woody. Twelve leagues from Cape Cod we descried a point with some breach a good distance off, and keeping our luff to double it, we came on the sudden into shoal water, yet well quitted ourselves thereof. This breach we called Tucker's Terror, upon his expressed fear. The point we named Point Care, Having passed it, we bore up again with the land, and in the night came with it, anchoring in eight fathoms, the ground good. The seventeenth appeared many breaches round about us, so as we continued that day without remove. The eighteenth being fair, we sent forth the boat to sound over a breach, that in our course lay of another point by us called Gilbert's Point, who returned us four, five, six, and seven fathoms over. Also a discovery of divers islands, which after proved to be hills and hammocks, distinct within the land. This day there came onto the ship's side divers' canoes, the Indians apparelled, as aforesaid, with tobacco and pipes, steeled with copper, skins, artificial strings, and other trifles to barter. One had hanging about his neck a plate of rich copper, in length a foot, in breadth half a foot for a breastplate. The ears of all of the rest had pendants of copper. Also, one of them had his face painted over, and head stuck with feathers, in manner of a turkey cock's train. These are more timorous than those of the savage rock, yet very thievish. The nineteenth we passed over the breach of Gilbert's Point, in four or five fathoms, and anchored a league or somewhat more beyond it. Between the last two points are two leagues, the interim along shoal water, the latitude here is forty-one degrees, two-third parts. The twentieth, by the ship's side, we there killed penguins, and saw many skulls of fish. The coast from Gilbert's Point to the supposed isles lieth east and by south. Here also we discovered two inlets which might promise fresh water, inwardly whereof we perceived much smoke, as though some population had there been. 
This coast is very full of people, for that as we trended, the same savages still run along the shore, as men much admiring at us. The one and twentieth we went coasting from Gilbert's Point to the supposed isles, in ten, nine, eight, seven, and six fathoms, close aboard the shore, and that depth lieth a league off. A little from the supposed isles appeared unto us an opening, with which we stood judging it to be the end which Captain Gosnell described from Cape Cod, and as he thought to extend some thirty or more miles in length, and finding there but three fathoms a league off, we omitted to make further discovery of the same, calling it Shoal Hope. From this opening the main lieth southwest, which coasting along we saw a disinhabited island, which so afterward appeared unto us. We bore with it and named it Martha's Vineyard. From Shoal Hope it is eight leagues in circuit. The island is five miles and hath forty-one degrees and one quarter of latitude. The place most pleasant, for the two and twentieth we went ashore and found it full of wood, vines, gooseberry bushes, whortleberries, raspberries, eglantines, etc. Here we had cranes, sterns, shoolers, geese, and divers other birds, which there at the time upon the cliffs being sandy with some rocky stones, did breed and had young. In this place we saw deer. Here we rode in eight fathoms near the shore where we took great store of cod, as before at Cape Cod, but much better. The three and twentieth we weighed, and toward night came to anchor at the northwest part of this island, where the next morning offered unto us fast-running thirteen savages, apparelled as Afer said, and armed with bows and arrows, without any fear. They brought tobacco, deer-skins, and some sodden fish. These offered themselves unto us in great familiarity, who seemed to be well-conditioned. They came more rich in copper than any before. This island is sound, and hath no danger about it. The four and twentieth we set sail and doubled the cape of another island next unto it, which we called Dover Cliff, and then came into a fair sound where we rode all night. The next morning we sent off one boat to discover another cape that lie between us and the main, from which were a ledge of rocks a mile into the sea, but all above water and without danger. We went about them and came to anchor in eight fathoms, a quarter of a mile from the shore, in one of the stateliest sounds that ever I was in. This called we Gosnold's Hope. The north bank whereof is the main, which stretcheth east and west. This island Captain Gosnold called Elizabeth's Isle, where we determined our abode. The distance between every one of these islands is viz. from Martha's Vineyard to Dover Cliff, half a league over the sound, thence to Elizabeth's Isle, one league distant. From Elizabeth's Island onto the main is four leagues. On the north side, near adjoining onto the island Elizabeth, is an islet in compass half a mile, full of cedars, by me called the hill's hap, to the northward of which, in the mouth of an opening on the main, appeareth another the like, that I called Hap's Hill, for that I hope much hap may be expected from it. The eight and twentieth we entered council about our abode and plantation, which was concluded to be in the west part of Elizabeth's Island the northeast thereof running from out our ken. The south and north standeth in an equal parallel. The one and thirtieth, Captain Gosnold, desirous to see the main because of the distance, he set sail over, where coming to anchor, went ashore with certain of his company, and immediately there presented unto him men, women, and children, who with all courteous kindness entertained him, giving him certain skins of wild beasts, which may be rich furs, tobacco, turtles, hemp, artificial strings colored, chains, and such like things as at the instant they had about them. These are a fair-conditioned people. On all the sea coast along we found mussel shells that in color did represent mother of pearl, but not having means to dredge, could not apprehend further knowledge thereof. This main is the goodliest continent that ever we saw, promising more by far than we anyway did expect for it is replenished with fair fields, and in them fragrant flowers, also meadows, and hedged in with stately groves, being furnished also with pleasant brooks, and beautified with two main rivers, that, as we judge, may happily become good harbors, and conduct us to the hopes men so greedily do thirst after. The first of June we employed ourselves in getting sassafras and the building of our fort. The second, third, and fourth we wrought hard to make ready our house, for the provision to be had ashore to sustain us till our ship's return. 
This day from the main came to our ship's side a canoe, with their lord or chief commander, for that they made little stay, only pointing to the sun, as in sign that the next day he would come and visit us, which he did accordingly. The fifth we continued our labor, when there came unto us, ashore from the main, fifty savages, stout and lusty men, with their bows and arrows. Amongst them there seemed to be one of authority, because the rest made an inclining respect unto him. The ship was at their coming a league off, and Captain Gosnold aboard, and so likewise Captain Gilbert, who almost never went ashore, the company with me, only eight persons. These Indians, in hasty manner, came toward us, so as we thought fit to make a stand at an angle between the sea and a fresh water. I moved myself toward him seven or eight steps, and clapped my hands first on the sides of mine head, then on my breast, and after presented my musket with a threatening countenance, thereby to signify unto them either a choice of peace or war, whereupon he using me with mine own signs of peace, I stepped forth and embraced him. His company then all sat down in manner like greyhounds upon their heels, with whom my company fell a-bartering. By this time Captain Gosnold was come with twelve men more from aboard, and to show the savage senior that he was our captain, we received him in a guard, which he, passing through, saluted the senior with ceremonies of our salutations, whereat he nothing moved or altered himself. Our captain gave him a straw hat and a pair of knives. The hat a while he wore, but the knives he beheld with great marveling, being very bright and sharp. This, our courtesy, made them all in love with us. The eighth we divided the victuals, namely the ship's store for England, and that of the planters which by Captain Gilbert's allowance could be but six weeks for six months, whereby there fell out controversy the rather, for that some seemed secretly to understand of a purpose Captain Gilbert had not to return with supply of the issue, those goods should make by him to be carried home. Besides, there wanted not ambitious conceits in the minds of some wrangling and ill-disposed persons who overthrew the stay there at that time, which upon consultation thereof had about five days after was fully resolved all for England again. There came in this interim a board unto us that stayed all night an Indian whom we used kindly and the next day sent ashore. He showed himself the most sober of all the rest. We held him sent as a spy. In the morning he filched away our pot-hooks, thinking he had not done any ill therein. Being ashore, we bid him strike fire, which, with an emerald stone, such as the glaciers use to cut glass, he did. I take it to be the very same that in Latin is called smiris, for striking therewith upon touchwood, that of purpose he had, by means of a mineral stone used therein. Sparkles proceeded, and forthwith kindled with making of flame. The ninth we continued working on our storehouse, for, as yet remained in us, a desired resolution of making stay. The tenth, Captain Gosnold fell down with the ship to the little islet of cedars called Hill's Hap, to take in cedar wood, leaving me and nine more in the fort, only with three meals meat, upon promise to return the next day. The thirteenth began some of our company that before vowed to stay to make revolt, whereupon the planters diminishing, all was given over. The fourteenth, fifteenth, and sixteenth we spent in getting sassafras and firewood of cedar, leaving house and little fort, by ten men in nineteen days sufficient made to harbor twenty persons at least with their necessary provisions. The seventeenth we set sail, doubling the rocks of Elizabeth's island, and passing by Dover Cliff, came to anchor at Martha's Vineyard, being five leagues distant from our fort, where we went ashore and had young cranes, hernshows, and geese, which now were grown to pretty bigness. The eighteenth we set sail and bore for England, cutting off our shallop that was well able to land five and twenty men or more, a boat very necessary for the like occasions. The winds do range most commonly upon this coast in the summer time, westerly. In our homeward course we observed the foresaid floating weeds to continue till we came within two hundred leagues of Europe. The three and twentieth of July we came to anchor before Exmouth. End of section six. Recording by Sydney M. Section seven of Great Epochs in American History, Volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bill Mosley, Llano County, Texas, USA. Great Epochs in American History, Volume 2. The Planting of the First Colonies, 1562 to 1733, by Francis Whiting Halsey, Section 7. Bartholomew Gosnold's Discovery of Cape Cod, 1602, Part 2, Gosnold's Own Account. Footnote, from a letter to his father, dated September 1st, 1602, in footnote. I was in good hope that my occasions would have allowed me so much liberty as to have come unto you before this time. Otherwise, I would have written more at large concerning the country from whence we lately came, than I did. But not well remembering what I have already written, though I am assured that there is nothing set down disagreeing with the truth, I thought it fittest not to go about to add anything in writing, but rather to leave the report of the rest till I come myself, which now I hope shall be shortly and so soon as with conveniency I may. In the meantime, notwithstanding whereas you seem not to be satisfied by that which I have already written, concerning some especial matters, I have here, briefly and as well as I can, added these few lines for your further satisfaction. We cannot gather, by anything we could observe in the people, or by any trial we had thereof ourselves, but that it is as healthful a climate as any can be. The inhabitants there, as I wrote before, being of tall stature, comely proportion, strong, active, and some of good years, and as it should seem very healthful, are sufficient proof of the healthfulness of the place. First, for ourselves, thanks be to God, we had not a man sick two days together in all our voyage, whereas others that went out with us, or about that time on other voyages, especially such as went upon reprisal, were most of them infected with sickness, whereof they lost some of their men, and brought home a many sick, returning notwithstanding long before us. But Verrazano and others, as I take it you may read in the Book of Discoveries, do more particularly entreat of the age of the people in that coast. The sassafras which we brought we had upon the islands, where, though, we had little disturbance, and reasonable plenty, yet for that the greatest part of our people were employed about the fitting of our house and such like affairs, and a few, and those but easy laborers, undertook this work, the rather because we were informed before our going forth that a ton was sufficient to cloy England, and further, for that we had resolved upon our return, and taken view of our victual, we judged it then needful to use expedition which afterward we had more certain proof of, for when we came to an anchor before Portsmouth, which was some four days after we made the land, we had not one cake of bread, nor any drink, but a little vinegar left. For these and other reasons, we returned no otherwise laden than you have heard. And thus much I hope shall suffice till I can myself come to give you further notice, which, though it be not so soon as I could have wished, yet I hope it shall be in convenient time. End of section 7. Recording by Bill Mosley. Section 8 of Great Epochs in American History, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bill Mosley, Llano County, Texas, USA. Great Epochs in American History, Volume 2, The Planting of the First Colonies, 1562 through 1733, by Francis Whiting Halsey, Section 8, The Founding of Jamestown, 1607, by Captain John Smith. Footnote From Smith's General History of Virginia, Edward Arbor has contended that, had not John Smith, quote, strove, fought, and endured as he did, the present United States of America might never have come into existence, end quote. Spaniards and French alike had failed in their attempts at colonization, and so had the repeated expeditions sent out by Sir Walter Raleigh. Smith carried the Jamestown settlement through its difficulties. Smith, quote, self-denying, energetic, so full of resources, and so trained in dealing with the savage races, end quote. Had Jamestown failed, the Pilgrim Fathers, quote, would not have gone to New England, end quote. Smith was not the sole author of the History of Virginia. Others contributed to the work. End footnote. Captain Bartholomew Gosnell, one of the first movers of this plantation, having many years solicited many of his friends, but found small assistance, at last prevailed with some gentlemen, as Captain John Smith, Master Edward Maria Wingfield, Master Robert Hunt, and divers others, who depended a year upon his projects. But nothing could be effected till, by their great charge and industry, it came to be apprehended by certain of the nobility, gentry, and merchants, so that His Majesty, by his letters patents, gave commission for establishing councils, to direct here, and to govern, and to execute there. To effect this was spent another year, and by that three ships were provided, one of one hundred tons, another of forty, and a pinnace of twenty. Transportation of the company was committed to Captain Christopher Newport, a mariner well practiced for the western parts of America. But their orders for government were put in a box, not to be opened, nor the governor's known, until they arrived in Virginia. On the 19th of December, 1606, we set sail from Blackwell, but by unprosperous winds were kept six weeks in the sight of England, all which time Master Hunt, our preacher, was so weak and sick that few expected his recovery. We watered at the Canaries. We traded with the savages at Dominica. Three weeks we spent in refreshing ourselves amongst these West India Isles. In Guadalupe, we found a bath so hot as in it we boiled pork as well as over the fire. And a little isle called Monica we took from the bushes with our hands near two hogsheads full of birds in three or four hours. In Mavis, Mona, and the Virgin Isles we spent some time where with a loathsome beast like a crocodile called a guain tortoises, pelicans, parrots, and fishes, we daily feasted. Gone from thence in search of Virginia, the company was not a little discomforted, seeing the mariners had three days past their reckoning and found no land, so that Captain Ratliff, captain of the pinnace, rather desired to bear up the helms to returns for England than make further search. But God, the guider of all good actions, forcing them by extreme storm to hull all night, did drive them by his providence to their desired port, beyond all their expectations, for never any of them had seen that coast. The first land they made they called Cape Henry, where thirty of them recreated themselves on shore, 
were assaulted by five savages who hurt two of the English very dangerously. That night was the box opened and the orders read, in which Bartholomew Gosnell, John Smith, Edward Wingfield, Christopher Newport, John Ratliff, John Martin, and George Kendall were named to be the council and to choose a president amongst them for a year who with the council should govern. Matters of moment were to be examined by a jury, but determined by the major part of the council, in which the president had two voices. Until the 13th of May, they sought a place to plant in. Then the council was sworn, Master Wingfield was chosen president, and an oration made, why Captain Smith was not admitted of the council as the rest. Now falleth every man to works. The council contrived the fort. The rest cut down trees to make place to pitch their tents. Some provide clabbered to relay the ships. Some make gardens, some nets, etc. The savages often visited us kindly. The president's overweening jealousy would admit no exercise at arms or fortification but the boughs of trees cast together in the forms of half-moons by the extraordinary pains and diligence of Captain Kendall. Newport, Smith, and twenty others were sent to discover the head of the river. By divers small habitations they passed. In six days they arrived at a town called Powhatan, consisting of some twelve houses, pleasantly seated on a hill, before it three fertile isles, about it many of their cornfields. The place is very pleasant and strong by nature. Of this place the prince is called Powhatan, and his people Powhatans. To this place the river is navigable. But higher within a mile, by reason of the rocks and isles, there is not passage for a small boat, which they call the Falls. The people in all parts kindly entreated them, till being returned within twenty miles of Jamestown, they gave just cause of jealousy, but had God not blessed the discoverers otherwise than those at the fort, there had then been an end of that plantation, for at the fort, where they arrived the next day, they found seventeen men hurt, and a boy slain by the savages, and had it not chanced a crossbow shot from the ships, struck down a bough from a tree amongst them, that caused them to retire. Our men had all been slams, being securely at all works, and their arms in dry fats. Hereupon the President was contended the fort should be palisaded, the ordnance mounted, his men armed and exercised, for many were the assaults and ambuscados of the savages, and our men, by their disorderly straggling, were often hurt, when the savages, by the nimbleness of their heels, well escaped. What toil we had, with so small a power to guard our workmen days, watch all night, resist our enemies, and effect our business, to relay the ships, cut down trees, and prepare the ground to plant our corn, etc., I refer to the reader's consideration. Six weeks being spent in this manner, Captain Newport, who was hired only for our transportation, was to return with the ships. Being thus left to our fortunes, it fortuned that within ten days, scarce ten amongst us could either go or well stand. Such extreme weakness and mockness oppressed us. And thereat none need marvel if they consider the cause and reason which was this. Whilst the ships stayed, our allowance was somewhat bettered by a daily proportion of biscuit which the sailors would pilfer to sell, give, or exchange with us for money, sassafras, furs, or love. But when they departed there remained neither tavern, beer-house, nor place of relief, but the common kettle. Had we been as free from all sins as gluttony and drunkenness, we might have been canonized for saints. But our president would never have been admitted for engrossing to his private oatmeal, sacks, oil, aquavita, 
beefs, eggs, or what not, but the kettle. That, indeed, he allowed equally to be distributed, and that was half a pint of wheat, and as much barley boiled with water for a man a day, and this having fried some six weeks in the ship's hold, contained as many worms as grains, so that we might truly call it rather so much bran than corns. Our drink was water, our lodgings castles in the air, with this lodging and diet, our extreme toils in bearing and planting palisados so strained and bruised us, and our continual labor in the extremity of the heat had so weakened us, as were cause sufficient to have made us miserable in our native country and any other place in the world. From May to September, those that escaped lived upon sturgeon, and sea crabs, fifty in this time we buried, the rest seeing the President's projects to escape these miseries in our pinnace by flight, who all this time had neither felt want nor sickness, so moved our dead spirits as we deposed him, and established Ratcliffe in his place, Gosnell being dead, Kindall deposed. Smith, newly recovered, Martin and Ratcliffe, was by his care preserved and relieved, and the most of the soldiers, recovered with the skillful diligence of Master Thomas Watton, our Surgeon General. Now was all our provisions spent, the sturgeon gone, all helps abandoned, each hour expecting the fury of the savages, when God the patron of all good endeavors, in that desperate extremity so changed the hearts of the savages, that they brought such plenty of their fruits and provision as no man wanted. The new president and Martin, being little beloved, of weak judgment in dangers and less industry in peace, committed the managing of all things abroad to Captain Smith, who by his own example, good words, and fair promises, set some to mow, others to bind thatch, some to build houses, others to thatch them, himself always bearing the greatest tasks for his own share, so that in short time he provided most of them lodgings, neglecting any for himself. This done, seeing the savages' superfluity beginning to decrease, with some of his workmen, shipped himself in the shallop to search the country for trade. The want of the language, knowledge to manage his boat without sails, the want of a sufficient power, knowing the multitude of the savages, apparel for his men, and other necessaries, were infinite impediments. Being but six or seven in company, he went down the river to Kyoton, where at first they scorned him as a famished man, and would in derision offer him a handful of corn, a piece of bread, for their swords and muskets, and such like proportions, also for their apparel. But seeing by trade and courtesy there was nothing to be had, he made bold to try such conclusions as necessity enforced, though contrary to his commission, that fly his muskets, ran his boat on shore, whereat they all fled into the woods. So marching towards their houses, they might see great heaps of corn, much ado he had to restrain his hungry soldiers from present taking of it, expecting, as it happened, that the savages would assault them, as not long after they did with a most hideous noise, sixty or seventy of them, some black, some red, some white, some party-colored, came in a square order, singing and dancing out of the woods, with their oki, which was an idol made of skins, stuffed with moss all painted and hung with chains and copper, borne before them, and in this manner, being well armed with clubs, targets, bows, and arrows, they charged the English, that so kindly received them with their muskets, loaden with pistol shot, that down fell their god, and divers lay sprawling on the ground. The rest fled again to the woods, and ere long sent one of their quiocasuks to offer peace, and redeem their oki. Smith told them if only six of them would come unarmed and load his boat, 
he would not only be their friend, but restore them their oki, and give them beads, copper, and hatchets besides, which on both sides was to their contents performed. And then they brought him venison, turkeys, wild fowl, bread, and what they had, singing and dancing in signs of friendship till they departed. In his returns he discovered the town and country of Waras Koyak. Thus God, unboundless by his power, made them thus kind, would us devour. Smith perceiving, notwithstanding their late misery, not any regarded but from hand to mouth, the company being well recovered, caused the pinnace to be provided with things fitting to get provision for the years following. But in the interim he made three or four journeys, and discovered the people of Chickahomania. Yet what he carefully provided, the rest carelessly spent. Wingfield and Kendall, living in disgrace, seeing all things at random in the absence of Smith, the company's dislike of their president's weakness, and their small love to Martin's never-mending sickness, strengthened themselves with the sailors and other confederates to regain their former credit and authority, or at least such means aboard the pinnace, being fitted for sale, as Smith had appointed for trade, to alter her course and to go for England. Smith, unexpectedly returning, had the plot discovered to him. Much trouble he had to prevent it, till with store of saber and musket shot, he forced them to stay or sink in the river, which action cost the life of Captain Kendall. These brawls are so disgustful, as some will say, they were better forgotten. Yet all men of good judgment will conclude it were better their baseness should be manifest to the world than the business bear the scorn and shame of their excused disorders. The President and Captain Archer, not long after intending also to have abandoned the country, which project also was curbed and suppressed by Smith, the Spaniard never more greedily desired gold than he victual, nor his soldiers more to abandon the country than he to keep it. But finding plenties of corn in the river of Chickahamania, where hundreds of savages in divers places stood with baskets expecting his coming, and now the winter approaching, the rivers became so covered with swans, geese, ducks, and cranes, that we daily feasted with good bread, Virginia peas, pumpkins, and butchermen's fish, fowls, and diverse sorts of wild beasts, as fast as we could eat them, so that none of our tough taffety humorists desired to go to England. But our comedies never endured long without a tragedy, some idle exceptions being muttered against Captain Smith, for not discovering the head of Chickahamania River and taxed by the council to be slow in so worthy an attempt. The next voyage he proceeded so far that, with much labor by cutting off trees and sunder, he made his passage. But when his barge could pass no farther, he left her in a broad bay out of danger of shot, commanding none should go ashore till his return. Himself, with two English and two savages, went up higher in a canoe. But he was not long absent, but his men went ashore, whose want of government gave both occasion and opportunity to the savages to surprise one George Casson whom they slew, and much failed not to have cut off the boat and all the rest. Smith, little dreaming of that accident, being got to the marshes of the river's head, twenty miles in the desert, had his two men slain, as is supposed, sleeping by the canoe, whilst himself by fouling sought them victual, who, finding he was beset with two hundred savages, two of them he slew, still defending himself with the aid of a savage his guide, whom he bound to his arm with his garters, and used him as a buckler. Yet he was shot in his thigh a little, and had many arrows that stuck in his clothes, but no great hurt, till at last they took him prisoner. When this news came to Jamestown, much was their sorrow for his loss, few expecting what ensued. Six or seven weeks those barbarians kept him prisoner. Many strange triumphs and conjurations they made of him. Yet he so demeaned himself amongst them 
as he not only diverted them from surprising the fort, but procured his own liberty, and got himself and his company such estimation amongst them, that those savages admired him more than their own Quiu Cossacks. At last they brought him to Morono Comoco, where was Powhatan their emperor. Here more than two hundred of those grim courtiers stood wondering at him, as he had been a monster, till Powhatan and his train had put themselves in their greatest braveries. Before a fire upon a seat like a bedstead, he sat covered with a great robe made of rarocan skins and all the tails hanging by. On either hand did sit a young wench of fifteen or eighteen years, and along by each side the house two rows of men, and behind them as many women, with all their heads and shoulders painted red, many of their heads bedecked with the white down of birds, but every one with something, and a great chain of white beads about their necks. At his entrance before the king all the people gave a great shout. The queen of Appamatuck was appointed to bring him water to wash his hands, and another brought him a bunch of feathers instead of a towel to dry them. Having feasted him after their best barbarous manner they could, a long consultation was held. But the conclusion was, two great stones were brought before Powhatan, and as many as could lay hands on him, dragged him to them, and thereupon laid his head, and being ready with their clubs to beat out his brains, Pocahontas, the king's dearest daughter, when no entreaty could prevail, got his head in her arms and laid her own upon his to save him from death. Whereat the emperor was contented he should live to make him hatchets, and her bells, beads, and copper, for they thought him as well of all occupations as themselves. But the king himself will make his own robes, shoes, bows, arrows, pots, plant, hunt, or do anything as well as the rest. They say he bore a pleasant shoe, but sure his heart was sad, for who can pleasant be and rest that lives in fears and dreads, and having life suspected doth it still suspected lead. Two days after, Powhatan, having disguised himself in the most fearfulest manner he could, caused Captain Smith to be brought forth to a great house in the woods, and thereupon a mat by the fire to be left alone. Not long after, from behind a mat that divided the house, was made the most dolefulest noise he ever heard. Then Powhatan, more like a devil than a man, with some two hundred more as black as himself, came into him, and told him now they were friends, and presently he should go to Jamestown to send him two great guns and a grindstone, for which he would give him the country of Kapabawosik, and forever esteem him as his son Natakwaud. So to Jamestown with twelve guides Powhatan sent him. That night they quartered in the woods, he still expecting, as he had done all this long time of his imprisonment, every hour to be put to one death or other, for all their feasting. But Almighty God, by His divine providence, had mollified the hearts of those stern barbarians with compassion. The next morning betimes they came to the fort where Smith, having used the savages with what kindness he could, he showed Rawhunt, Powhatan's trusty servant, two demic culverings and a millstone to carry Powhatan. They found them somewhat too heavy, but when they did see him discharge them, being loaded with stones, among the boughs of a great tree loaded with icicles, the ice and branches came so tumbling down that the poor savages ran away half dead with fear. But at last we regained some conference with them, and gave them such toys, and sent to Powhatan, his women and children, such presents as gave them in general full content. Now in Jamestown they were all in combustion, the strongest preparing once more to run away with the penance, which, with the hazard of his life, with sacrifalcon and musket shot, Smith forced now the third time to stay or sink. Some know better than they should be, 
had plotted with the president the next day to have put him to death by the Levitical law, for the lives of Robinson and Emery, pretending the fault was his that had led them to their ends, but he quickly took such order with such lawyers that he laid them by the heels till he sent some of them prisoners for England. Now, ever once in four or five days, Pocahontas, with her attendees, brought him so much provision that saved many of their lives that else for all this had starved with hunger. Thus you may see what difficulties still crossed any good endeavor. And the good success of the business being thus oft brought to the very period of destruction, yet you see by what strange means God hath still delivered it. Now whether it had been better for Captain Smith to have concluded with any of those several projects, to have abandoned the country with some ten or twelve of them who were called the better sort, and have left Master Hunt, our preacher, Master Anthony Gosnell, a most honest, worthy, and industrious gentleman, Master Thomas Wotton, and some twenty-seven others of his countrymen to the fury of the savages, famine, and all manner of mischiefs, and inconveniences, for they were but forty in all to keep possession of this large country, or starve himself with them for company, for want of lodging, or but adventuring abroad to make them provision, or by his opposition to preserve the action and save all their lives, I leave to the censure of all honest men to consider. End of section 8 Recording by Bill Mosley, Llano County, Texas, USA Section 9 of Great Epochs in American History, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, in February 2020. Great Epochs in American History, Volume 2, The Planting of the First Colonies, 1562-1733, through 1733, by Francis Whiting Halsey. Section 9, The First American Legislative Assembly, 1619, by John Twine, its Secretary. Footnote, this account is taken from the official report of the Assembly, of which Twine was the clerk. It is printed in the Colonial Records of Virginia and in Hart's American History Told by Contemporaries. A report of the manner of proceedings in the General Assembly convented at James City in Virginia, July 30th, 1619, consisting of the Governor, the Council of Estate, and two Burgesses elected out of each incorporation and plantation, and being dissolved the 4th of August next ensuing. First, Sir George Yardley, Knight Governor and Captain General of Virginia, sent his summons all over the country, as well to invite those of the Council of Estate that were absent, as also for the election of the Burgesses. The most convenient place we could find to sit in was the choir of the church, where Sir George Yardley, the Governor, being set down in his accustomed place, those of the Council of Estate sat next him on both hands, except only the secretary, then appointed speaker, who sat right before him. John Twine, clerk of the General Assembly, being placed next to the speaker, and Thomas Pierce, the sergeant, standing at the bar, to be ready for any service the Assembly should command him. But forasmuch as men's affairs do little prosper where God's service is neglected, all the Burgesses took their places in the choir till a prayer was said by Mr. Buck, the minister, that it would please God to guide and sanctify all our proceedings to his own glory and the good of this plantation. Prayer being ended to the intent that as we had begun at God Almighty, so we might proceed with awful and due respect towards the lieutenant, our most gratuitous and dread sovereign, all the Burgesses were entreated to retire themselves into the body of the church, which, being done before they were fully admitted, they were called in order and by name, and so every man, none staggering at it, took the oath of supremacy and then entered the assembly. These obstacles removed, 
the speaker who a long time had been extremely sickly and therefore not able to pass through long harangues delivered in brief to the whole assembly the occasions of their meeting which done he read unto them the commission for establishing the council of estate and the general assembly wherein their duties were described to the life having thus prepared them he read over unto them the great charter or commission of privileges orders and laws sent by sir george yardley out of england which for the more ease of the committees having divided into four books he read the former two the same forenoon for expeditious sake a second time over and so they were referred to the perusal of two committees which did reciprocally consider of either and accordingly brought in their opinions but some men may here object to what end we should presume to refer that to the examination of the committees which the council and the company in england had already resolved to be perfect and did expect nothing but our assent thereunto to this we answer that we did it not to the end to correct or control anything therein contained but only in case we should find ought not perfectly squaring with the state of this colony or any law which did press or bind too hard that we might by way of humble petition seek to have it redressed especially because this great charter is to bind us and our heirs for ever after dinner the governor and those who were not of the committee sat a second time while the said committees were employed in the perusal of those two books and whereas the speaker had propounded four several objects for the assembly to consider on namely first the great charter of orders laws and privileges secondly which of the instructions given by the council in england to my lord delaware captain argall or sir george yardley might conveniently put on the habit of laws thirdly what laws might issue out of the private conceit of any of the burgesses or any other of the colony and lastly what petitions were fit to be sent home for england it pleased the governor for expedition's sake to have the second object of the four to be examined and prepared by himself and the non-committees wherein after having spent some three hours conference the two committees brought in their opinions concerning the two former books the second of which beginneth at these words of the charter quote, and forasmuch as our intent is to establish one equal and uniform kind of government over all virginia etc which the whole assembly because it was late deferred to treat of till the next morning there remained no farther scruple in the minds of the assembly touching the said great charter of laws orders and privileges the speaker put the same to the question and so it had both the general assent and the applause of the whole assembly who as they professed themselves in the first place most submissively thankful to almighty god therefore so they commanded the speaker to return as now he doth their due and humble thanks to the treasurer council and company for so many privileges and favors as well in their own names as in the names of the whole colony whom they represented this being dispatched we fell once more debating of such instructions given by the council in england to several governors as might be converted into laws the last whereof was the establishment of the price of tobacco namely of the best at three pennies and the second at eighteen pennies the pound here begin the laws drawn out of the instructions given by his majesty's council of virginia in england to my lord delaware captain argall and sir george yardley knight by this present general assembly be it enacted that no injury or oppression be wrought by the english against the indians whereby the present peace might be disturbed and ancient quarrels might be revived and farther be it ordained that the chickahominy are not to be accepted out of this law until either that such order come out of england or that they do provoke us by some new injury against idleness gaming drunkenness and excess in apparel the assembly hath enacted the followeth first the detestation of idleness be it enacted that if any man be found to live as an idler or a renegade though a freedman it shall be lawful for the incorporation 
or a plantation to which he belongeth, to appoint him a master to serve for wages, till he show apparent signs of amendment. Against gaming at dice and cards, be it ordained by this present assembly, that the winner or winners shall lose all his or their winnings, and both winners and losers shall forfeit ten shillings a man, one ten shillings whereof to go to the discoverer, and the rest to charitable and pious uses in the incorporation where the fault is committed. Against drunkenness be it also decreed that if any private person be found culpable thereof, for the first time he is to be reproved privately by the minister, the second time publicly, the third time to lie in bolts twelve hours in the house of the provost marshal, and to pay his fee, and if he still continue in that vice, to undergo such severe punishment as the governor and council of estate shall think fit to be inflicted on him. But if any officer offend in this crime, the first time he shall receive a reproof from the governor, the second time he shall openly be reproved in the church by the minister, and the third time he shall first be committed and then degraded, provided it be understood that the governor hath always power to restore him when he shall in his discretion think fit. Against excess in apparel, that every man be assessed in the church for all public contributions, if he be unmarried according to his own apparel, if he be married according to his own and his wives, or either of their apparel. Be it enacted by this present assembly, that for laying a surer foundation of the conversion of the Indians to Christian religion, each town, city, borough, and particular plantation do obtain unto themselves, by just means, a certain number of the natives' children to be educated by them in the true religion and civil course of life, of which children the most towardly boys in wit and graces of nature, to be brought up by them in the first elements of literature, so to be fitted for the college intended for them, that from thence they may be sent to that work of conversion." As touching the business of planting come this present assembly, doth ordain that year by year all and every householder and householders have in store for every servant he or they shall keep, and also for his or their own persons, whether they have any servants or no, one spare barrel of corn to be delivered out yearly, either upon sale or exchange, as need shall require." For the neglect of which duty he shall be subject to the censure of the governor and council of his state, provided always that the first year of every new man this law shall not be of force. All ministers shall duly read divine service and exercise their ministerial function according to the ecclesiastical laws and orders of the Church of England, and every Sunday in the afternoon shall catechize such as are not yet ripe to come to the calm and whosoever shall be found negligent or faulty in this kind shall be subject to the censure of the governor and council. All persons whatsoever upon the Sabbath day shall frequent divine service and sermons both forenoon and afternoon, and all such as bear arms shall bring their pieces, swords, poulter, and shot. And every one that shall transgress this law shall forfeit three shillings a time to the use of the church, all lawful and necessary impediments excepted. But if a servant in this case shall willfully neglect his masters, he shall suffer bodily punishment. No maid or woman servant, either now resident in the colony or hereafter to come, shall contract herself in marriage without either the consent of her parents or of her master or mistress, or of the magistrate and minister of the place both together. And whatsoever minister shall marry or contract any such persons, without some of the aforesaid consents, shall be subject to the severe censure of the governor and council of a state. In sum, Sir George Yardley, the governor prorogued the said General Assembly till the 1st of March, which is to fall out this present year of 1619, and in the mean season dissolved the same. End of section 9 Section 10 of Great Epochs in American History, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Great Epochs in American History, Volume 2. The Planting of the First Colonies, 1562-1733. By Francis Whiting Halsey. Section 10. The Origin of Negro Slavery in America, 1. In the West Indies, 1518. By Sir Arthur Helps. The outline of Las Casas' scheme was as follows. The king was to give to every laborer willing to immigrate to Espanola his living during the journey from his place of abode to Seville, at the rate of half a real a day throughout the journey, for great and small, child and parent. At Seville the immigrants were to be lodged in the Casa de la Contratación, the India House, and were to have from eleven to thirteen maravedis a day. From thence they were to have a free passage to Espanola, and to be provided with food for a year. And if the climate should try them so much, that at the expiration of this year they should not be able to work for themselves, the king was to continue to maintain them. But this extra maintenance was to be put down to the account of the immigrants, as a loan which they were to repay. The king was to give them lands, his own lands, furnish them with plowshares and spades, and provide medicines for them. Lastly, whatever rights and profits accrued from their holdings were to become hereditary. This was certainly a most liberal plan of immigration. And in addition, there were other privileges held out as inducements to these laborers. In connection with the above scheme, Las Casas, unfortunately for his reputation in after ages, added another provision namely that each spanish resident in the island should have license to import a dozen negro slaves the origin of this suggestion was as he informs us that the colonists had told him that if license were given them to import a dozen negro slaves each they the colonists would then set free the indians and so recollecting the statement of the colonists he added this provision las casas writing his history in his old age thus frankly owns his error Quote, this advice that license should be given to bring negro slaves to these lands the clerico casas first gave not considering the injustice with which the portuguese take them and make them slaves which advice after he had apprehended the nature of the thing he would not have given for all he had in the world for he always held that they had been made slaves unjustly and tyrannically for the same reason holds good of them as of the indians Unquote. The above confession is delicately and truthfully worded, not considering, he does not say, not being aware of, but though it was a matter known to him, his moral sense was not watchful, as it were, about it. We must be careful not to press the admission of a generous mind too far, or to exaggerate the importance of the suggestion of Las Casas. It would be quite erroneous to look upon this suggestion as being the introduction of Negro slavery. From the earliest times of the discovery of America, Negroes have been sent there. But what is of more significance, and what it is strange that Las Casas was not aware of, or did not mention, the Hieronymite fathers had also come to the conclusion that Negroes must be introduced into the West Indies. Writing in January 1518, when the fathers could not have known what was passing in Spain in relation to the subject, they recommended licenses to be given to the inhabitants of Espanola, or to other persons, to bring Negroes there. From the tenor of their letter it appears that they had before recommended the same thing. Zuazo, the judge of Residencia, and the legal colleague of Las Casas, wrote to the same effect. He, however, suggested that the Negroes should be placed in settlements and married. Fray Bernardino de Manzanedo, the Hieronymite father, sent over to counteract Las Casas, gave the same advice as his brethren about the introduction of Negroes. He added a proviso, which does not appear in their letter, perhaps it did exist in one of the earlier ones, that there should be as many women as men sent over, or more. The suggestion of Las Casas was approved by the Chancellor, and indeed it is probable there was hardly a man at that time who would have seen further than the excellent clerigo did las casas was asked what number of negroes would suffice he replied that he did not know upon which a letter was sent to the officers of the india house at seville 
to ascertain the fit number in their opinion. They said that four thousand at present would suffice, being one thousand for each of the islands, Hispaniola, Puerto Rico, Cuba, and Jamaica. Somebody now suggested to the governor, de Bresa, a Fleming of much influence and a member of the council, that he should ask for this license to be given to him. De Bresa accordingly asked the king for it, who granted his request, and the Fleming sold this license to certain Genoese merchants for twenty-five thousand ducats, having obtained from the king a pledge that for eight years he should give no other license of this kind. The consequence of this monopoly enjoyed by the Genoese merchants was that negroes were sold at a great price, of which there are frequent complaints. Both Las Casas and Pasamonte, rarely found in accord, suggested to the king that it would be better to pay the twenty-five thousand ducats and resume the license, or to abridge its term. Figueroa, writing to the emperor from Santo Domingo, says, quote, Negroes are very much in request. None have come for about a year. It would have been better to have given de Bresa the customs duties, i.e. the duties that have been usually paid on the importation of slaves, than to have placed a prohibition, unquote. I have scarcely a doubt that the immediate effect of the measure adopted in consequence of the clerigal's suggestion was greatly to check the importation of negro slaves, which otherwise, had the license been general, would have been very abundant. Before quitting this part of the subject, something must be said for Las Casas, which he does not allege for himself. This suggestion of his about the negroes was not an isolated one. Had all his suggestions been carried out, and the Indians thereby been preserved, as I firmly believe they might have been, these negroes might have remained a very insignificant number in the general population. By the destruction of Indians, a void in the laborious part of the community was being constantly created, which had to be filled up by the labor of negroes. The negroes could bear the labor in the mines much better than the Indians, and any man who perceived that a race of whose Christian virtues and capabilities he thought highly were fading away by reason of being subjected to labor which their natures were incompetent to endure, and which they were almost unjustly condemned to, might prefer the misery of the smaller number of another race treated with equal injustice, but more capable of enduring it. I do not say that Las Casas considered all these things, but at any rate in estimating his conduct, we must recollect that we look at the matter centuries after it occurred, and see all the extent of the evil arising from circumstances which no man could then be expected to foresee, and which were inconsistent with the rest of the clerigos' plans for the preservation of the Indians. I suspect that the wisest among us would very likely have erred with him, and I am not sure that taking all his plans together, and taking for granted as he did then, that his influence at court was to last, his suggestions about the Negroes was an impolite one. End of section 10section 11 of great epochs in american history volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by larry wilson great epochs in american history volume 2 the planting of the first colonies 1562-1733 by francis whiting halsey section 11 the Origin of Negro Slavery in America, too. Its Beginnings in the United States, 1620, by John A. Doyle. The economical success which had attended the introduction of Negroes into the West Indies made it almost certain that the American colonies would betake themselves to the same resource. The first introduction of Negroes is commonly placed in the year 1620, when a Dutch ship landed twenty of them for sale at Jamestown. For some years their numbers increased, but slowly. In 1649, Virginia contained only 300. By 1661, they had increased to 2,000, while the indentured servants were four times that number. Twenty-two years later, if we may trust Culpepper's statement, the number of white servants was nearly doubled, while that of the Negroes had only increased by one-half. Of their numbers, the proportions in Maryland and North Carolina, we have no definite evidence. 
in south carolina negro slavery seems to have been almost from the outset the prevalent form of industry as early as seventeen eight we are told that three-fifths of the population were blacks this alteration in the relative number of white servants and black slaves was accelerated by a change which had come over the commercial policy of the english government in sixteen sixty two the royal african company was incorporated at the head of it was the duke of york and the king himself was a large shareholder the chief profit of this company was derived from the exportation of negroes from guinea to the plantations the king and his brother henceforth had a direct interest in limiting the supply of indentured servants and it is not unlikely that this explains why jeffreys for once deviated into the paths of humanity and justice had negro slavery never existed had the natural resources of the southern colonies favored the growth of free yeomanry the system of indentured would have been admirably fitted to establish a population of small proprietors trained in habits of industry and in competent knowledge of agriculture the social and industrial life of the colonies forbade this a peasant proprietary can only exist under severe restraints as to increase or where there is urban life to take off the surplus population for trades and handicrafts the southern colonies fulfilled neither of these conditions when the servant was out of his indentures there was no place for him he could not become a shopkeeper or craftsman or a free agricultural laborer for none of these callings existed moreover the very same conditions of soil and climate which enabled slavery to exist made it possible for the free man to procure a scanty livelihood without any habits of settled industry thus the liberated servant became an idler socially corrupt and often politically dangerous he furnished that class justly described by a virginian of that day as quote, a foculum of beans called overseers a most abject unprincipled race unquote. he was the forerunner and possibly in some degree the progenitor of that class who did so much to intensify the evils of slavery the mean whites of later times when once negro slavery was firmly established any rival form of industry was doomed it was an economical law of slavery that where it exists it must exist without a rival it can only succeed where it is a predominant form of labor the utility of the slave is that of a machine when once he has been trained to any special kind of industry no attempts to enlarge his sphere of activity can be attended with profit the time given to the new acquisition is so much waste and his mental incapacity in absence of any moral interest in his work almost necessarily limits him to a single task thus as we have seen the many attempts to develop varied forms of production in the southern colonies all failed maryland and virginia grew only tobacco south carolina grew mainly rice moreover the spectacle of the free laborer working on the same soil and at the same task would be fatal to that resignation and that complete moral and intellectual subjection which alone can make slave labor possible thus the cheaper and more efficient system attained the mastery so completely that by the beginning of the eighteenth century slave and negro had become well-nigh synonymous terms in the section eleven section twelve of great epochs in american history volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by bill mosley llano county texas u s a great epochs in american history volume two the planting of the first colonies fifteen sixty two to seventeen thirty three by francis whiting halsey section twelve new england before the pilgrim fathers landed sixteen fourteen by captain john smith footnote from smith's description of new england published in london in sixteen sixteen Smith's exploration of New England was made after he had become separated from the Jamestown colony. 
of which in 1608 he had been president. He went there under an engagement with London merchants to fish for cod, barter for furs, and explore the country for settlement. It was he who, at the request of Prince Charles, named the country New England. In the footnote, in the month of April, 1614, with two ships from London, of a few merchants, I chanced to arrive in New England, a part of America, at the Isle of Monahegan, in forty-three and a half of northerly latitude. Our plot was there to take whales and make trials of a mine of gold and copper. If those failed, fish and furs was then our refuge to make ourselves savers howsoever. We found this whale-fishing a costly conclusion. We saw many, and spent much time in chasing them, but could not kill any, they being a kind of lubartes, and not the whale that yields fins and oil as we expected. For our gold, it was rather the master's device to get a voyage that projected it, than any knowledge he had at all of any such matter. Fish and furs was now our guard, and by our late arrival, and long lingering about the whale, the prime of both those seasons were past ere we perceived it. We thinking that their season served at all times, but we found it otherwise, for by the midst of June the fishing failed. Yet in July and August some was taken, but not sufficient to defray so great a charge as our stay required. Of dry fish we made about 40,000, of core fish about 7,000. Whilst the sailors fished, myself with eight or nine others of them might best be spared. Ranging the coast in a small boat, we got for trifles near 1,100 beaver skins, 100 martens, and near as many otters, and the most of them within the distances of 20 leagues. We ranged the coast both east and west much further, but eastwards our commodities were not esteemed. They were so near the French, who affords them better, and right against us in the main was a ship of Sir Francis Popfame's that had there such acquaintance, having many years used only that port, that the most part there was had by him. And forty leagues westwards were two French ships, that had made there a great voyage by trade during the time we tried those conclusions, not knowing the coast, nor savages' habitation. With these furs, the train and corfish are returned for England in the bark where within six months after our departure from the Downs, we safe arrived back. The best of this fish was sold for five pound the hundredth, and rest by ill usage betwixt three pound and fifty shillings. The other ship stayed to fit herself for Spain with the dry fish which was sold, by the sailors' report that returned, at forty riles the quintal, each hundred weighing two quintals and a half. New England is that part of America in the ocean sea, opposite to Nova Albion in the South Sea, discovered by the most memorable Sir Francis Drake in his voyage about the world. In regard whereto, this is styled New England, being in the same latitude. New France, off it, is northward. Southwards is Virginia, and all the adjoining continent with New Granada, New Spain, New Andalusia, and the West Indies. Now, because I have been so oft asked such strange questions of the goodness and greatness of those spacious tracts of land, how they can be thus long unknown, or not possessed by the Spaniard, and many such like demands, I entreat your pardons. If I chance to be too plain or tedious in relating my knowledge for plain men's satisfaction. That part we call New England is betwixt the degrees of 41 and 45. 
But that part this discourse speaketh of stretcheth but from Penobscot to Cape Cod, some seventy-five leagues by a right line distant each from other within which bounds I have seen at least forty several habitations upon the sea coast, and sounded about twenty-five excellent good harbors, in many whereof there is anchorage for five hundred sail of ships of any burthen, in some of them for five thousand, and more than two hundred isles overgrown with good timber, of divers sorts of wood, which do make so many harbors as requireth a longer time than I had to be well discovered. And surely by reason of those sandy cliffs and cliffs of rocks, both which we saw so planted with gardens and cornfields, and so well inhabited with a goodly, strong, and well-proportioned people, besides the greatness of the timber growing on them, the greatness of the fish, and the moderate temper of the air, Four of twenty-five, not any was sick, but two that were many years diseased before they went, notwithstanding our bad lodging and accidental diet. Who can but approve this a most excellent place, both for health and fertility? And of all the four parts of the world that I have seen not inhabited, could I have but means to transport a colony? I would rather live here than anywhere, and if it did not maintain itself, were we but once indifferently well fitted, let us starve. The main staple from hence to be extracted for the present to produce the rest is fish, which, however, it may seem a mean and a base commodity, yet who will but truly take the pains and consider the sequel, I think will allow it well worth the labor. First, the ground is so fertile that, questionless, it is capable of producing any grain, fruits, or seeds you will sow or plant, growing in the regions aforenamed. But it may be not every kind to that perfection of delicacy, or some tender plants may miscarry, because the summer is not so hot, and the winter is more cold in those parts we have yet tried near the seaside than we find in the same height in Europe and Asia. Yet I made a garden upon the top of a rocky isle in forty-three and a half, four leagues from the main, in May, that grew so well, as it served us, for salads in June and July. All sorts of cattle may here be bred and fed in the isles or peninsulas, securely for nothing. In the interim, Till they increase, if need be, observing the seasons, I durst undertake to have corn enough from the savages for three hundred men, for a few trifles, and if they should be untoward, as it is most certain they are, thirty or forty good men will be sufficient to bring them all in subjection, and make this provision. If they understand what they do, Two hundred whereof may nine months of the year be employed in making merchantable fish, till the rest provide other necessaries fit to furnish us with other commodities. But to return a little more to the particulars of this country, which I intermingle thus with my projects and reasons, not being so sufficiently yet acquainted with these parts, to ride fully the estate of the sea, the air, the land, the fruits, the rocks, the people, the government, religions, territories, and limitations, friends and foes. But as I gathered from the niggardly relations in a broken language to my understanding, during the time I ranged those countries, etc., the most northern part I was at was the Bay of Penobscot, which is east and west, north and south, more than ten leagues. But such were my occasions I was constrained to be satisfied of them, I found in the bay that the river ran far up into the land and was well inhabited with many people. But they were from their habitations, either fishing among the isles or hunting the lakes and woods for deer and beavers. The bay is full of great islands of one, two, six, eight, or ten miles in length 
which divides it into many fair and excellent good harbors. On the east of it are the Tarentines, their mortal enemies, where inhabit the French, as they report that line with those people as one nation or family. And northwest of Penobscot is Bacotacut, at the foot of a high mountain, a kind of fortress against the Tarentines adjoining to the high mountains of Penobscot, against whose feet doth beat the sea. But over all the land, isles, or other impediments, you may well see them sixteen or eighteen leagues from their situation. Sagacat is the next, then Nefconcus, Pemaquid, and Sagadahoc. Up this river, where was the western plantation, are Almacaghan, Kennebec, and divers others, where there is planted some cornfields. Along the river, forty or fifty miles, I saw nothing but great high cliffs of barren rocks, overgrown with wood, but where the savages dwelt, there the ground is exceeding fat and fertile. Westward of this river is the country of Ocasisco, in the bottom of a large deep bay full of runny great isles, which divides it into many good harbors. So Wakatuk is the next, in the edge of a large sandy bay, which hath many rocks and isles, but few good harbors, but for barks I yet know. But all this goes to Penobscot, and as far as I could see eastward of it is nothing but such high, craggy, cliffy rocks and stony isles, that I wondered such great trees could grow upon so hard foundations. It is a country rather to affright than delight one. And how to describe a more plain spectacle of desolation or more barren, I know not. Yet the sea there is the strangest fish pond I ever saw, and those barren isles so furnished with good wood, springs, fruits, fish, and fowl, that it makes me think, though the coast be rocky and thus affrightable, the valleys, plains, and interior parts may well, notwithstanding, be very fertile. But there is no kingdom so fertile, hath not some part barren, and New England is great enough to make many kingdoms and countries, were it all inhabited. As you pass the coast still westward, Acomiticus and Passataquac are two convenient harbors for small barks, and a good country within their craggy cliffs. Angoam is the next. This place might content a right curious judgment, but there are many sands at the entrance of the harbor, and the worst is, it is embayed too far from the deep sea. Here are many rising hills, and on their tops and descents many corn fields and delightful groves. On the east is an isle of two or three leagues in length, the one half, plain moorish grass fit for pasture, with many fair high groves of mulberry trees gardens, and there is also oaks, pines, and other woods to make this place an excellent habitation being a good and safe harbor. Nymkeek, though it be more rocky ground, or Angoam is sandy, not much inferior, neither for the harbor, nor anything I could perceive, but the multitude of people. From hence doth stretch into the sea the fair headland Tragabixanda, fronted with three isles called the Three Turks Heads. To the north of this, doth enter a great bay, where we found some habitations and cornfields, they report a great river. Footnote. Probably the Merrimack. End footnote. And at least thirty habitations do possess this country. But because the French had got their trade, I had no leisure to discover it. The Isles of Matahunts or on the west side of the bay, where are many isles and questionless good harbors, and then the country of the Massachusetts, which is the paradise of all those parts. For here are many leaves, all planted with corn, groves, mulberries, savage gardens, and good harbors. The coast is, for the most part, high clay sandy cliffs. 
The sea coast, as you pass, shows you all along large cornfields and great troops of well-proportioned people. But the French, having remained here near six weeks, left nothing for us to take occasion to examine the inhabitants' relations, viz. if there be near three thousand people upon these isles, and that the river doth pierce many days' journeys the entrails of that country. We found the people in those parts very kind, but in their fury no less valiant. For upon a quarrel we had with one of them, he only with three others crossed the harbor of Quanahasset to certain rocks whereby we must pass, and there let fly their arrows for our shot till we were out of danger. Then come you to Akomak, an excellent good harbor, good land, and no want of anything but industrious people. After much kindness, upon a small occasion, we fought also with forty or fifty of those, though some were hurt and some slain, yet within an hour after they became friends. Cape Cod is the next presents itself, which is only a headland of high hills of sand, overgrown with shrubby pines, herds, and such trash, but an excellent harbor for all weathers. This cape is made by the main sea on the one side, and a great bay on the other in form of a sickle. On it doth inhabit the people of Palmet, and in the bottom of the bay the people of Chawam. End of section 12《》Section 13 of Great Epochs in American History, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Great Epochs in American History, Volume 2 The Planting of the First Colonies, 1562 to 1733. By Francis Whiting Halsey. Section 13. The First Voyage of the Mayflower, 1620. By Governor William Bradford. September 6th. These troubles being blown over, and now all being compact together in one ship, they put to sea again with a prosperous wind, which continued diverse days together, which was some encouragement unto them, Yet, according to the usual manner, many were afflicted with seasickness. After they had enjoyed fair winds and weather for a season, they were encountered many times with cross winds, and met with many fierce storms, with which the ship was shroudly shaken, and her upper works made very leaky, and one of the main beams in the midships was bowed and craped, which put them in some fear that the ship could not be able to perform the voyage. So some of the chief of the company, perceiving the mariners to fear the sufficiency of the ship, as appeared by their mutterings, they entered into serious consultation with the master and other officers of the ship, to consider in time of the danger, and rather to return then to cast themselves into a desperate and inevitable peril. And truly there was great distraction and difference of opinion amongst the mariners themselves, Fain would they do what would be done for their wages' sake, being now half the seas over, and on the other hand they were loath to hazard their lives too desperately. But in examining of all opinions, the master and others affirmed that they knew the ship to be strong and firm under water, and for the buckling of the main beam there was a great iron screw the passengers brought out of Holland which would raise the beam into his place. The which being done, the carpenter and the master affirmed that with a post put under it, set firm in the lower deck, and other ways bound, he would make it sufficient. And as far as the decks and upper works, they would caulk them as well as they could, and though with the working of the ship they would not long keep stanch, yet there would otherwise be no great danger if they did not overpress her with sails. So they committed themselves to the will of God, and resolved to proceed. In sundry of these storms the winds were so fierce, and the seas so high, as they could not bear a knot of sail, but were forced to hull for diverse days together. And in one of them, as they thus lay at hull, a mighty storm, 
a lusty young man called john roland coming upon some occasion above the gratings was with a seal of the ship thrown into the sea but it pleased god that he caught hold of the topsail halyards which hung overboard and ran out at length yet he held his hold though he was sundry fathoms under water till he was hauled up by the same rope and the brime of the water and then with a boat-hook and other means got into the ship again and his life saved and though he was something ill with it yet he lived many years after and became a profitable member both in church and commonwealth in all this siege there died but one of the passengers which was william button a youth servant to samuel fuller when they drew near the coast but to omit other things that i may be brief after long beating at sea they fell with that land which is called cape cod the which being made and certainly known to be it they were not a little joyful after some deliberation had amongst themselves and with the master of the ship they tacked about and resolved to stand for the southward the wind and weather being fair to find some place about hudson's river for their habitation but after they had sailed the course about half the day they fell amongst dangerous shoals and roaring breakers and they were so far entangled there with as they conceived themselves in great danger and the wind shrinking upon them withal they resolved to bear up again for the cape and thought themselves happy to get out of those dangers before night o'ertook them as by god's providence they did and the next day they got into the cape harbour where they rid in safety a word or two by the way of this cape it was thus first named by captain gosnell in his company in the year sixteen two and after by captain smith was called cape james but it retains the former name among seamen also the point which first showed those dangerous shoals unto them they called point care and tucker's terror but the french and dutch to this day call it malabar by reason of those perilous shoals and the losses they have suffered there being thus arrived in a good harbour and brought safe to land they fell upon their knees and blessed the god of heaven who had brought them over the vast and furious ocean and delivered them from all the perils and miseries thereof again to set their feet on the firm and stable earth their proper element and no marvel if they were thus joyful seeing why seneca was so affected with sailing a few miles on the coast of his own italy as he affirmed that he had rather remained twenty years on his way by land than pass by sea to any place in a short time so tedious and dreadful was the same unto him but here i cannot but stay and make a pause and stand half amazed at this poor people's present condition and so i think will the reader too when he well considers the same being thus past the vast ocean and a sea of troubles before in their preparation as may be remembered by that which went before they had now no friends to welcome them nor inns to entertain or refresh their weather-beaten bodies no houses or much less towns to repair to to seek for succour it is recorded in scripture as a mercy to the apostle and his shipwrecked company that the barbarians showed them no small kindness in refreshing them but these savage barbarians when they met with them as after will appear were readier to fill their sides full of arrows than otherwise and for the season it was winter and they that know the winters of the country know them to be sharp and violent and subject to cruel and fierce storms dangerous to travel to known places much more to search an unknown coast besides what could they see but a hideous and desolate wilderness full of wild beasts and wild men and what multitudes there might be of them they knew not neither could they as it were go up to the top of pisgah to view from this wilderness a more goodly country to feed their hops for which way soever they turned their eyes save upward to the heavens they could have little solace or content in respect of any outward objects for summer being done all things stand upon them with a weather-beaten face and the whole country full of woods and thickets represented a wild and savage view if they looked behind them there was the mighty ocean which they had passed and was now as a main bar and gulf to separate them from all the civil parts of the world if it be said they had a ship to succour them it is true but what heard they daily from the master and company 
but with speed they should look out a place with their shallop where they would be at some near distance for the season was such as he would not stir from thence till a safe harbour was discovered by them where they would be and he might go without danger and that victuals consumed apace but he must and would keep sufficient for themselves and their return yea it was muttered by some that if they got not a place in time they would turn them and their goods ashore and leave them let it also be considered what weak hopes of supply and succor they left behind them that might bear up their minds in this sad condition and trials they were under and they could not be very small it is true indeed that affections and love of their brethren at leyden was cordial and entire towards them but they had little power to help them or themselves and how the case stood between them and the merchants at their coming away hath already been declared what could now sustain them but the spirit of god and his grace being thus arrived at cape cod the eleventh of november and necessity calling them to look out a place for habitation as well as the masters and mariners importunity they having brought a large shallop with them out of england stowed in quarters the ship they now got her out and set their carpenters to work to trim her up but being much bruised and shattered in the ship with foul weather they saw she would be long in mending whereupon a few of them tendered themselves to go by land and discover those nearest places whilst the shallop was in mending and the rather because they went into that harbour there seemed to be an opening some two or three leagues of which the master judged to be a river it was conceived there might be some danger in the attempt yet seeing them resolute they were permitted to go being sixteen of them well armed under the conduct of captain standish having such instructions given them as was thought meet they set forth the fifteenth of november and when they had marched about the space of a mile by the seaside they espied five or six persons with a dog coming towards them who were savages but they fled from them and ran up into the woods and the english followed them partly to see if they could speak with them and partly to discover if there might not be more of them lying in ambush but the indians seeing themselves thus followed they again forsook the woods and ran away on the sands as hard as they could so as they could not come near them but followed them by the track of their feet sundry miles and saw that they had come the same way so night coming on they made their rendezvous and set out their sentinels and rested in quiet the night and the next morning followed their track till they had headed a great creek and so left the sands and turned an other way into the woods but they still followed them by guess hoping to find their dwellings but they soon lost both them and themselves falling into such thickets as were ready to tear their clothes and armor to pieces but were most distressed for want of drink but at length they found water and refreshed themselves being the first new england water they drunk of and was now in their great thirst as pleasant unto them as wine or beer had been in four times afterwards they directed their course to come to the other shore for they knew it was a neck of land they were to cross over and so at length got to the seaside and marched to this supposed river and by the way found a pond of clear fresh water and shortly after a good quantity of clear ground where the indians had formerly set corn and some of their graves and proceeding further they saw a new stubble where corn had been set the same year also they found where lately a house had been where some planks and great kettle was remaining and heaps of sand newly paddled with their hands which they digging up found in them diverse fair indian baskets filled with corn and some in ears fair and good of diverse colours which seemed to them a very goodly sight having never seen any such before in the month of november being spent in these affairs and much foul weather falling in the sixth of december they sent out their shallop again with ten of their principal men and some seamen upon further discovery intending to circulate her the deep bay of cape cod the weather was very cold and it froze so hard as the spray of the sea lighting on their coats they were as if they had been glazed yet that night betimes they got down into the bottom of the bay and as they dined near the shore they saw some ten or twelve indians very busy about something they landed about a league or two from them and had much flats 
being landed it grew late and they made themselves a barricade with logs and bows as well as they could in the time and set out their sentinel and betook them to rest and saw smoke of the fire the savages made that night when morning was come they divided their company some to coast along the shore in the boat and the rest marched the woods to see the land if any fit place might be for their dwelling they came also to the place whom they saw the indians the night before and found they had been cutting up a great fish like a grumpus being some two inches thick of fat like a hog some pieces whereof they had left by the way and the shallop found two more of these fishes dead on the sands thing usual after storms in the place by reason of the great flats of sands that lie of so they ranged up and down all that day but found no people nor any place they liked when the sun grew low they hasted out of the woods to meet with their shallop to whom they made signs to come to them into a creek hard by which they did at high water of which they were very glad for they had not seen each other all that day since the morning so they made them a barricado as usually they did every night with logs stakes and thick pine boughs the height of a man leaving it open to leeward partly to shelter them from the cold and wind making their fire in the middle and lying round about it and partly to defend themselves from any sudden assaults of the savages if they could surround them so being very weary they betook them to rest and about midnight they heard a hideous great cry and their sentinel called army army so they bestirred them and stood to their arms and shot a couple of muskets and then the noise ceased they concluded it was a company of wolves or such like wild beasts for one of the seamen told them that he had often heard such a noise in newfoundland so they rested until about five of the clock in the morning for the tide and their purpose to go from thence made them be stirring betimes so after prayer they prepared for breakfast and it being day dawning it was thought best to be carrying things down to the boat but some said it was not best to carry their arms down others said they would be the readier for they had leapt them up in their coats from the dew but some three or four would not carry theirs till they went themselves yet it fell out the water being not high enough they laid them down on the bank side and came up to breakfast but presently all on the sudden they heard a great and strange cry which they knew to be the same voices they heard in the night though they varied their notes and one of their company being abroad came running in and cried men indians indians and with all their arrows came flying amongst them their men ran with all speed to recover their arms as by the good providence of god they did in the meantime of those who were there ready two muskets were discharged at them and two more stood ready in the entrance of the rendezvous but were commanded not to shoot till they could take full aim at them and the other two charged again with all speed for there were only four had arms there and defended the barricade which was first assaulted the cry of the indians was dreadful especially when they saw their men run out of the rendezvous towards the shallop to recover their arms the indians wheeling about upon them but some running out with coats of mail on and cutlasses in their hands they soon got their arms and let fly amongst them and quickly stopped their violence yet there was a lusty man and no less valiant stood behind a tree within half a musket shot and let his arrows fly at them he was seen shoot three arrows which were all avoided he stood three shot of a musket till one taking full aim at him and made the bark or splinters of the tree fly about his ears after which he gave an extraordinary shriek and away they went all of them they left some to keep the shallop and followed them about a quarter of a mile and shouted once or twice and shot two or three pieces and so returned this they did that they might conceive that they were not afraid of them or any way discouraged thus it pleased god to vanquish their enemies and give them deliverance and by his special providence so to dispose that not any one of them were either hurt or hit though their arrows came close by them and on every side of them and sundry of their coats which hung up in the barricado were shot through and through afterwards they gave god solemn thanks and praised for their deliverance and gathered up a bundle of their arrows 
and sent them into england afterward by the master of the ship and called that place the first encounter from thence they departed and coasted all along but discerned no place likely for harbour and therefore hasted to a place that their pilot one master coppin who had been in the country before did assure them was a good harbour which he had been in and they might fetch it before night of which they were glad for it began to be foul weather after some hours sailing it began to snow and rain and about the middle of the afternoon the wind increased and the sea became very rough and they broke their rudder and it was as much as two men could do to steer her with a couple of oars but their pilot bade them be of good cheer for he saw the harbour but the storm increasing and night drawing on they bore what sail they could to get in while they could see but herewith they broke their mast in three pieces and their sail fell overheard in a very grown sea so as they had like to have been cast away yet by god's mercy they recovered themselves and having the flood with them struck into the harbour but when it came to the pilot was deceived in the place and said the lord be merciful unto them for his eyes never saw the place before and he and the master mate would have run her ashore in a cove full of breakers before the wind but a lusty seaman which steered bad those which rode if they were men about her or else they were cast away the which they did with speed so he bid them be of good cheer and row lustily for there was a fair sound before them and he doubted not but they should find one place or other where they might ride in safety and though it was very dark and rained sore yet in the end they got under the lee of a small island and remained there all the night safety but they knew not this to be an island till morning but were divided into their minds some would keep the boat for fear they might be amongst the indians others were so weak and could they not endure but got ashore and with much ado got fire all things being so wet and the rest were glad to come to them for after midnight the wind shifted to the northwest and it froze hard but though this had been a day and night of much trouble and danger unto them yet god gave them a morning of comfort and refreshing as usually he doth to his children for the next day was a fair sunshiny day and they found themselves to be on an island secure from the indians where they might dry their stuff fix their pieces and rest themselves and gave god thanks for his mercies in their manifold deliverances and this being the last day of the week they prepared there to keep the sabbath on monday they sounded the harbour and found it fit for shipping and marched into the land and found diverse cornfields and little running brooks a place as they supposed fit for situation at least it was the best they could find and the season and their present necessity made them glad to accept of it so they returned to their ship again with this news to the rest of their people which did much comfort their hearts on the fifteenth of december they weighed anchor to go to the place they had discovered and came within two leagues of it but were fain to bear up again but the sixteenth day the wind came fair and they arrived safe in this harbour and afterwards took better view of the place and resolved there to pitch their dwelling and the twenty-fifth day began to erect the first house for common use to receive them and their goods i shall a little return back to begin with the combination made by them before they came ashore being the first foundation of their government in this place occasioned partly by the discontented and mutinous speeches that some of the strangers amongst them had let fall from them in the ship that when they came ashore they would use their own liberty for none had power to command them the patent they had being for virginia and not for new england which belonged to another government with which the virginia company had nothing to do and partly that such an act by them done this their condition considered might be as firm as any patent and in some respects more sure the form was as followeth in the name of god amen we whose names are underwritten the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign lord king james by the grace of god of great britain france and ireland king defender of the faith etc having undertaken for the glory of god and the advancement of the christian faith and honour of our king and country a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of virginia do by these presents solemnly and mutually in the presence of god and one of another 
covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic for our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends aforesaid and by virtue hereof enact constitute and frame such just and equal laws ordinances acts constitutions and offices from time to time as shall be thought most meet and convenient for the general good of the colony unto which we promise all due submission and obedience in witness whereof we have hereunder subscribed our names at cape cod the eleventh of november in the year of england france and ireland the eighteenth and of scotland the fifty-fourth anno domini sixteen twenty end of section thirteen section fourteen of great epochs in american history volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by rita boutros great epochs in american history volume two the planting of the first colonies fifteen sixty two to seventeen thirty three by francis whiting halsey section fourteen the first new york settlements sixteen twenty three to sixteen twenty eight by nicholas jean de wassenaer we treated in our preceding discourse of the discovery of some rivers in virginia the studious reader will learn how affairs proceeded the West India Company, being chartered to navigate these rivers, did not neglect so to do, but equipped in the spring of 1623 a vessel of a 130 lass called the New Netherland, whereof Cornelius Jacobs of Horn was skipper, with 30 families, mostly Walloons, to plant a colony there. They sailed in the beginning of March, and directing their course by the Canary Islands, steered towards the wild coast, and gained the west wind, which luckily took them in the beginning of May into the river called first Rio de Montagne, now the river Mauritius, lying in forty and one-half degrees. He found a Frenchman lying in the mouth of the river, who would erect the arms of the King of France there but the Hollanders would not permit him, opposing it by commission from the Lord's States General and the directors of the West India Company, and in order not to be frustrated therein, with the assistance of those of the mackerel which lay above, they caused a yacht of two guns to be manned, and convoyed the Frenchmen out of the river, who would do the same thing in the South River, but he was also prevented by the settlers there. This being done, the ship sailed up to the Maycans, forty-four miles, near which they built and completed a fort named Orange, with four bastions on an island, by them called Castle Island. Respecting these colonies, they have already a prosperous beginning, and the hope is that they will not fall through, provided they be zealously sustained, not only in that place, but in the South River. For their increase and prosperous advancement, it is highly necessary that those sent out be first of all well provided with means both of support and defense, and that being freemen, they be settled there on a free tenure, that all they work for and gain be theirs to dispose of and to sell it according to their pleasure that whoever is placed over them as commander act as their father, not as their executioner, leading them with a gentle hand, for whoever rules them as a friend and associate will be beloved by them, as he who will order them as a superior will subvert and nullify everything. Yea, they will excite against him the neighboring provinces to which they will fly." "'Tis better to rule by love and friendship than by force. "'As the country is well adapted for agriculture "'and the raising of everything that is produced here, "'the aforesaid lords resolved to take advantage of the circumstances "'and to provide the place with many necessaries "'through the Honorable Pieter Evertsen Holst, "'who undertook to ship thither at his risk "'whatever was requisite, to wit, 
one hundred and three head of cattle, stallions, mares, steers, and cows, for breeding and multiplying, besides all the hogs and sheep that might be thought expedient to send thither, and to distribute these in two ships of one hundred and forty lass, in such a manner that they should be well foddered and attended to. In company with these goes a fast-sailing vessel at the risk of the directors. In these aforesaid vessels also go six complete families with some freemen, so that forty-five newcomers or inhabitants are taken out to remain there. The natives of New Netherland are very well disposed so long as no injury is done them but if any wrong be committed against them, they think it long till they be revenged. They are a wicked bad people, very fierce in arms. Their dogs are small. When the Honorable Lebrecht van Twenhuysen, once a skipper, had given them a big dog, and it was presented to them on shipboard, they were very much afraid of it, calling it also a sachem of dogs, being the biggest. The dog, tied with a rope on board, was very furious against them, they being clad like beasts with skins, for he thought they were game. But when they gave him some of their bread made of Indian corn, which grows there, he learned to distinguish them, that they were men. The colony was planted at this time, on the Manhattes, where a fort was staked out by Master Crin Frederiki, an engineer. It will be of large dimensions. The government over the people of New Netherland continued on the 15th of August of this year in the aforesaid Minuit, successor to Verhulst, who went thither from Holland on 9th January, anno 1626, and took up his residence in the midst of a nation called Manhattes, building a fort there to be called Amsterdam having four points, and faced outside entirely with stone, as the walls of sand fall down, and are now more compact. The population consists of 270 souls, including men, women, and children. They remained as yet without the fort, in no fear, as the natives live peaceably with them. They are situate three miles from the sea, on the river by us called Mauritius, by others, Rio de Montan. After the Right Honorable Lords Directors of the Privileged West India Company in the United Netherlands had provided for the defense of New Netherland and put everything there in good order, they, taking into consideration the advantages of said place, the favorable nature of the air and soil, and that considerable trade and goods and many commodities may be obtained from thence, sent some persons of their own accord thither with all sorts of cattle and implements necessary for agriculture, so that in the year 1628 there already resided on the island of the Manhattes, 270 souls, men, women, and children, under Governor Minuit, for Hulse successor, living there in peace with the natives. But as the land, in many places, being full of weeds and wild productions, could not be properly cultivated in consequence of the scantiness of the population, the said lords directors of the West India Company, the better to people their lands and to bring the country to produce more abundantly, resolved to grant diverse privileges, freedoms, and exemptions to all patroons, masters, or individuals who should plant any colonies and cattle in New Netherland and they accordingly have constituted and published in print certain exemptions to afford better encouragement and infuse greater zeal into whomsoever should be inclined to reside and plant his colony in New Netherland. End of section 14《Of Great Epochs in American History》Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Rita Boutros. Great Epochs in American History, Volume 2. The Planting of the First Colonies, 1562 to 1733, by Francis Whiting Halsey. Section 15. The Swedes and Dutch in New Jersey and Delaware, 1627, by Israel Acrelius. After that, the magnanimous Genoese Christopher Columbus had, at the expense of Ferdinand, king of Spain, in the year 1492, discovered the Western Hemisphere, and the illustrious Florentine Americus Vespucius sent out by King Emmanuel of Portugal in the year 1502 to make a further exploration of its coasts, had had the good fortune to give the country his name. The European powers have, from time to time, sought to promote their several interests there. Our Swedes and Goths were the less backward in such expeditions as they had always been the first therein. They had already, in the year 996, after the birth of Christ, visited America, had named it Vinland the Good, and also Skrelling's Land, and had called its inhabitants the Skrellings of Vinland. It is therefore evident that the Northmen had visited some part of North America before the Spaniards and Portuguese went to South America. From that time until 1623, when the West India Company obtained its charter, their trade with the Indians was conducted almost entirely on shipboard, and they made no attempts to build any house or fortress until 1629. Now, whether that was done with or without the permission of England, the town of New Amsterdam was built and fortified, as also the place Orania Orange, now called Albany, having since had three general governors, one after the other. But that was not yet enough. They wished to extend their power to the River Delaware also, and erected on its shores two or three small forts, which were, however, soon after destroyed by the natives of the country. It now came in order for Sweden also to take part in this enterprise. William Usselinx, a Hollander, born at Antwerp in Brabant, presented himself to King Gustav Adolf and laid before him a proposition for a trading company to be established in Sweden and to extend its operations to Asia Africa, and Magellan's land, Terra Magellanica, with the assurance that this would be a great source of revenue to the kingdom. Full power was given him to carry out this important project, and thereupon a contract of trade was drawn up, to which the company was to agree and subscribe it. Euselinx published explanations of this contract, wherein he also particularly directed attention to the country on the Delaware, its fertility, convenience, and all its imaginable resources. To strengthen the matter, a charter, Octroy, was secured for the company, and especially to Euselinx, who was to receive a royalty of one thousandth upon all articles bought or sold by the company. The powerful king, whose zeal for the honor of God was not less ardent than for the welfare of his subjects, availed himself of this opportunity to extend the doctrines of Christ among the heathen, as well as to establish his own power in other parts of the world. To this end he sent forth letters patent, dated at Stockholm on the 2nd of July, 1626 wherein all, both high and low, were invited to contribute something to the company according to their means. The work was completed in the Diet of the following year, 1627, when the estates of the realm gave their assent and confirmed the measure. But when these arrangements were now in full progress and duly provided for, the German war and the king's death occurred, which caused this important work to be laid aside. The trading company was dissolved, its subscriptions nullified, and the whole project seemed about to die with the king. 
but just as it appeared to be at its end it received new life another hollander by the name of peter menu sometimes called menuet made his appearance in sweden as a good beginning the first colony was sent off and peter menu was placed over it as being best acquainted in those regions they set sail from Gothborg in a ship of war called the Key of Colmar, followed by a smaller vessel bearing the name of the Bird Griffin, both laden with people, provisions, ammunition, and merchandise suitable for traffic and gifts to the Indians. The ships successfully reached their place of destination. The high expectations which our emigrants had of that new land were well met by the first views which they had of it. They made their first landing on the bay, or entrance, to the river Putaxit, which they called the River of New Sweden, and the place where they landed they called Paradise Point. A purchase of land was immediately made from the Indians and it was determined that all the land on the western side of the river, from the point called Cape Inlopen, or Hinlopen, up to the fall called Santican, and all the country inland, as much as was ceded, should belong to the Swedish crown forever. Posts were driven into the ground as landmarks, which were still seen in their places sixty years afterward. A deed was drawn up for the land thus purchased. This was written in Dutch, because no Swede was yet able to interpret the language of the heathen. The Indians subscribed their hands and marks. The writing was sent home to Sweden, to be preserved in the royal archives. Mans Kling was the surveyor. He laid out the land, and made a map of the whole river, with its tributaries, islands, and points, which is still to be found in the royal archives in Sweden. Their clergyman was Roris Torquillus of East Gothland. The first abode of the newly arrived emigrants was at a place called by the Indians Hopokahaking, there, in the year 1638, Peter Menuet built a fortress which he named Fort Christina, after the reigning queen of Sweden. The place, situated upon the west side of the river, was probably chosen so as to be out of the way of the Hollanders, who claimed the eastern side, a measure of prudence until the arrival of a greater force from Sweden. The fort was built upon an eligible site, not far from the mouth of the creek, so as to secure them in the navigable water of the Maniquas, which was afterward called Christina Kiel, or Creek. Peter Menuet made a good beginning for the settlement of the Swedish colony in America. He guarded his little fort for over three years, and the Hollanders neither attempted nor were able to overthrow it. After some years of faithful service, he died at Christina. In his place followed Peter Hollander, a native Swede, who did not remain at the head of its affairs more than a year and a half. He returned home to Sweden, and was a major at Skepsholm, in Stockholm, in the year 1655. The second emigration took place under Lieutenant Colonel John Prince, who went out with the appointment of Governor of New Sweden. He had a grant of $406 for his traveling expenses, and $1,200 silver as his annual salary. The company was invested with the exclusive privilege of importing tobacco into Sweden, although that article was even then regarded as unnecessary and injurious, although indispensable since the establishment of the bad habit of its use. Upon the same occasion was also sent out Magister John Companius Holm, who was called by their excellencies the Royal Council and Admiral Class Fleming to become the government chaplain and watch over the Swedish congregation. The ship on which they sailed was called the Fama. It went from Stockholm to Gothborg, and there took in its freight. Along with this went two other ships of the line, the Swan and the Charitas, 
laden with people, and other necessaries. Under Governor Prince, ships came to the colony in three distinct voyages. The first ship was the Black Cat, with ammunition, and merchandise for the Indians. Next, the ship Swan, on a second voyage, with emigrants in the year 1647. Afterward, two other ships, called the Key and the Lamp, during these times, the clergyman, Mr. Lawrence Charles Lacanius, and Mr. Israel Hogg, were sent out to the colony. The voyage to New Sweden was at that time quite long. The watery way to the west was not yet well discovered, and therefore, for fear of the sandbanks off Newfoundland, they kept their course to the east and south as far as to what were then called the Brazates. The ships, which went under the command of Governor Prince, sailed along the coast of Portugal and down the coast of Africa, until they found the eastern passage, then directly over to America, leaving the Canaries high up to the north. They landed at Antigua, then continued their voyage northward, past Virginia and Maryland, to Cape Hinlopen. Yet, in view of the astonishingly long route which they took, the voyage was quick enough in six months' time, from Stockholm on August 16, 1642, to the new fort of Christina in New Sweden on February 15, 1643. The Swedes who emigrated to America belonged partly to a trading company provided with a charter, who, for their services, according to their condition of agreement, were to receive pay and monthly wages. A part of them also went on their own impulse to try their fortune. For these it was free to settle and live in the country as long as they pleased, or to leave it and they were therefore, by way of distinction from the others, called freemen. At first, also, malefactors and vicious people were sent over, who were used as slaves to labor upon the fortifications. They were kept in chains, and not allowed to have intercourse with the other settlers. Moreover, a separate place of abode was assigned to them. The neighboring people and country were dissatisfied that such wretches should come into the colony. It was also, in fact, very objectionable in regard to the heathen, who might be greatly offended by it. Whence it happened that, when such persons came over in Governor Prince's time, it was not permitted that one of them should set foot upon the shore— but they had all to be carried back again, whereupon a great part of them died during the voyage, or perished in some other way. Afterward it was forbidden at home in Sweden, under a penalty, to take for the American voyage any persons of bad fame. Nor was there ever any lack of good people for the colony." Governor Prince was now in a position to put the government upon a safe footing to maintain the rights of the Swedes and to put down the attempts of the Hollanders. They had lately, before his arrival, patched their little Fort Nassau. On this account, he selected the island of Tenekong as his residence, which is sometimes also called Tutianog and Teniko about three Swedish miles from Fort Christina. The convenient situation of the place suggested its selection as also the location of Fort Nassau, which lay some miles over against it, to which he could thus command the passage by water. The new fort, which was erected and provided with considerable armament, was called New Gothburg. His place of residence which he adorned with orchards, gardens, a pleasure-house, etc., he named Prince Hall. A handsome wooden church was also built at the same place, which Magister Companius consecrated. On the last great prayer day, which was celebrated in New Sweden on the 4th of September, 1646, Upon that place also all the most prominent freemen had their residences and plantations. End of section 15
Section 16 of Great Epics in American History, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Great Epics in American History, Volume 2. The Planting of the First Colonies, 1562 to 1733, by Francis Whiting Halsey. Section 16. The Beginnings of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, 1627 to 1631, by Governor Thomas Dudley. Touching the plantation which we here have begun, it fell out thus about the years 1627, some friends, being together in Lincolnshire, fell into some discourse about New England and the planting of the gospel there. And after some deliberation, we imparted our reason by letters and messages to some in London and the West Country, where it was likewise deliberately thought upon, and at length, with often negotiation so ripened, that in the year 1628 we procured a patent from his matey for our planting between the Massachusetts Bay and Charles River on the south, and the River of Merrimack on the north, and three miles on either side of those rivers and bay, as also for the government of those who did or should inhabit within that compass. And the same year we sent Mr. John Endicott, and some with him, to begin a plantation, and to strengthen such as he should find there which we sent thither from Dorchester, and some places adjoining from whom the same year receiving hopeful news. The next year, 1629, we sent diverse ships over with about three hundred people, and some cows, goats, and horses, many of which arrived safely. These, by their two large commendations of the country, and the commodities thereof, invited us so strongly to go on that Mr. Wenthrop of Suffolk, who was well known in his country and well approved here for his piety, liberality, wisdom, and gravity, coming into us we came to such resolution that, in April 1630, we set sail from Old England with four good ships. And in May following, eight more followed, two having gone before in February and March, and two more following in June and August, besides another set out by a private merchant. These seventeen ships arrived all safe in New England, for the increase of the plantation here, this year, 1630. Our four ships, which set out in April, arrived here in June and July, where we found the colony in a sad and unexpected condition, above eighty of them being dead, the winter before and many of those alive, weak and sick, all the corn and bread amongst them, all hardly sufficient to feed them a fortnight insomuch that the remainder of one hundred and eighty servants we had the two years before sent over, coming to us for victuals to sustain them, we found ourselves wholly unable to feed them, by reason that the provisions shipped for them were taken out of the ship they were put in, and they who were trusted to ship them in another failed us and left them behind." whereupon necessity enforced us to our extreme loss to give them all liberty, who had cost us about sixteen or twenty pounds sterling a person, furnishing and sending over. But bearing these things as we might, we began to consult of the place of our sitting down, for Salem, where we landed, pleased us not. And to that purpose some were sent to the bay, to search up the rivers for a convenient place, who upon their return reported to have found a good place upon Mystic. But some others of us, seconding this to approve or dislike of their judgment, we found a place that liked us better three leagues up Charles River, and thereupon unshipped our goods into other vessels, and with much cost and labor brought them in July to Charlestown. But there, receiving advertisements by some of the late-arrived ships from London and Amsterdam of some French preparations against us, many of our people brought with us being sick of fevers and 
the scurvy, and we thereby unable to carry up our ordnance and baggage so far, we were forced to change counsel and for our present shelter to plant dispersedly. Some at Charlestown, which standeth on the north side of the mouth of the Charles River, some on the south side thereof, which place we named Boston, as we intend to have done the place we first resolved on. Some of us upon Mystic, which we named Medford. Some of us westward on Charles River, four miles from Charlestown, which we named Watertown. Others of us two miles from Boston in a place we named Roxbury. Others upon the river of Saugus, between Salem and Charlestown. And the western men, four miles south from Boston, at a place we named Dorchester. This dispersion troubled some of us, but help we could not, wanting ability to remove to any place fit to build a town upon, and the time too short to deliberate any longer, lest the winter should surprise us before we had built our houses. Of the people who came over with us from the time of their setting sail from England, April 1630, until December following, there died by estimation about two hundred at the least. So low hath the Lord brought us. Well, yet they who survived were not discouraged, but bearing God's corrections with humility and trusting in his mercies, and considering how after a great ebb he had raised up our neighbors at Plymouth, we began again in December to consult about a fit place to build a town, upon leaving all thoughts of a fort. Because upon any invasion we were necessarily to lose our houses when we should retire thereunto. So after diverse meetings at Boston, Roxbury, and Watertown, on the 28th of December we grew to this resolution to bind all the assistance Mr. Endicott and Mr. Sharp accepted, which last purposeth to return by the next ships into England to build houses at a place a mile east from Watertown near Charles River the next spring, and to winter there the next year. That so, by our examples and by removing the ordnance and munition thither, all who were able might be drawn thither, and such as shall come to us hereafter to their advantage, be compelled so to do. And so, if God would, a fortified town might there grow up, the place fitting reasonably well thereto. But now having some leisure to discourse of the motives for other men's coming to this place, or their abstaining from it, after my brief manner I say this, that if any come hither to plant for worldly ends that can live well at home, he commits an error of which he will soon repent him. But if for spiritual ends, and that no particular obstacle hinder his removal, he may find here what may well content him, that is, materials to build, fuel to burn, ground to plant, seas and rivers to fish in, a pure air to breathe in, good water to drink till wine or beer can be made, which together with the cows, hogs, and goats brought hither already may suffice for food, for as fowl and venison they are dainties here as well as in England. For cloths and beddings they must bring them with them till time and industry produce them here. In a word, we yet enjoy little to be envied, but endure much to be pitied in the sickness and mortality of our people. End of section 16 Section 17 of Great Epics in American History, Volume 2 How the Bay Colony Differed from Plymouth by John G. Palfrey the emigration of the Englishmen who settled at Plymouth had been prompted by religious dissent. In what manner Robinson, who was capable of speculating on political tendencies, or Brewster, whose early position had compelled him to observe them, had augured concerning the prospect of public affairs in their native country, no record tells. 
while the rustics of the Scrooby congregation, who fled from a government which denied them liberty in their devotions, could have had but little knowledge and no agency in the political sphere. The case was widely different with the founders of the colony of Massachusetts Bay. That settlement had its rise in a state of things in England which associated religion and politics in an intimate alliance. Winthrop, then forty-two years old, was descended from a family of good condition, long seated at Groton in Suffolk, where he had a property of six or seven hundred pounds a year, the equivalent of at least two thousand pounds at the present day. His father was a lawyer and a magistrate. Commanding uncommon respect and confidence from an early age, he had moved in the circles where the highest matters of English policy were discussed, by men who had been associates of Whitgift, Bacon, Essex, and Cecil. Humphrey was a gentleman of special parts, of learning and activity, and a godly man. In the home of his father-in-law, Thomas, the third Earl of Lincoln, the head in that day of the now ducal house of Newcastle, he had been the familiar companion of the patriotic nobles. Of the assistants, Isaac Johnson, esteemed the richest of the emigrants, was another son-in-law of Lord Lincoln, and a landholder in three counties. Sir Richard Saltonstall of Halifax in Yorkshire was rich enough to be a bountiful contributor to the company's operations. Thomas Dudley, with a company of volunteers which he had raised, had served thirty years before under King Henry IV of France, since which time he had managed the estates of the Earl of Lincoln. He was old enough to have lent a shrill voice to the huzzas at the defeat of the Armada, and his military services had indoctrinated him in the lore of civil and religious freedom. Theophilus Eaton, an eminent London merchant, was used to courts and had been a minister of Charles I in Denmark. Simon Bradstreet, the son of a nonconformist minister in Lincolnshire and a grandson of a Suffolk gentleman of a fine estate, had studied at Emmanuel College, Cambridge. William Vassal was an opulent West India proprietor. The principal planters of Massachusetts, says the prejudiced Chalmers, were English country gentlemen of no inconsiderable fortunes, of enlarged understandings improved by liberal education, of extensive ambition concealed under the appearance of religious humility. But it is not alone from what we know of the position, character, and objects of those few members of the Massachusetts Company who were proposing to emigrate at the early period now under our notice that we are to estimate the power and the purposes of that important corporation. It had been rapidly brought into the form which it now bore by the political exigencies of the age. Its members had no less in hand than a wide religious and political reform, whether to be carried out in New England, or in Old England, or in both, it was for circumstances, as they should unfold themselves, to determine. The leading emigrants to Massachusetts were of that brotherhood of men who, by force of social consideration as well as of the intelligence and resolute patriotism, molded the public opinion and action of England in the first half of the 17th century. While the large part stayed at home to found, as it proved, the short-lived English Republic, and to introduce elements into the English Constitution which had to wait another half-century for their secure reception, another part devoted themselves at once to the erection of free institutions in this distant wilderness. In an important sense, the associates of the Massachusetts Company were builders of the British as well as of the New England Commonwealth. Some ten or twelve of them, including Craddock the governor, served in the Long Parliament. Of the four commoners of that Parliament distinguished by Lord Clarendon as first in influence, Vane had been governor of the company, and Hampton, Pyme, and Finus, all patentees of Connecticut, if not members, were constantly consulted upon its affairs. The latter statement is also true of the Earl of Warwick, the Parliament's admiral, and of those excellent persons, Lord Say and Selay and Lord Brooke, both of whom at one time proposed to emigrate. The company's meetings placed Winthrop and his colleagues in relations with numerous persons destined to act busy parts in the stirring times that were approaching, with Barreton and Housen, afterward two of the parliamentary major generals, with Philip Nye, who helped Sir Henry Vane to cousin the Scottish Presbyterian commissioners in the phraseology of the Solemn League and Covenant, with Samuel Vassal, whose name shares with those of Hampton and Lord Say and Selle the renown of the refusal to pay ship money, 
and of courting the suit which might ruin them or emancipate England. With John Venn, who at the head of six thousand citizens beset the House of Lords during the trial of Lord Strafford, and whom, with three other Londoners, King Charles, after the Battle of Edgehill, excluded from his offer of pardon, with Owen Rowe, the firebrand of the city, with Thomas Andrews, the Lord Mayor who proclaimed the abolition of royalty. He who well weighs the facts which have been presented in connection with the principal emigration to Massachusetts, and other related facts which will offer themselves to notice as we proceed, may find himself conducted to the conclusion that when Winthrop and his associates prepared to convey across the water a charter from the king, which they hoped would in their beginnings afford them some protection, from both himself and through him from the powers of continental Europe, they had conceived a project no less important than that of laying, on this side of the Atlantic, the foundations of a nation of Puritan Englishmen, foundations to be built upon as future circumstances should decide or allow. It would not perhaps be pressing the point too far to say that in view of the thick clouds that were gathering over their home, they contemplated the possibility that the time was near at hand when all that was best of what they left behind would follow them to these shores. When a renovated England, secure in freedom and pure in religion, would rise in North America, when a transatlantic English empire would fulfill in its beneficent order the dreams of English patriots and sages of earlier times. The Arabella arrived at Salem after a passage of nine weeks, and was joined in a few days by three vessels which had sailed in her company. The assistants, Ludlow and Rossiter, with a party from the West Country, had landed at Nantasket a fortnight before, and some of the laden people, on their way to Plymouth, had reached Salem a little earlier yet. Seven vessels from Southampton made their voyages three or four weeks later. Seventeen in the whole came before winter, bringing about a thousand passengers. It is desirable to understand how this population, destined to be the germ of a state, was constituted. Of members of the Massachusetts Company, it cannot be ascertained that so many as twenty had come over. That company, as has been explained, was one formed mainly for the furtherance not of any private interests, but of a great public object. As a corporation, it had obtained the ownership of a large American territory, on which it designed to place a colony which should be a refuge for civil and religious freedom. By combining councils, it had arranged the method of ordering a settlement, and the liberality of its members had provided the means of transporting those who should compose it. This done, the greater portion were content to remain and await the course of events at home, while a few of their number embarked to attend to providing the asylum, which very soon might be needed by them all. The reception of the newcomers was discouraging. More than a quarter part of their predecessors at Salem had died during the previous winter, and many of the survivors were ill or feeble. The faithful Higginson was wasting with a hectic fever, which soon proved fatal. There was a scarcity of all sorts of provisions, and not corn enough for a fortnight's supply after the arrival of the fleet. The remainder of a 180 servants, who, in the two preceding years, had been conveyed over at heavy cost, were discharged from their indentures to escape the expense of their maintenance. Sickness soon began to spread, and before the close of autumn had proved fatal to 200 of this year's emigration. Death aims at the shining mark he is said to love. Lady Arabella Johnson, coming from a paradise of plenty and pleasure, which she enjoyed in the family of a noble earldom, into a wilderness of wants, survived her arrival only a month, and her husband, esteemed and beloved by the colonists, died of grief a few weeks after. He was a holy man and wise, and died in sweet peace. End of section 17 Section 18 of Great Epics in American History, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark DeSanzo. Great Epics in American History, Volume 2. The Planting of the First Colonies, 
1562-1733, by Francis Whiting Halsey. Section 18, Lord Baltimore in Maryland, 1633, by Contemporary Writers. On Friday, the 22nd of November, 1633, a small gale of wind coming gently from the northwest weighed from the cows in the Isle of Wight about ten in the morning, and, having stayed by the way twenty days at the Barbados, and fourteen days at St. Christopher's upon some necessary occasions, we arrived at Point Comfort in Virginia on the 24th of February following, the Lord be praised for it. At this time one Captain Claiborne was come from parts where we intended to plant, to Virginia, and from him we understood that all the natives of these parts were in preparation of defense, by reason of a rumor somebody had raised amongst them, of six ships that were come with a power of Spaniards, whose meaning was to drive all the inhabitants out of the country. On the 3rd of March we came into Chesapeake Bay, and made sail to the north of Potomac River, the bay running between two sweet lands in the channel of seven, eight, and nine fathom deep, ten leagues broad, and full of fish at the time of year. It is one of the delightfulest waters I ever saw, except Potomac, which we named St. Gregory's. And now, being in our own country, we began to give names to places, and called the southern point Cape St. Gregory, and the northerly point St. Michael's. This river, of all I know, is the greatest and sweetest, much broader than the Thames, so pleasant as I, for my part, was never satisfied in beholding it. Few marshes or swamps, but the greatest part solid good earth, with great curiosity of woods, which are not choked up with undershrubs, but set commonly from one another in such distance as a coach and four horses may easily travel through them. At first loaming of the ship upon the river, we found, as was foretold us, all the country in arms. The king of the Peshadoways had drawn together fifteen hundred bowmen, which we ourselves saw, the woods were fired in a manner of beacons the night after, and for that our vessel was the greatest that ever those Indians saw. The scouts reported we came in a canoe as big as an island, and had as many men as there be trees in the woods. We sailed up the river till we came to Heron Islands, so called from the infinite swarms of that fowl there. The first of those islands we called St. Clement's, the second St. Catherine's, and the third St. Sicily's. We took land first at St. Clement's, which is compassed about with a shallow water, and admits no access without wading. Here, by the overturning of the shallop, the maids which had been washing at the land were almost drowned. Beside the loss of much linen, and amongst the rest, I lost the best of mine, which is a very main loss in these parts. The ground is covered thick with pokickeries, which is a wild walnut, very hard and thick of shell, but the meat, though little, is passing sweet, with black walnuts and acorns bigger than ours. It abounds with vines and salets, herbs and flowers, full of cedar and sassafras. It is but four hundred acres big, and therefore too little for us to settle upon. Here we went to a place where a large tree was made into a cross, and taking it on our shoulders, we carried it to the place appointed for it, the governor and commissioners putting their hands first unto it, then the rest of the chiefest adventurers. At the place prepared we all kneeled down and said certain prayers, taking possession of the country for our Saviour and for our Sovereign Lord, the King of England. The governor being returned, we came some nine leagues lower to a river on the north side of that land, as big as the Thames, which we called St. Gregory's River. It runs up to the north about twenty miles before it comes to the fresh. This river makes two excellent bays, for three hundred sail of ships and one thousand ton to harbor in with great safety. The one bay we named St. George's, the other, and more inward, St. Marie's. The king of Yaucomico dwells on the left hand or side thereof, and we took up our seat on the right, one mile within the land. It is as brave a piece of ground to sit down on as most is in the country, and I suppose as good, if not much better, than the primest parcel of English ground. Our town we call St. Marie's, and to avoid all just occasion of offense and color of wrong, 
we bought of the king for hatchets, axes, hoes, and clothes, a quantity of some thirty miles of land, which we call Augusta Carolina. And that which made them the more willing to sell it was the wars they had with the Susquehannas, a mighty bordering nation, who came often into their country to waste and destroy, and forced many of them to leave their country and pass over Potomac to free themselves from peril before we came, God no doubt disposing all this for them who were to bring his law and light among the infidels. Yet, seeing we came so well prepared with arms, their fear was much less, and they could be content to dwell by us. Yet do they daily relinquish their houses, lands, and cornfields, and leave them to us. Is not this a piece of wonder that a nation, which a few days before was in arms with the rest against us, should yield themselves now unto us like lambs and give us their houses, land, and linings for a trifle? Digitus Dei est hic. And surely some great good is intended by God to his nation. Some few families of Indians are permitted to stay by us till next year, and then the land is free. And now to return to the place itself, chosen for our plantation. We have been upon it but one month, and therefore can make no large relation of it. Yet thus much I can say of it already. For our own safety we have built a good strong fort, or palisado, and have mounted upon it one good piece of ordnance and four murderers, and have seven pieces of ordnance more ready to mount forthwith. For our provision here is some store of peasen and beans and wheat left on the ground by the Indians who had satisfaction for it. We have planted since we came as much maize or Indian wheat as will suffice if God prosper it much more company than we have. It is up about knee-high above ground already, and we expect return of one thousand for one, as we have reason for our hope from the experience of the yield in other parts of this country, as is very credibly related to us. We have also English peasen and French beans, cotton, oranges, limones, melocotunes, apples, pears, potatoes, and sugar canes of our own planting, beside ortage coming up very finely. But such is the quantity of vines and grapes now already upon them, though young, as I dare say, if we had vessels and skill, we might make many a ton of wine, even from about our plantation. And such wine, as those of Virginia say, for yet we can say nothing, is as good as the wine of Spain. I fear they exceed, but surely very good, for the clime of this country is near the same with Seville and Cordoba, lying between thirty-eight and forty degrees of northerly latitude. Of hogs we have already got from Achimac, a plantation in Virginia, to the number of one hundred and more, and some thirty cows, and more we expect daily with goats and hens. Our horses and sheep we must have out of England, or some other place, by the way, for we can have none in Virginia. End of section 18。section 19 of Great Epochs in American History, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bill Mosley, Llano County, Texas, USA. Great Epochs in American History, Volume 2. The Planting of the First Colonies. 1562 to 1733 by Francis Whiting Halsey Section 19 Roger Williams in Rhode Island 1636 by Nathaniel Morton Footnote From Morton's New England Memorial Published at the request of the Commissioners of the Four United Colonies of New England Morton lived in the family of Governor Bradford and served as Secretary of the Court at Plymouth. This fact should be kept in mind when reading his account. End of footnote. In the year 1634, Mr. Roger Williams removed from Plymouth to Salem. He had lived about three years at Plymouth, where he was well accepted as an assistant in the ministry to Mr. Ralph Smith then pastor of the church there, but by degrees venting of divers of his own singular opinions, 
and seeking to impose them upon others, he not finding such a concurrence as he expected, he desired his dismission to the Church of Salem, which, though some were unwilling to, yet through the prudent counsel of Mr. Brewster, the ruling elder there, fearing that his continuance amongst them might cause division, and thinking that there being then many able men in the bay, they would better deal with him then than themselves could. The Church of Plymouth consented to his dismission, and such as did adhere to him were also dismissed, and removed with him, or not long after him, to Salem. But he, having in one year's time filled that place with principles of rigid separation, and tending to anabaptistry, the prudent magistrates of the Massachusetts jurisdiction sent to the Church of Salem, desiring them to forbear calling him to office, which they, not hearkening to, was a cause of much disturbance. For Mr. Williams had begun, and then being in office, he proceeded more vigorously to vent many dangerous opinions, as amongst many others these were some that it is not lawful for an unregenerate man to pray, nor to take an oath, and in special not the oath of fidelity to the civil government. Nor was it lawful for a godly man to have communion either in family prayer or in an oath with such as they judged unregenerate, and therefore he himself refused the oath of fidelity and taught others so to do. Also, that it was not lawful so much as to hear the godly ministers of England when any occasionally went thither. Therefore he admonished any church members that had done so as for heinous sin. Also he spake dangerous words against the patent, which was the foundation of the government of the Massachusetts colony, also he affirmed that the magistrates had nothing to do in matters of the first table of the commandments, but only the second, and that there should be a general and unlimited toleration of all religions, and for any man to be punished for any matters of his conscience was persecution. He persisted and grew more violent in his way, insomuch as he, staying at home in his own house, sent a letter which was delivered and read in the public church assembly, the scope of which was to give them notice that if the church of Salem would not separate not only from the churches of Old England, but the churches of New England too, he would separate from them, the more prudent and sober part of the church being amazed at his way, could not yield unto him, whereupon he never came to the church assembly more professing separation from them as anti-Christian. And not only so, but he withdrew all private religious communion from any that would hold communion with the church there, insomuch as he would not pray nor give thanks at meals with his own wife, nor any of his family, because they went to the church assemblies, which the prudent magistrates understanding, and seeing things grow more and more towards a general division and disturbance, and for all other means used in vain, they passed a sentence of banishment against him out of the Massachusetts colony, as against a disturber of the peace, both of the church and commonwealth. After which, Mr. Williams sat down in a place called Providence, out of the Massachusetts jurisdiction, and was followed by many of the members of the Church of Salem, who did zealously adhere to him, and who cried out of the persecution that was against him. Some others also resorted to him from other parts. They had not been long there together, but from rigid separation they fell into Anabaptistry, 
renouncing the baptism which they had received in their infancy, and taking up another baptism, and so began a church in that way. But Mr. Williams stopped not there long, for after some time he told the people that had followed him and joined with him in a new baptism, that he was out of the way himself, and had misled them, for he did not find that there was any upon earth that could administer baptism, and therefore their last baptism was a nullity, as well as their first, and therefore they must lay down all, and wait for the coming of new apostles, and so they dissolved themselves and turned seekers, keeping that one principle, that every one should have liberty to worship God according to the light of their own consciences, but otherwise not owning any churches or ordinances of God anywhere upon earth. End of section 19. Recording by Bill Mosley. Section 20 of Great Epochs in American History, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kyle Donnellan, New London, Connecticut. Great Epochs in American History, Volume 2. The Planting of the First Colonies, 1562 to 1733 by Francis Whiting Halsey. Section 20. The Founding of Connecticut, 1633 to 1636, by Alexander Johnston. During the ten years after 1620, the twin colonies of Plymouth and Massachusetts Bay had been fairly shaken down into their places, and had even begun to look around them for opportunities of extension. It was not possible that the fertile and inviting territory to the southwest should long escape their notice. In 1629, de Razares, an envoy from New Amsterdam, was at Plymouth. He found the Plymouth people building a shallop for the purpose of attaining a share in the wampum trade of Narragansett Bay, and he very shrewdly sold them at a bargain enough wampum to supply their needs, for fear they should discover at Narragansett the more profitable pelchy trade beyond. This artifice only put off the evil day. Within the next three years, several Plymouth men including Winslow, visited the Connecticut River, not without profit. In April 1631, a Connecticut Indian visited Governor Winthrop at Boston, asking for settlers and offering to find them corn and furnish 80 beaver skins a year. Winthrop declined even to send an exploring party. In the midsummer of 1633, Winslow went to Boston to propose a joint occupation of the new territory by Plymouth and Massachusetts Bay, but the latter still refused doubting the profit and the safety of the venture. Three months later, Plymouth undertook the work alone. A small vessel under command of William Holmes was sent around by sea to the mouth of the Connecticut River, with the frame of a trading house and workmen to put it up. When Holmes had sailed up the river as far as the place where Hartford was afterward built, he found the Dutch already in possession. For ten years they had been talking of erecting a fort on the Varsh River, but the ominous and repeated appearance of New Englanders in the territory had roused them to action at last. John Van Corlear, with a few men, had been commissioned by Governor Van Twiller, and had put up a rude earthwork with two guns within the present jurisdiction of Hartford. His summons to Holmes to stop under penalty of being fired into met with no more respect than was shown by the commandment of Rentschlerwick to his challengers, according to the voracious Knickerbocker. Holmes declared that he had been sent up the river, and was going up the river, and furthermore, he went up the river. His little vessel passed on to the present site of Windsor. Here the crew disembarked, put up and garrisoned their trading house, and then returned home. Plymouth had at least planted the flag far within the coveted and disputed territory. In December of the following year, a Dutch force of seventy men from New Amsterdam appeared before the trading house to drive out the intruders. He must be strong who drives a Yankee away from a profitable trade. And the attitude of the little garrison was so determined that the Dutchman, after a few hostile demonstrations, decided that the nut was too hard to crack and withdrew. For about twenty years thereafter, 
the Dutch held post at Hartford, isolated from Dutch support by a continually deepening mass of New Englanders, who refrained from hostilities and waited until the apple was ripe enough to drop. With respect to the claims of the Indians, the attitudes of the two parties to the struggle were directly opposite. The Dutch came on the strength of the purchase from the Pequots, the conquerors and lord paramount of the local Indians. Holmes brought to the Connecticut River in his vessel the local Sachems, who had been driven away by the Pequots and made his purchases from them. The English policy will account for the unfriendly disposition of the Pequots, and when followed up by the tremendous overthrow of the Pequots for Connecticut's permanent exemption from Indian difficulties. The Connecticut settlers followed a straight road, buying lands fairly from the Indians found in possession, ignoring those who claimed a supremacy based on violence, and, in an ease of resistance by the latter, asserting and maintaining for Connecticut an exactly similar title, the right of the stronger. Those who claim right received it. Those who preferred force were accommodated. One route to the new territory by Long Island Sound and the Connecticut River had thus been appropriated. The other, the overland route through Massachusetts, was explored during the same year, 1633, by one John Oldham, who was murdered by the Pequots two years afterward. He found his way westward to the Connecticut River, and his reports seem to have suggested a way out of a serious difficulty which had come to a head in Massachusetts Bay. The colony of Massachusetts Bay was at this time limited to a district covering not more than 20 or 30 miles from the sea, and its greatest poverty, as Cotton stated, was a poverty of men. And yet the colony was to lose part of its scanty store of men. Three of the eight Massachusetts towns, Dorchester, Watertown, and Newtown, now Cambridge, had been at odds with the other five towns on several occasions. And the assigned reasons are apparently so frivolous as to lead to the suspicion that some fundamental difference was at the bottom of them. The three towns named have been part of the greater Puritan influx of 1630. Their inhabitants were newcomers, and this slight division may have been increased by the arrival and settlement in 1633 of a number of strong men at these three towns, notably Hooker, Stone, and Haynes at Newtown. Dorchester, Watertown, and Newtown showed many symptoms of an increase of local feeling. The two former led the way in October 1633 in establishing town governments under selectmen, and all three neglected or evaded, more or less, the fundamental feature of Massachusetts policy, the limitation of office holding, and the elective franchise to church members. The three towns fell into the position of the Commonwealth's opposition, a position not particularly desirable at the time and under all the circumstances. The ecclesiastical leaders of Dorchester were Warham and Maverick, of Newtown, Hooker and Stone, of Watertown, Phillips, Haynes of Newtown, Ludlow of Dorchester, and Pycon of Roxbury were the principal lay leaders of the half-formed opposition. Some have thought that Haynes was jealous of Governor Winthrop, Hooker of Cotton, and Ludlow of everybody. But the opposition, if it can be fairly called an opposition, was not so definite as to be traceable to any such personal source. The strength which marked the divergence was due neither to ambition nor to jealousy, but to the strength of mind and character which marked the leaders of the minority. Thomas Hooker and Samuel Stone were of Emmanuel College, Cambridge. Hooker began to preach at Chelmsford in 1626 and was silenced for nonconformity in 1629. He then taught school his assistant being John Elliot, afterward the apostle to the Indians. But the chase after him became warmer, and in 1630 he retired to Holland and resumed his preaching. In 1632, he and Stone came to New England as the pastor and teacher of the church at Newtown, and the two took part in the migration to Hartford. Here Hooker became the undisputed ecclesiastical leader of Connecticut until his death in 1647. John Warham and John Maverick, both of Exeter in England, came to New England in 1630 as pastor and teacher of Dorchester. Maverick died while preparing to follow his church, but Warham settled with his parishioners at Windsor and died there in 1670. George Phillips, also a Cambridge man, came to New England in 1630 as pastor of the church at Watertown. He took no part in the migration, but lived and died in Watertown. 
fate seems to have determined that Wendell Phillips should belong to Massachusetts. Roger Ludlow was Endicott's brother-in-law. He came to New England in 1630 and settled at Dorchester. He was deputy governor in 1634 and seems to have been slated, to use the modern term, for the governorship in the following year. But this private agreement among the deputies was broken, for some unknown reason, by the voters who chose Haynes, perhaps as a less objectionable representative of the opposition. Ludlow complained so openly and angrily of the failure to carry out the agreement that he was dropped from the magistracy at the next re election. He went at once to Connecticut and was deputy governor there in alternate years until 1654. Incense at the interference of New Haven to prevent his county, Fairfield, from waging an independent warfare against the Dutch, he went to Virginia in 1654, taking the records of the county with him. It is not known when or where he died. Pycon, the third lay leader of the opposition, took part in the migration, but remained within the jurisdiction of Massachusetts, founding the town of Springfield. At the May session of the Massachusetts General Court in 1634, an application for liberty to remove was received from Newtown. It was granted. At the September session, the request was changed into one for removal to Connecticut. This was a very different matter, and, after long debate, was defeated by the vote of the assistants, though the deputies passed it. Various reasons were assigned for the request to remove to Connecticut. Lack of room in their present locations, the desire to save Connecticut from the Dutch, and the strong bent of their spirits to remove thither. But the last looks like the strongest reason. In like matter, while the arguments to the contrary were those would naturally suggest themselves, the weakening of Massachusetts and the peril of the emigrants, the concluding argument that the removing of a candlestick would be a great judgment seems to show the feeling of all parties that the secession was the result of discord between two parties. Haynes was made governor at the next general court. Successful inducements were offered to some of the Newtown people to remove to Boston, and some few concessions were made. But the migration which had denied to the towns had probably been begun by individuals. There is a tradition that some of the Watertown people passed this winter of 1634-35 to 35 at the place where Weathersfield now stands. In May 1635, the Massachusetts General Court voted that liberty be granted to the people of Watertown and Roxbury to remove themselves to any place within the jurisdiction of Massachusetts. In March 1636, the secession having already been accomplished, the General Court issued a Commission to several persons to govern the people at Connecticut. Its preamble reads, Whereas upon some reasons and grounds, there are to remove from this our commonwealth and body of the Massachusetts in America, differs of our loving friends and neighbors, free men and members of Newtown, Dorchester, Watertown, and other places who are resolved to transport themselves and their estates onto the river of Connecticut, there to reside and inhabit, and to that end differs are there already, and differs other shortly to go. The tacit permission was the only authorization given by Massachusetts, but it should be noted that the unwilling permission was made more gracious by a kindly loan of cannon and ammunition for the protection of the new settlements. If it be true that some of the Watertown people had wintered at Weathersfield in 1634-35, to this was the first civil settlement in Connecticut. And it is certain that, all through the following spring, summer, and autumn, detached parties of Watertown people were settling at Weathersfield. During the summer of 1635, a Dorchester party appeared near the Plymouth factory and laid the foundations of the town of Windsor. In October of the same year, a party of 60 persons, including women and children, largely from Newtown, made the overland march and settled where Hartford now stands. Their journey was begun so late that the winter overtook them before they reached the river and as they had brought their cattle with them, they found great difficulty in getting everything across the river by means of rafts. It may have been that the echoes of all these preparations had reached England, and stirred the tardy patentees to action. During the autumn of 1635, John Winthrop, Jr., agent of the Say and Seal Associates, reached Boston, with authority to build a large fort at the mouth of the Connecticut River. He was to be governor of the River Connecticut for one year, and he at once issued a proclamation to the Massachusetts emigrants, asking, Under what right and preference 
they had lately taken up their plantation. It is said that they agreed to give up any lands demanded by him, or to return on having their expenses repaid. A more dangerous influence, however, soon claimed Winthrop's attention. Before the winter set in, he had sent a party to seize a designated spot for a fort at the mouth of the Connecticut River. His promptness was needed. Just as his men had thrown up a work sufficient for defense and had mounted a few guns, a Dutch ship from New Amsterdam appeared, bringing a force intended to appropriate the same place. Again, the Dutch found themselves a trifle late, and their post at Hartford was thus finally cut off from effective support. This was a horrible winter to the advance guard of English settlers on the upper Connecticut. The navigation of the river was completely blocked by ice before the middle of November, and the vessels which were to have brought their winter supplies by way of Long Island Sound and the river were forced to return to Boston, leaving their wretched settlers unprovided for. For a little while, some scanty supplies of corn were obtained from the neighboring Indians, but this resource soon failed. About seventy persons straggled down the river to the fort at its mouth. There they found and dug out of the ice a sixty-ton vessel and made their way back to Boston. Others turned back on the way they had come and struggled through the snow and ice to the bay. But a few held their grip on the new territory, subsisting first on a little corn brought from more distant Indians, then by hunting, and finally on ground nuts and acorns dug from under the snow. They fought through the winter and held their ground, but it was a narrow escape. Spring found them almost exhausted, their unsheltered cattle dead, and just time enough to bring necessary supplies from home. The Dorchester people alone lost cattle to the value of 2,000 pounds. The Newtown congregation, in October 1635, found customers for their old homes in a new party from England, and in the following June Hooker and Stone led their people overland to Connecticut. They numbered 100, with 160 head of cattle. Women and children were of the party. Mrs. Hooker, who was ill, was carried on a litter, and the journey of about 100 miles occupied two weeks. Its termination was well calculated to dissipate the evil auguries of the previous winter. The Connecticut Valley in early June, its green meadows flanked by wooded hills, lay before them. Its oaks, whose patriarch was to shelter their charter. Its great elms and tulip trees were broken by the silver ribbon of the river. Here and there were the wigwams of the Indians, or the cabins of the survivors of the winter, and over and through all, the light of the day in June welcomed the newcomers. The thought of abandoning Connecticut disappeared forever. End of section 20. Recording by Kyle Donnellan, New London, Connecticut. Section 21 of Great Epochs in American History, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Great Epics in American History, Volume 2. The Planting of the First Colonies, 1562-1733. to By Francis Whiting Halsey. Section 21. Witchcraft in New England, 1647-1696. to By John G. Palfrey. The people of Massachusetts in the 17th century, like all other Christian people at that time and later, at least with extremely rare individual exceptions, believed in the reality of a hideous crime called witchcraft. They thought they had scripture for that belief, and they knew they had law for it, explicit and abundant. And with them law and scripture were absolute authorities for the regulation of opinion and of conduct. In a few instances, witches were believed to have appeared in the earlier years of New England, but the cases had been sporadic. The first instance of an execution for witchcraft is said to have occurred in Connecticut soon after the settlement, 1647, May 30th. But the circumstances are not known, and the fact has been doubted. A year later, one Margaret Jones of Charlestown in Massachusetts, and it has been said, Two other women in Dorchester and Cambridge were convicted and executed for the goblin crime. These cases appear to have excited no more attention than would have been given to the commission of any other felony, and no judicial record of them survives. With three or four exceptions, for the evidence respecting the asserted sufferers at Dorchester and Cambridge is imperfect, no person appears to have been punished for witchcraft in Massachusetts, 
nor convicted of it for more than sixty years after the settlement though there had been three or four trials of other persons suspected of the crime at the time when the question respecting the colonial charter was rapidly approaching an issue and the public mind was in feverish agitation the minister sent out a paper of proposals for collecting facts concerning witchcraft sixteen eighty one this brought out a work from president mather entitled illustrious providences in which that influential person related numerous stories of the performances of persons leagued with the devil sixteen eighty four the imagination of his restless young son was stimulated and circumstances fed the flame in the last year of the government of andros sixteen eighty eight a daughter thirteen years old of john goodwin a mason living in the south end of boston had a quarrel with an irish washerwoman about some missing clothes the woman's mother took it up and scolded provokingly thereupon the wicked child profiting as it seems by what she had been hearing and reading on the mysterious subject cried out upon her as the phrase was as a witch and proceeded to act the part understood to be fit for a bewitched person in which behavior she was presently joined by three others of the circle one of them only four or five years old now they would lose their hearing now their sight now their speech and sometimes all three faculties at once they mewed like kittens they barked like dogs cotton mather prayed with one of them but she lost her hearing he says when he began and recovered it as soon as he finished four boston ministers and one of charlestown held a meeting and passed a day in fasting and prayer by which exorcism the youngest imp was delivered the poor woman crazed with all this pother if in her right mind before and defending herself unskilfully in her foreign gibberish and with the volubility of her race was interpreted as making some confession a gossiping witness testified that six years before she had heard another woman say that she had seen the accused come down a chimney she was required to repeat the lord's prayer in english an approved test but being a catholic she had never learnt it in that language she could recite it after a fashion in latin but she was no scholar and made some mistakes the helpless wretch was convicted and sent to the gallows cotton mather took the oldest afflicted girl to his house where she dexterously played upon his self-conceit to stimulate his credulity she satisfied him that satan regarded him as his most terrible enemy and avoided him with especial awe when he prayed or read in the bible she was seized with convulsion fits when he called to family devotion she would whistle and sing and scream and pretend to try to strike and kick him but her blows would be stopped before reaching his body indicating that he was unassailable by the evil one mather published an account of these transactions with a collection of other appropriate matter the treatise circulated not only in massachusetts but widely also in england where it obtained the warm commendations of richard baxter and it may be supposed to have had an important effect in producing the more disastrous delusion which followed three years after the goodwin children soon got well in other words they were tired of their atrocious foolery and the death of their victim gave them a pretense for a return to decent behavior martha corey and rebecca nurse were cried out against both were church members of excellent character the latter seventy years of age they were examined by the same magistrates and sent to prison and with them a child of sarah good only four or five years old also charged with diabolical practices mr paris preached upon the text have not i chosen you twelve and one of you is a devil sarah cloyce understanding the allusion to be to nurse who was her sister went out of church and was accordingly cried out upon examined and committed elizabeth proctor was another person charged the deputy governor and five magistrates came to salem for the examination of the two prisoners last named proctor appealed to one of the children who was accusing her dear child she said it is not so there is another judgment dear child and presently they denounced as a witch her husband who stood by her side 
A week afterward, warrants were issued for the apprehension of four other suspected persons, and a few days later for three others, one of whom, Philip English, was the principal merchant of Salem. On the same day, on the information of one of the possessed girls, an order was sent to Maine for the arrest of George Burroughs, formerly a candidate for the ministry at Salem Village, and now minister of Wells. The witness said that Burroughs, besides being a wizard, had killed his first two wives, and other persons whose ghosts had appeared to her and denounced him. Affairs were in this condition when the king's governor arrived. About a hundred alleged witches were now in jail, awaiting trial. Their case was one of the first matters to which his attention was called. Without authority for so doing, for by the charter which he represented, the establishment of judicial courts was a function of the general court, he proceeded to institute a special commission of Oyer and Terminer, consisting of seven magistrates, first of whom was the hard, obstinate, narrow-minded Stoughton. The commissioners applied themselves to their office without delay. Their first act was to try Bridget Bishop, against whom an accusation twenty years old and retracted by its author on his deathbed had been revived. The court sentenced her to die by hanging, and she was accordingly hanged at the end of eight days. Cotton Mather, in his account of the proceedings, relates that as she passed along the street under guard, Bishop, quote, had given a look toward the great and spacious meeting-house of Salem, and immediately a demon invisibly entering the house tore down a part of it, unquote. It may be guessed that a plank or a partition had given way under the pressure of the crowd of lookers-on, collected for so extraordinary a spectacle. At the end of another four weeks, the court sat again and sentenced five women, two of Salem, and one each of Amesbury, Ipswich, and Topsfield, all of whom were executed, protesting their innocence. In respect to one of them, Rebecca Nurse, a matron eminent for piety and goodness, a verdict of acquittal was first rendered. But Stoughton sent the jury out again, reminding them that in her examination, in reference to certain witnesses against her, who had confessed their own guilt, she had used the expression, They came among us. Nurse was deaf and did not catch what had been going on. When it was afterward repeated to her, she said that by the coming among us she meant that they had been in prison together. But the jury adopted the court's interpretation of the word as signifying an acknowledgment that they had met at a witch orgy. The governor was disposed to grant her a pardon, but Paris, who had an ancient grudge against her, interfered and prevailed. On the last communion day before her execution, she was taken into church and formally excommunicated by noise, her minister. In the course of the next month, in which the governor left Boston for a short tour of inspection in the eastern country, fifteen persons, six women in one day, and on another eight women and one man were tried, convicted, and sentenced. Eight of them were hanged. The brave Giles Corey, eighty years of age, being arraigned, refused to plead. He said that the whole thing was an imposture, and that it was of no use to put himself on his trial, for every trial had ended in a conviction, which was the fact. It was shocking to relate that suffering the penalty of the English common law for a contumacious refusal to answer, the paying forte et due, he was pressed to death with heavy weights laid on his body. By not pleading, he intended to protect the inheritance of his children, which, as he had been informed, would by a conviction of felony have been forfeit to the crown. There had been twenty human victims, Corey included, besides two dogs, their accomplices in the mysterious crime. Fifty persons had obtained a pardon by confessing. A hundred and fifty were in prison, awaiting trial. The charges had been made against two hundred more. The accusers were now flying at high quarries. Hezekiah Usher, known to the reader as an ancient magistrate of fair consideration, was complained of, and Mrs. Thatcher, mother-in-law of Corwin, the justice who had taken the earliest examinations. Zeal in pushing forward the prosecution began to seem dangerous, for what was to prevent an accused person from securing himself by confession and then revenging himself on the accuser by arraigning him as a former ally? The drunken fever fit was now over, and with returning sobriety came profound contrition and disgust. 
a few still held out against the return of reason. There are some men who never own that they have been in the wrong, and a few men who are forever incapable of seeing it. Stoughton, with his bulldog stubbornness, that might in other times have made him a St. Dominic, continued to insist that the business had been all right, and that the only mistake was in putting a stop to it. Cotton Mather was always infallible in his own eyes. In the year after the executions, he had the satisfaction of studying another remarkable case of possession in Boston. But when it and the treatise which he wrote upon it failed to excite much attention, and it was plain that the tide had set the other way, he soon got his consent to let it run at his own pleasure, and turned his excursive activity to other objects. Members of some of the juries, in a written public declaration, acknowledged the fault of their wrongful verdicts, entreated forgiveness, and protested that, quote, according to their present minds, they would none of them do such things again, on such grounds, for the whole world, praying that this act of theirs might be accepted in way of satisfaction for their offense, unquote. A day of general fasting was proclaimed by authority to be observed throughout the jurisdiction, in which the people were invited to pray that, quote, whatever mistakes on either hand had been fallen into, either by the body of this people or by any orders of men, referring to the late tragedy raised among us by Satan and his instruments, through the awful judgment of God, he would humble them, therefore, and pardon all the heirs of his servants and people, unquote. End of section 21《Section 22 of Great Epics in American History, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The English Conquest of New York, 1664, by John R. Broadhead. England now determined boldly to rob Holland of her American province. King Charles II accordingly sealed a patent granting to the Duke of York and Albany a large territory in America, comprehending Long Island and the islands in its neighborhood, his title to which Lord Stirling had released, and all the lands and rivers from the west side of the Connecticut River to the east side of Delaware Bay. This sweeping grant included the whole of New Netherlands and a part of the territory of Connecticut, which two years before Charles had confirmed to Winthrop and his associates. The Duke of York lost no time in giving effect to his patent. As Lord High Admiral, he directed the fleet. Four ships, the Guinea of 36 guns, the Elias of 30, the Martin of 16, and the William and Nicholas of 10, were detached for service against New Netherlands, and about 450 regular soldiers with their officers were embarked. The command of the expedition was entrusted to Colonel Richard Nichols, a faithful royalist, who had served under Turenne with James, and had been made one of the gentlemen of his bedchamber. Nichols was also appointed to be the Duke's deputy governor, after the Dutch possessions should have been reduced. With Nichols were associated Sir Robert Carr, Colonel George Cartwright, and Samuel Maverick, as royal commissioners to visit the several colonies in New England. These commissioners were furnished with detailed instructions, and the New England governments were required by royal letters to join and assist them vigorously in reducing the judge to subjection. A month after the departure of the squadron, the Duke of York conveyed to Lord Berkeley and Sir George Carteret all the territory between the Hudson and Delaware rivers, from Cape May, north, to 41 degrees 40 minutes latitude, and thence to the Hudson, in 41 degree latitude, hereafter to be called by the name or names of Nova Caesarea or New Jersey. Intelligence from Boston that an English expedition against New Netherlands had sailed from Portsmouth was soon communicated to Stuyvesant by Captain Thomas Willett, and the burgomasters and shippens of New Amsterdam were summoned to assist the council with their advice. The capital was ordered to be put in a state of defense, guards to be maintained, and shippers to be warned. As there was very little powder at Fort Amsterdam, a supply was demanded from New Amstel, and a loan of five or six thousand guilders was asked from Ransel Erswick. The ships about to sail for Curaçao were stopped. 
agents were sent to purchase provisions at New Haven, and as the enemy was expected to approach through Long Island Sound, spies were sent to obtain intelligence at Westchester and Milford. But at the moment when no precaution should have been relaxed, a dispatch from the West India directors, who appear to have been misled by advices from London, announced that no danger need be apprehended from the English expedition, as it was sent out by the king only to settle the affairs of his colonies and establish episcopacy, which would rather benefit the company's interests in New Netherland. Willett now retracting his previous statements, a perilous confidence returned. The Carrasso ships were allowed to sail, and Stuyvesant, yielded to the solicitation of his council, went up the river to look after affairs at Fort Orange. The English squadron had been ordered to assemble at Gardiner's Island, but parting company in a fog, the Guinea, with Nichols and Cartwright on board, made Cape Cod and went on to Boston, while the other ships put in at Piscataway. The commissioners immediately demanded the assistance of Massachusetts but the people of the bay, who feared perhaps that the king's success in reducing the Dutch would enable him the better to put down his enemies in New England, were full of excuses. Connecticut, however, showed sufficient alacrity, and Winthrop was desired to meet the squadron at the west end of Long Island, whither it would sail with the first fair wind. When the truths of Willett's intelligence became confirmed, the council set an express to recall Stuyvesant from Fort Orange, Hurrying back to the capital, the anxious director endeavored to redeem the time which had been lost. The municipal authorities ordered one-third of the inhabitants, without exception, to labor every third day at the fortifications, organized a permanent guard, forbade the brewers to malt any grain, and called on the provincial government for artillery and ammunition. Six pieces, besides the fourteen previously allotted, and a thousand pounds of powder were accordingly granted to the city. The colonists around Fort Orange, pleading their own danger from the savages, could afford no help, but the soldiers of Esopus were ordered to come down after leaving a small garrison at Rondwit. In the meantime, the English squadron had just anchored below the Narrows, in Nyack Bay, between New Utrecht and Coney Island. The mouth of the river was shut up. Communication between Long Island and Manhattan, Bergen and Actor Cull, interrupted several yachts on their way to the South River captured, and the blockhouse on the opposite shore of Staten Island seized. Stuyvesant now dispatched Councillor de Decker, Burgomaster Vandergrist, and the two domines Megapolensis with a letter to the English commanders inquiring why they had come, and why they continued at Nyack without giving notice. The next morning, which was Saturday, Nichols sent Colonel Cartwright, Captain Needham, Captain Groves, and Mr. Thomas Delaval up to Fort Amsterdam with a summons for the surrender of the town situate on the island and commonly known by the name of Manhattos, with all the forts therein to belonging. This summons was accompanied by a proclamation declaring that all who would submit to His Majesty's government should be protected in His Majesty's laws and justice and peaceably enjoy their property. Stuyvesant immediately called together the council and the burgomasters, but would not allow the terms offered by Nichols to be communicated to the people, lest they might insist on capitulating. In a short time, several of the burghers and city officers assembled at the Stathuis. It was determined to prevent the enemy from surprising the town, but as opinion was generally against the protracted resistance, a copy of the English communication was asked from the director. On the following Monday, the burgomasters explained to a meeting of the citizens the terms offered by Nichols. But this would not suffice. A copy of the paper itself must be exhibited. Stuyvesant then went in person to the meeting. Such a course, said he, would be disapproved of in the fatherland. It would discourage the people. All his efforts, however, were in vain, and the director, protesting that he should not be held answerable for the calamitous consequences was obliged to yield to the popular will. Nichols now addressed a letter to Winthrop, who, with other commissioners from New England, had joined the squadron, authorizing him to assure Stuyvesant that if Manhattan should be delivered up to the king, any people from the Netherlands may freely come and plant there or thereabouts, and such vessels of their own country may freely come thither, and any of them may as freely return home in vessels of their own country. 
Visiting the city under a flag of truce, Winthrop delivered this to Stuyvesant outside the fort and urged him to surrender. The director declined, and returning to the fort, he opened Nichols's letter before the council and the burgomasters, who desired that it should be communicated as all which regarded the public welfare ought to be made public. Against this, Stuyvesant earnestly remonstrated, and finding that the burgomasters continued firm, in a fit of passion he tore the letter in pieces. The citizens, suddenly ceasing their work at the Palisades, hurried to the statues and sent three of their number to the fort to demand the letter. In vain the director hastened to pacify the burghers and urge them to go on with the fortifications. Complaints and curses were uttered on all sides against the company's misgovernment. Resistance was declared to be idle. The letter, the letter, was the general cry. To avoid a mutiny, Stuyvesant yielded, and a copy, made out from the collected fragments, was handed to the burgomasters. In answer, however, to Nichols's summons, he submitted a long justification of the Dutch title. Yet while protesting against any breach of the peace between the king and the states general, for the hindrance and prevention of all differences and the spilling of innocent blood, not only in these parts but also in Europe, he offered to treat. Long Island is gone and lost. The capital cannot hold out long, was the last dispatch to the Lord Majors of New Netherlands, which its director sent off that night in silence through Hellgate. Observing Stuyvesant's reluctance to surrender, Nichols directed Captain Hyde, who commanded the squadron, to reduce the fort. Two of the ships accordingly landed their troops just below Brooklyn, where volunteers from New England and the Long Island villages had already encamped. The other two, coming up with full sail, passed in front of Fort Amsterdam and anchored between it and Nutton Island. Standing on one of the angles of the fortress, an artilleryman with a lighted match at his side, the director watched their approach. At this moment, the two domines Meglopensis, imploring him not to begin hostilities, led Stuyvesant from the rampart, who then, with a hundred of the garrison, went into the city to resist the landing of the English. Hoping on against hope, the director now sent Councillor de Decker, Secretary Van Rupen, Burgomaster Steenwick, and Shepin Kosu with a letter to Nichols stating that, as he felt bound to stand the storm, he desired, if possible, to arrange on accommodation. But the English commander merely declared, Tomorrow I will speak with you at Manhattan. Friends, was the answer, will be welcome if they come in a friendly manner. I shall come with ships and soldiers, replied Nichols. Raise the white flag of peace at the fort, and then something may be considered. When this imperious message became known, men, women, and children flocked to the director, beseeching him to submit. His only answer was, I would rather be carried out dead. The next day, the city authorities, the clergymen, the officers of the burger guard, assembling at the statues, at the suggestion of Domine Meglopensis, adopted a remonstrance to the director, exhibiting the hopeless situation of New Amsterdam on all sides encompassed and hemmed in by enemies, and protesting against any further opposition to the will of God. Besides the shout, burgomasters, and ship hens, the remonstrance was signed by Wilmerdonk and 85 of the principal inhabitants, among whom was Stuyvesant's own son, Balthazar. At last, the director was obliged to yield. Although there were now 1,500 souls in New Amsterdam, there were not more than 250 men able to bear arms, besides the 150 regular soldiers. The people had at length refused to be called out, and the regular troops were already heard talking of where booty is to be found and where the young women live who wear gold chains. The city, entirely open along both rivers, was shut on the northern side by a breastwork and palisades, which, though sufficient to keep out the savages, afforded no defense against a military siege. There were scarcely 600 pounds of serviceable powder in store. A council of war had reported Fort Amsterdam untenable, for though it mounted twenty-four guns, its single wall of earth, not more than ten feet high and four feet thick, was almost untouched by the private dwellings clustered around, and was commanded within a pistol shot by hills on the north, over which ran the Heerweg or Broadway. Upon the faith of Nichols' promise to deliver back the city and fort, 
in case the difference of the limits of this province be agreed upon betwixt his majesty of England and the high and mighty states general. Stuviescent now commissioned Councillor John de Decker, Captain Nicholas Varlet, Dr. Samuel Meglopensis, Burgomaster Cornelius Steenwick, Old Burgomaster Olaf Stevenson Van Cortland, and Old Shepin Jacques Cossu to agree upon articles with the English commander or his representatives. Nichols, on his part, appointed Sir Robert Carr and Colonel George Cartwright, John Winthrop and Samuel Willies of Connecticut, and Thomas Clark and John Pynchon of Massachusetts. The reason why those of Boston and Connecticut were joined, afterward explained a royal commander, was because those two colonies should hold themselves the more engaged with us if the Dutch had been overconfident of their strength. At eight o'clock the next morning, which was Saturday, the commissioners on both sides met at Stuviescent's Bowery and arranged the terms of capitulation. The only difference which arose was respecting the Dutch soldiers, whom the English refused to convey back to Holland. The articles of capitulation promised the Dutch security in their property, customs of inheritance, liberty of conscience, and church discipline. The municipal officers of Manhattan were to continue for the present unchanged, and the town was to be allowed to choose deputies, with free voices in all public affairs. Owners of property in Fort Orange might, if they pleased, slight the fortifications there, and enjoy their houses as people do where there is no fort. For six months there was to be free intercourse with Holland. Public records were to be respected. The articles, consented to by Nichols, were to be ratified by Stuviescent the next Monday morning at eight o'clock, and within two hours afterward the fort and town called New Amsterdam, upon the Isle of Manhattos, were to be delivered up, and the military officers and soldiers were to march out with their arms, drums beating and colors flying and lighted matches. On the following Monday morning at eight o'clock, Stuviescent, at the head of the garrison, marched out of Fort Amsterdam with all the honors of war, and led his soldiers down the beaver lane to the waterside, whence they were embarked for Holland. An English corporal's guard at the same time took possession of the fort, and Nichols and Carr, with their two companies, about a 170 strong, entered the city, while Cartwright took possession of the gates and the statues. The New England and Long Island volunteers, however, were prudently kept at Brooklyn Factory, as the citizens dreaded most being plundered by them. The English flag was hoisted on Fort Amsterdam, the name of which was immediately changed to Fort James. Nichols was now proclaimed by the burgomaster's deputy governor for the Duke of York, in compliment to whom he directed that the city of New Amsterdam should thenceforth be known as New York. To Nichols' European eye, the Dutch metropolis, with its earthen fort, enclosing a windmill and a high flagstaff, a prison and a governor's house, and a double-roofed church, above which loomed a square tower, its gallows and whipping post at the river's side, and its rows of houses which hugged the citadel, presented but a mean appearance. Yet before long he described it to the duke as the best of all his majesty's towns in America, and assured his royal highness that, with proper management, within five years the staple of America will be drawn hither, of which the brethren of Boston are very sensible. The reduction of New Netherlands was now accomplished. All that could be further done was to change its name, and to glorify one of the most bigoted princes in English history, the royal province was ordered to be called New York. Ignorant of James's grant of New Jersey to Berkeley and Carteret, Nichols gave to the region west of the Hudson the name Albania, and to Long Island that of Yorkshire, so as to comprehend all the titles of the Duke of York. The flag of England was at length triumphantly displayed, where for half a century that of Holland had rightfully waved, and from Virginia to Canada the King of Great Britain was acknowledged as sovereign. Viewed in all its aspects, the event which gave to the whole of that country a unity and allegiance, and to which a misgoverned people complacently submitted, was as inevitable as it was momentous. But whatever may have been its ultimate consequences, this treacherous and violent seizure of the territory and possessions of an unsuspecting ally was no less a breach of private justice than of public faith. It may, indeed, be infirmed that, 
among all the acts of selfish perfidy which royal ingratitude conceived and executed, there have been few more characteristic and none more base. End of section 22「Section 23 of Great Epics in American History, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Great Epics in American History, Volume 2. The Planting of the First Colonies, 1562 to 1733, by Francis Whiting Halsey. Section 23. Bacon's Rebellion in Virginia, 1676, by an anonymous writer. There is no nation this day under the copes of heaven can so experimentally speak the sad effects of men of great parts being reduced to necessity as England. But not to rake up the notorious misdemeanors of the dead, I shall endeavor to prevent the sad effects of so deplorable a cause by giving you an account of the remarkable life and death of this gentleman of whom I am about to discourse. And because, when a man has once engaged himself in an ill action, all men are ready to heap an innumerable aspersions upon him, of which he is no ways guilty, I shall be so just in the history of his life as not to rob him of those commendations which his birth and acquisitions claim as due, and so kind both to loyalty and the wholesome constituted laws of our kingdom as not to smother anything which would render him to blame. This gentleman, who has of late beckoned the attention of all men of understanding who are anyways desirous of novelty, or care what becomes of any part of the world besides that themselves live in, had the honor to be descended of an ancient and honorable family, his name Nathaniel Bacon, to whom, to the long-known title of gentleman, by his long study at the inns of court, he has since added that of Esquire. He was the son of Mr. Thomas Bacon, of an ancient seat known by the denomination of Freestone Hall, in the county of Suffolk, a gentleman of known loyalty and ability. His father, as he was able, so he was willing, to allow this his son a very gentle competency to subsist upon, but he, as it proved, having a soul too large for that allowance, could not contain himself within bounds which his careful father perceiving, and also that he had a mind to travel, having seen diverse parts of the world before, consented to his inclination of going to Virginia, and accommodated him with a stock for that purpose, to the value of 1,801 sterling, as I am credibly informed by a merchant of very good wealth, who is now in this city, and had the fortune to carry him thither." He began his voyage thitherwards about three years since, and lived for about a year's space in that continent in very good repute, his extraordinary parts, like a letter of recommendation, rendering him acceptable in all men's company, whilst his considerable concerns in that place were able to bear him out in the best of society. These accomplishments of mind and fortune rendered him so remarkable that the worthy governor of that continent thought it requisite to take him into his privy council. That plantation which he chose to settle in is generally known by the name of Curlis, situated in the upper part of the James River, and the time of his revolt was not till the beginning of March, 1675-6 at which time the Susquehannan Indians, a known enemy to that country, having made an insurrection, and killed divers of the English, among whom it was his misfortune to have a servant slain, in revenge of whose death and other damages he received from those turbulent Susquehannians, without the governor's consent he furiously took up arms against them, and was so fortunate as to put them to flight, but not content therewith. The aforesaid governor, hearing of his eager pursuit after the vanquished Indians, sent out a select company of soldiers to command him to desist. But he, instead of listening thereunto, persisted in his revenge, and sent to the governor to entreat his commission, that he might more cheerfully prosecute his design. Which, 
being denied him by the messenger he sent for that purpose he notwithstanding continued to make head with his own servants and other english then resident in curlies against them in this interim the people of henrico had returned him burgess of their county and he in order thereunto took his own sloop and came down towards jamestown conducted by thirty odd soldiers with a part of which he came ashore to mr lawrence's house to understand whether he might come in with safety or not but being discovered by one parson clough and also it being perceived that he had lined the bushes of the said town with soldiers the governor thereupon ordered an alarm to be beaten through the whole town which took so hot that bacon thinking himself not secure whilst he remained there within reach of their fort immediately commanded his men aboard and towed his sloop up the river which the governor perceiving ordered the ships which lay at sandy point to pursue and take him and they by the industry of their commanders succeeded so well in the attempt that they presently stopped his passage so that mr bacon finding himself pursued both before and behind after some capitulations quietly surrendered himself prisoner to the governor's commissioners to the great satisfaction of all his friends which action of his was so obliging to the governor that he granted him his liberty immediately upon parole without confining him either to prison or chamber and the next day after some private discourse passed betwixt the governor the privy council and himself he was amply restored to all his former honors and dignities and a commission partly promised him to be general against the indian army but upon further inquiry into his affairs it was not thought fit to be granted him whereat his ambitious mind seemed mightily to be displeased insomuch that he gave out that it was his intention to sell his whole concerns in virginia and to go with his whole family to live either in maryland or the south because he would avoid as he said the scandal of being accounted as a factious person there but this resolution it seems was but a pretense for afterwards he headed the same renegado english that he formerly found ready to undertake and go sharers with him in any of his rebellions and adding to them the assistance of his own slaves and servants headed them so far till they touched at the okanegis town where he was treated very civilly and by the inhabitants informed where some of the susquehannos were imported whom presently he assails and after he had vanquished them slew about seventy of them in their fort but as he returned back to the okanegis he found they had fortified themselves with divers more indians than they had at his first arrival wherefore he desired hostages of them for their good behavior whilst he and his followers lay within command of their fort but those treacherous indians grown confident by reason of their late recruit returned him this answer that their guns were the only hostages he was like to have of them and if he would have them he must fetch them which was no sooner spoke but the indian sallied out of the fort and shot one of his sentinels whereupon he charged them so fiercely that the fight continued not only all that day but the next also till the approach of the evening at which time finding his men grown faint for want of provision he laid hold of the opportunity being befriended by a gloomy night and so made an honourable retreat homewards howbeit we may judge what respect he had gained in jamestown by this subsequent transaction when he was first brought hither it was frequently reported among the commonalty that he was kept close prisoner which report caused the people of that town those of charles city henrico and new kent countries being in all about the number of eight hundred or a thousand to rise and march thitherwards in order to his rescue whereupon the governor was forced to desire mr bacon to go himself in person and by his open appearance quiet the people this being passed mr bacon about the twenty fifth of june last dissatisfied that he could not have a commission granted him to go against the indians in the night-time departed the town unknown to anybody and about a week after got together between four and five hundred men of new kent county with whom he marched to jamestown and drew up in order before the house of state and there peremptorily demanded of the governor council and burgesses there then collected 
a commission to go against the indians which if they should refuse to grant him he told them that neither he nor ne'er a man in his company would depart from their doors till he had obtained his request whereupon to prevent farther danger in so great an exigence the council and burgesses by much entreaty obtained him a commission signed by the governor an act for one thousand men to be listed under his command to go against the indians to whom the same pay was granted as was allowed to them who went against the fort but bacon was not satisfied with this but afterwards earnestly importuned and at length obtained of the house to pass an act of indemnity to all persons who had sided with him and also letters of recommendations from the governor to his majesty in his behalf and moreover caused colonel claiborne and his son captain claiborne lieutenant colonel west and lieutenant colonel hill and many others to be degraded for ever bearing any office whether it were military or civil having obtained these large civilities of the governor and company one would have thought that if the principles of honesty would not have obliged him to peace and loyalty those of gratitude should but alas when men have been once flushed or entered with vice how hard is it for them to leave it especially it tends towards ambition or greatness which is the general lust of a large soul and the common error of vast parts which fix their eyes so upon the lure of greatness that they have no time left them to consider by what indirect and unlawful means they must if ever attain it this certainly was mr bacon's crime who after he had once launched into rebellion nay and upon submission had been pardoned for it and also restored as if he had committed no such heinous offence to his former honour and dignities which were considerable enough to content any reasonable mind yet for all this he could not forbear wading into his former misdemeanours and continued his opposition against that prudent and established government ordered by his majesty of great britain to be duly observed in that continent in fine he continued i cannot say properly in the fields but in the woods with a considerable army all last summer and maintained several brushes with the governor's party sometimes routing them and burning all before him to the great damage of many of his majesty's loyal subjects there resident sometimes he and his rebels were beaten by the governor and company and forced to run for shelter amongst the woods and swamps in which lamentable condition that unhappy continent has remained for the space of almost a twelvemonth every one therein that were able being forced to take up arms for security of their own lives and no one reckoning their goods wives or children to be their own since they were so dangerously exposed to the doubtful accidents of an uncertain war but the indulgent heavens who are alone able to compute what measure of punishments are adequate or fit for the sins of transgressions of a nation has in its great mercy thought fit to put a stop at least if not a total period and conclusion to these virginian troubles by the death of this nat bacon the great molester of the quiet of that miserable nation so that now we who are here in england and have any relations or correspondence with any of the inhabitants of that continent may by the arrival of the next ships from that coast expect to hear that they are freed from all their dangers quitted of all their fears and in great hopes and expectations to live quietly under their own vines and enjoy the benefit of their commendable labours i know it is by some reported that this mr bacon was a very hard drinker and that he died by imbibing or taking in too much brandy but i am informed by those who are persons of undoubted reputation and had the happiness to see the same letter which gave his majesty an account of his death that there was no such thing therein mentioned he was certainly a person endued with great natural parts which notwithstanding his juvenile extravagances he had adorned with many elaborate acquisitions and by the help of learning and study knew how to manage them to a miracle it being the general vogue of all that knew him that he usually spoke as much sense in as few words and delivered that sense as opportunely as any they ever kept company withal 
wherefore as i am myself a lover of ingenuity though an abhorrer of disturbance or rebellion i think fit since providence has pleased to let him die a natural death in his bed not to asperse him with saying he killed himself with drinking end of section twenty three Section 24 of Great Epics in American History, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Great Epics in American History, Volume 2. The Planting of the First Colonies, 1562 to 1733, by Francis Whiting Halsey. King Philip's War. 1676, by William Hubbard. The occasion of Philip's, so sudden, taking up arms the last year, was this. There was one John Sosaman, a very cunning and plausible Indian, well skilled in the English language and bred up in the profession of Christian religion, employed as a schoolmaster at Natick, the Indian town, who upon some misdemeanor fled from his place to Philip, by whom he was entertained in the room and office of secretary and his chief counselor, whom he trusted with all his affairs and secret counsels. But afterwards, whether upon the sting of his own conscience or by the frequent solicitations of Mr. Elliot, that had known him from a child, and instructed him in the principles of our religion, who was often laying before him the heinous sin of his apostasy, and returning back to his old vomit, he was at last prevailed with to forsake Philip, and return back to the Christian Indians at Natick, where he was baptized, manifested public repentance for all his former offenses, and made a serious profession of the Christian religion, and did apply himself to preach to the Indians, wherein he was better gifted than any other of the Indian nation, so as he was observed to conform more to the English manners than any other Indian. Yet, having occasion to go up with some others of his countrymen to Namaskit, whether for the advantage of fishing or some such occasion, it matters not, being there not far from Philip's country, he had occasion to be much in the company of Philip's Indians, and of Philip himself by which means he discerned by several circumstances that the Indians were plotting anew against us, that which out of faithfulness to the English the said Sossaman informed the governor of, adding also that if it were known that he revealed it, he knew they would presently kill him. There appearing so many concurrent testimonies from others, making it the more probable that there was certain truth in the information. Some inquiry was made into the business by examining Philip himself, several of his Indians, who, although they could do nothing, yet could not free themselves from just suspicion. Philip, therefore, soon after contrived the said Sossaman's death, which was strangely discovered. Notwithstanding, it was so cunningly effected, for they that murdered him met him upon the ice on a great pond, and presently after they had knocked him down put him under the ice yet leaving his gun and his hat upon the ice, that it might be thought he fell in accidentally through the ice and was drowned, but being missed by his friend, who, finding his hat and his gun, they were thereby led to the place where his body was found under the ice. When they took it up to bury him, some of his friends, especially one David, observed some bruises about his head, which made them suspect he was first knocked down before he was put into the water. However, they buried him near about the place where he was found, without making any further inquiry at present. Nevertheless, David, his friend, reported these things to some English at Taunton, a town not far from Namaskin. Occasioned the governor to inquire further into the business, wisely considering that, as Sossaman had told him, if it were known that he had revealed any of their plots, they would murder him for his pains. Wherefore, by special warrant, the body of Sossaman being digged again out of his grave, it was very apparent that he had been killed and not drowned. And by a strange providence, an Indian was found, that by accident was standing unseen upon a hill, had seen them murder, 
said Sossaman, but durst never reveal it for fear of losing his own life likewise, until he was called to the court at Plymouth, or before the governor, where he plainly confessed what he had seen. The murderers, being apprehended, were convicted by his undeniable testimony and other remarkable circumstance, and so were all put to death. Being but three in number, the last of them confessed immediately before his death, that his father, one of the counselors and special friends of Philip, was one of the two that murdered Sossaman, himself only looking on. This was done at Plymouth Court, held in June 1674. Insomuch that Philip, apprehending the danger his own head was in next, never used any further means to clear himself from what was like to be laid to his charge, either about his plotting against the English, nor yet about Sossaman's death, but by keeping his men continually about him in arms, and gathering what strangers he could to join with him, marching up and down constantly in arms, both all the while the court sat, as well as afterwards. The English of Plymouth, hearing all of this, yet took no further notice, then only to order a militia watch in all the adjacent towns, hoping that Philip, finding himself not likely to be arraigned by order of the said court, the present cloud might blow over, as some others of like nature had done before, but in conclusion the matter proved otherwise. For Philip, finding his strength daily increasing by the flocking of neighbor Indians unto him, and sending over their wives and children to the Narragansetts for security, as they used to do when they intend war with any of their enemies, immediately they began to alarm the English at Swansea, the next town to Philip's country, as it were daring the English to begin. At last, their insolences grew to such a height that they began not only to use threatening words to the English, but also to kill their cattle and rifle their houses, whereat an Englishman was so provoked that he let fly a gun at an Indian, but did only wound, not kill him. Whereupon the Indians immediately began to kill all the English they could, so as on the 24th of June, 1675, was the alarm of war first sounded in Plymouth Colony, when eight or nine of the English were slain in about Swansea. About this time several parties of English within Plymouth jurisdiction were willing to have a hand in so good a matter as catching of Philip would be, who, perceiving that he was now going down the wind, were willing to hasten his fall. Amongst others, a small party, July 31, 1676, went out of Bridgewater upon discovery, and by providence were directed to fall upon a company of Indians where Philip was. They came up with them, and killed some of his special friends. Philip himself was next to his uncle, that was shot down, and had the soldier had his choice which to shoot at, known which had been the right bird, he might as well have taken him as his uncle. But tis said that he had newly cut off his hair, that he might not be known. The party that did this exploit were few in number, and therefore not being able to keep altogether close in the rear, that cunning fox escaped away through the bushes undiscerned, in the rear of the English. Within two days after, Captain Church, the terror of the Indians in Plymouth Colony, marching in pursuit of Philip, with but thirty Englishmen and twenty reconciled Indians, took twenty-three of the enemy, and the next day, following them by their tracts, fell upon their headquarters, and killed and took about a hundred and thirty of them, but with the loss of one Englishman. In this engagement God did appear in a more than ordinary manner to fight for the English, for the Indians by their number, and other advantages of the place, were so conveniently provided that they might have made the first shot at the English, and done them much damage. But one of their own countrymen, in Captain Church's company, espying them, called aloud unto them in their own language, telling them that if they shot a gun they were all dead men, with which they were so amazed that they durst not once offer to fire at the English, which made the victory the more remarkable. Philip made a very narrow escape at that time, being forced to leave his treasures, his beloved wife, and only son to the mercy of the English, skin for skin. All that a man hath will he give for his life.
his ruin being thus gradually carried on, his misery was not prevented, but augmented thereby, being himself made acquainted with the sense and experimental feeling of the captivity of his children, loss of his friends, slaughter of his subjects, bereavement of all family relations, and being stripped of all outward comforts, before his own life should be taken away. Such sentence, sometimes passed upon Cain, made him cry out that his punishment was greater than he could bear. This bloody wretch had one week or two more to live, an object of pity, but a spectacle of divine vengeance, his own followers beginning now to plot against his life, to make the better terms for their own, as they did also seek to betray Squaw Sashim of Pokeset, Philip's near kinswoman and confederate. Philip, like a savage and wild beast, having been hunted by the English forces through the woods, above a hundred miles backward and forward, at last was driven to his own den upon Mount Hope, where retiring himself with a few of his best friends into a swamp, which proved but a prison to keep him safe, till the messengers of death came by divine permission to execute vengeance upon him, which was thus accomplished. Such had been his inveterate malice and wickedness against the English, that, despairing of mercy from them, he could not bear that anything should be suggested to him about a peace, insomuch as he caused one of his confederates to be killed for propounding an expedient of peace, which so provoked some of his company, not altogether so desperate as himself, that one of them, being near kin that was killed, fled to Rhode Island, whither that active champion Captain Church was newly retired to recruit his men for a little time, being much tired with hard marches all that week, informing them that Philip was fled to a swamp in Mount Hope, whither he would undertake to lead them that would pursue him. This was welcome news, and the best cordial for such martial spirits, whereupon he immediately, with a small company of men, part English and part Indians, began another march, which shall prove fatal to Philip, and end that controversy betwixt the English and him. For coming very early to the side of the swamp, his soldiers began presently to surround it, and whither the devil appeared to him in a dream that night, as he did unto Saul, foreboding his tragical end, it matters not. As he intended to make his escape out of the swamp, he was shot through the heart by an Indian of his own nation, as is said, that had all this while kept himself in a neutrality until this time, but now had the casting vote in his power, by which he determined the quarrel that had held so long in suspense. End of Section 24 Section 25 of Great Epics in American History, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Great Epics in American History, Volume 2. The Planting of the First Colonies, 1562-1733, by Francis Whiting Halsey. Section 25. The Founding of Pennsylvania. 1. Penn's Account of the Colony, 1684. The first planters in these parts were the Dutch, and soon after them the Swedes and Finns. The Dutch applied themselves to traffic, the Swedes and Finns to husbandry. There were some disputes between them for some years, the Dutch looking upon them as intruders upon their purchase and possession which was finally ended in the surrender made by John Rising, the Swedish governor, to Peter Stuyvesant, governor for the States of Holland, anno 1655. The Dutch inhabit mostly those parts of the province that lie upon or near the bay, and the Swedes the freshest of the river Delaware. There is no need of giving any description of them, who are better known there than here, but they are a plain, strong, industrious people yet have made no great progress in culture or propagation of fruit trees, as if they desired rather to have enough than plenty or traffic. But I presume the Indians made them the more careless by furnishing them with the means of profit, to wit, skins and furs for rum and such strong liquors. They kindly received me as well as the English, 
who were few before the people concerned with me came among them i must needs commend their respect to authority and kind behaviour to the english they do not degenerate from the old friendship between both kingdoms as they are people proper and strong of body so they have fine children and almost every house full rare to find one of them without three or four boys and as many girls some six seven and eight sons and i must do them that right i see few young men more sober and laborious the dutch have a meeting-place for religious worship at newcastle and the swedes three one at christina one at tenicum and one at wicoco within half a mile of this town there rests that i speak of the condition we are in and what settlement we have made in which i will be as short as i can the country lieth bounded on the east by the river and bay of delaware and eastern sea it hath the advantage of many creeks or rivers that run into the main river or bay some navigable for great ships some for small craft those of most eminency are christina brandywine skillpot and schoolkill any one of which has room to lay up the royal navy of england there being from four to eight fathom of water the lesser creeks or rivers yet convenient for sloops and catches of good burthen are lewis mispillion cedar dover cranbrook feversham and george's below and chichester chester tuacani pomapica porquesson neshemenk and penbury in the freshes many lesser that admit boats and shallops our people are mostly settled upon the upper rivers which are pleasant and sweet and generally bounded with good land the planted part of the province and territories is cast into six counties philadelphia buckingham chester newcastle kent and sussex containing about four thousand souls two general assemblies have been held and with such concord and dispatch that they sat but three weeks and at least seventy laws were passed without one dissent in any material thing but of this more hereafter being yet raw and new in our gear however i cannot forget their singular respect to me in this infancy of things who by their own private expenses so early considered mine for the public as to present me with an impost upon certain goods imported and exported which after my acknowledgment of their affection i did as freely remit to the province and the traders to it and for the well government of the said counties courts of justice are established in every county with proper officers as justices sheriffs clerks constables which courts are held every two months but to prevent lawsuits there are three peacemakers chosen by every county court to hear and end differences between man and man and spring and fall there is an orphans court in each county to inspect and regulate the affairs of orphans and widows philadelphia the expectation of those who are concerned in this province is at last laid out to the great content of those here who are anyways interested therein the situation is a neck of land and lieth between two navigable rivers delaware and schuylkill whereby it hath two fronts upon the water each a mile and two from river to river delaware is a glorious river but the schuylkill being a hundred miles boatable above the falls and its course northeast toward the fountain of susquehanna that tends to be the heart of the province and both sides our own it is like to be a great part of the settlement of this age i say little of the town itself because a platform will be shown you by my agent in which those who are purchasers of me will find their names and interests but this i will say for the good providence of god that of all the many places i have seen in the world i remember not one better seated so that it seems to me to have been appointed for a town whether we regard the rivers or the conveniency of the coves ducks and springs the loftiness and soundness of the land and the air held by the people of those parts to be very good it has advanced within less than a year to about fourscore houses and cottages such as they are where merchants and handicrafts are following their vocations as fast as they can while the countrymen are close at their farms 
some of them got a little winter corn in the ground last season and the generality have a handsome summer crop and are preparing for their winter corn they reap their barley this year in the month called may the wheat in the month following so that there is time in these parts for another crop of divers things before the winter season we are daily in hopes of shipping to add to our number for blessed be god here is both room and accommodation for them the stores of our necessity being either the fear of our friends or the scarecrows of our enemies for the greatest hardship we have suffered hath been salt meat which by fowl in winter and fish in summer together with some poultry lamb mutton veal and plenty of venison the best part of the year hath been made very passable i bless god i am fully satisfied with the country and entertainment i got in it for i find that particular content which hath always attended me where god in his providence hath made it my place and service to reside you cannot imagine my station can be at present free of more than ordinary business and as such i may say it is a troublesome work but the method things are putting in will facilitate the charge and give an easier motion to the administration of affairs however as it is some men's duty to plough some to sow some to water and some to reap so it is the wisdom as well as the duty of a man to yield to the mind of providence and cheerfully as well as carefully embrace and follow the guidance of it end of section twenty five Section twenty six of Great Epics in American History, Volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Great Epics in American History, Volume two. The Planting of the First Colonies, fifteen sixty two to seventeen thirty three, by Francis Whiting Halsey. Section twenty six. The Founding of Pennsylvania, Part two penn's treaty with the indians sixteen eighty three his own account every king hath his counsel and that consists of all the old and wise men of his nation which perhaps is two hundred people nothing of moment is undertaken be it war peace selling of land or traffic without advising with them and which is more with the young men too it is admirable to consider how powerful the kings are and yet how they move by the breath of their people i have had occasion to be in council with them upon treaties for land and to adjust the terms of trade their order is thus the king sits in the middle of an half moon and has his council the old and wise on each hand behind them or at a little distance sit the younger fry in the same figure having consulted and resolved their business the king ordered one of them to speak to me he stood up came to me and in the name of the king saluted me then took me by the hand and told me that he was ordered by his king to speak to me and that now it was not he but the king who spoke because what he should say was the king's mind he first prayed me to excuse them that they had not complied with me the last time he feared there might be some fault in the interpreter being neither indian nor english besides it was the indian custom to deliberate and take up much time in council before they resolved and that if the young people and owners of the land had been as ready as he i had not met with so much delay having thus introduced his matter he fell to the bounds of the land they had agreed to dispose of and the price which now is little and dear that which would have bought twenty miles not by now two during the time that this person spoke not a man of them was observed to whisper or smile the old grave the young reverent in their deportment they speak little but fervently and with elegance i have never seen more natural sagacity considering them without the help i was going to say the spoil of tradition and he will deserve the name of wise who outwits them in any treaty about a thing they understand when the purchase was agreed great promises passed between us of kindness and good neighbourhood and that the english and indians must live in love as long as the sun gave light 
which done another made a speech to the indians in the name of all the sacha makers or kings first to tell them what was done next to charge and command them to love the christians and particularly to live in peace with me and the people under my government that many governors had been in the river but that no governor had come himself to live and stay here before and having now such a one who had treated them well they should never do him or his any wrong at every sentence of which they shouted and said amen in their way we have agreed that in all differences between us six of each side shall end the matter do not abuse them but let them have justice and you win them end of section twenty six Section 27 of Great Epochs in American History, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Great Epochs in American History, Volume 2. The Planting of the First Colonies, 1562 to 1733, by Francis Whiting Halsey. Section 27 the founding of pennsylvania part three the reality of penn's treaty sixteen eighty two by george e ellis there has been much discussion of late years concerning the far-famed treaty of penn with the indians a circumstance which has all the interest both of fact and of poetry was confirmed by such unbroken testimony of tradition that history seemed to have innumerable records of it in the hearts and memories of each generation but as there appears no document or parchment of such criteria as to satisfy all inquiries historical scepticism has ventured upon the absurd length of calling in question the fact of the treaty the historical society of pennsylvania with commendable zeal has bestowed much labor upon the questions connected with the treaty and the results which have been attained can scarcely fail to satisfy a candid inquirer all claim to a peculiar distinction for william penn on account of the singularity of his just proceedings in this matter is candidly waived because the swedes the dutch and the english had previously dealt thus justly with the natives it is in comparison with pizarro and cortez that the colonists of all other nations in america appear to an advantage but the fame of william penn stands and ever will stand pre-eminent for the unexceptionable justice and peace in his relations with the natives penn had several meetings for conference and treaties with the indians besides those which he held for the purchase of lands but unbroken and reverently cherished tradition beyond all possibility of contradiction has designated one great treaty held under a large elm tree at shakamaxon now kensington a treaty which voltaire justly characterizes as never sworn to and never broken in penn's letter to the free society of traders dated august sixteenth sixteen eighty three he refers to his conferences with the indians two deeds conveying land to him are on record both of which bear an earlier date than this letter namely june twenty third and july fourteenth of the same year he had designed to make a purchase in may but having been called off to a conference with lord baltimore he postponed the business till june the great treaty was doubtless unconnected with the purchase of land and was simply a treaty of amity and friendship in confirmation of one previously held by penn's direction by markham on the same spot that being a place which the indians were wont to use for this purpose it is probable that the treaty was held on the last of november sixteen eighty two that the delawares the mingos and other susquehanna tribes formed a large assembly on the occasion that written minutes of the conference were made and were in possession of governor gordon who states nine conditions as belonging to them in seventeen twenty eight but are now lost and that the substance of the treaty is given in penn's letter to the free traders these results are satisfactory and are sufficient corroborated by known facts and documents the great treaty being distinct from a land purchase is significantly distinguished in history and tradition 
the inventions of romance and imagination could scarcely gather round this engaging incident attractions surpassing its own simple and impressive interest doubtless clarkson has given a fair representation of it if we merely disconnect from his account the statement that the indians were armed and all that confounds the treaty of friendship with the purchase of lands penn wore a sky-blue sash of silk around his waist as the most simple badge the pledges there given were to hold their sanctity while the creeks and rivers run and while the sun moon and stars endure while the whites preserved in written records the memory of such covenants the indians had their methods for perpetuating in safe channels their own relations they cherished in grateful regard they repeated to their children and to the whites the terms of the great treaty the delawares called william penn miquan in their own language though they seem to have adopted the name given him by the iroquois onas both which terms signify a quill or pen benjamin west's picture of the treaty is too imaginative for a historical piece he makes pen of a figure and aspect which would have become twice the years that had passed over his head the elm tree was spared in the war of the american revolution when there was distress for firewood the british officer simcoe having placed a sentinel beneath it for protection it was prostrated by the wind upon the night of saturday march three eighteen ten it was of gigantic size and the circles around its heart indicated an age of nearly three centuries a piece of it was sent to the penn mansion at stoke poges in england where it is properly commemorated a marble monument with suitable inscription was placed by the penn society a d eighteen twenty seven to mark the site of the great elm tree End of section 27section 28 of great epochs in american history volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by larry wilson great epochs in american history volume 2 the planting of the first colonies 1562 1733 by francis whiting halsey the charter oak affair in connecticut sixteen eighty two by alexander johnston in december sixteen eighty six the hartford authorities were called upon to measure their strength again with their old antagonist andros had landed at boston commissioned as governor of all new england and bent on abrogating the charters following dudley's lead he wrote to treat suggesting that by this time the trial of the writs had certainly gone against the colony and that the authorities would do much to commend the colony to his majesty's good pleasure by entering a formal surrender of the charter the colony authorities were possibly as well versed in the law of the case as andros and they took good care to do nothing of the sort and as the event showed they thus saved the charter the assembly met as usual on october sixteen eighty seven but their records show that they were in profound doubt and distress andros was with them accompanied by some sixty regular soldiers to enforce his demand for the charter it is certain that he did not get it though the records as usual are cautious enough to give no reason why tradition is responsible for the story of the charter oak the assembly had met the royal governor in the meeting-house the demand for the charter had been made and the assembly had exhausted the resources of language to show to andros how dear it was to them and how impossible it was to give it up andros was immovable he had watched that charter with longing eyes from the banks of the hudson and he had no intention of giving up his object now that the king had put him in power on the banks of the connecticut toward evening the case had become desperate the little democracy was at last driven into a corner where its old policy seemed no longer available it must resist openly or make a formal surrender of its charter just as the lights were lighted the legal authorities yielded so far as to order the precious document to be brought in and laid on the table before the eyes of andros then came a little more debate suddenly the lights were blown out 
Captain Wadworth of Hartford carried off the charter and hid it in the hollow oak tree on the estate of Wallace's, just across the riverette. And when the lights were relighted, the colony was no longer able to comply with Andrew's demand for a surrender. Although the account of the affair is traditional, it is difficult to see any good grounds for impeaching it on that account. It supplies in the simplest and most natural manner a blank in the Hartford proceedings of Andros, which would otherwise be quite unaccountable. His plain purpose was to force Connecticut into a position where she must either surrender the charter or resist openly. He failed. The charter never was in his possession, and the official records assign no reason for his failure. The colony was too prudent, and Andros too proud, to put the true reason on record. Tradition supplies the gap with an exactness which proves itself. Having done all that men could do, Treat and his associates bowed for the time to superior force. Andros was allowed to read his commission. Fitzjohn and Waite Winthrop and John Allen received appointments as members of his council for New England. John Allen made what the governor doubtless considered to be the closing record for all time. But it is noteworthy that the record was so written as to flatter Andros' vanity, while it really put in terms a declaration of overpowering force, on which the Commonwealth finally succeeded in saving her charter from invalidation. It is as follows, quote, At a general court at Hartford, October 31, 1887, His Excellency Sir Edmund Andros, Knight and Captain General and Governor of His Majesty's Territories and Dominions in New England, by order of His Majesty James the Second, King of England, Scotland, France, and Ireland, the 31st of October, 1687, took into his hands the government of the colony of Connecticut, it being by His Majesty annexed to Massachusetts and other colonies under His Excellency's government. Phoenix, unquote. The government was destined to last far longer than either the governor or his government. But while it lasted, Andros government was bitterly hated, and with good reason. The reasons are more peculiarly appropriate to the history of Massachusetts, where they were felt more keenly than in Connecticut. But even in Connecticut, poor as was the field for plunder, and distant as it was from the ring which surrounded Andros, the exactions of the new system were well nigh intolerable to a people whose annual expense of government had been carefully kept down to the lowest limits so that, says Bancroft, they did not exceed four thousand dollars, and the wages of the chief justice were ten shillings a day while on service. April 1689 came at last. The people of Boston, at the first news of the English Revolution, clapped Andros into custody. May ninth, the old Connecticut authorities quietly resumed their functions and called the assembly together for the following month. William and Mary were proclaimed with great favor. Not a word was said about the disappearance or reappearance of the charter, but the charter government was put into full effect again, as if Andros had never interrupted it. An address was sent to the king asking that the charter be no further interfered with, but operations under it went on as before. No decided action was taken by the home government for some years, except that its appointment of the New York governor, Fletcher, to the command of the Connecticut militia, implied a decision that the Connecticut charter had been superseded. Late in 1693, Fitzjohn Winthrop was sent to England as agent to obtain a confirmation of the charter. He secured an emphatic legal opinion from Attorney General Summers, backed by those of Treby and Ward, that the charter was entirely valid, Treby's concurrent opinion taking this shape. Quote, I am of the same opinion, and as this matter is stated, there is no ground of doubt, unquote. The basis of the opinion was that the charter had been granted under the great seal, that it had not been surrendered under the common seal of the colony, nor had any judgment of record been entered against it, that its operation had merely been interfered with by overpowering force, that the charter, therefore, remained valid and that the peaceable submission of the colony to Andros was merely an illegal suspension of lawful authority. In other words, the passive attitude of the colonial government had disarmed Andros so far as to stop the legal proceedings, 
necessary to forfeit the charter, and then prompt action at the critical moment secured all that could be secured under the circumstances. William was willing enough to retain all possible fruits of Jane's tyranny, as he showed by enforcing the forfeiture of the Massachusetts charter. But the law in this case was too plain, and he ratified the lawyer's opinion in April 1694. The charter had escaped its enemies at last, and its escape is a monument of one of the advantages of a real democracy. End of section 28「Section 29 of Great Epochs in American History, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, in February 2020. Great Epics in American History, Volume 2, The Planting of the First Colonies, 1562-1713, through 1713, by Francis Whiting Housley. Section 29, The Colonization of Louisiana, 1699, by Charles E. T. Gayare. Footnote from Gayare's History of Louisiana, 1847. La Salle's expedition to the mouth of the Mississippi, when he took possession of the country, in the name of the King of France, had taken place in 1682. Louis XIV, in 1689, sent out an expedition to colonize the lower Mississippi. It comprised about 200 men and was commanded by Sieur de Thurville. Among his companions were two brothers, one of whom, Sieur de Bienville, was the real founder of New Orleans, and long served as governor of Louisiana. Guerre describes the arrival and experiences of these brothers. Guerre lived in New Orleans. He began to practice law there in 1880, and afterwards served as a reporter to the state Supreme Court. He died in 1895. End footnote. On February 27, 1699, Iberville and Bienville reached the Mississippi. When they approached its mouth, they were struck with the gloomy magnificence of the sight. As far as the eye could reach, nothing was to be seen but reeds which rose five or six feet above the waters in which they bathed their roots. They waved mournfully under the blast of the sharp wind of the north, shivering in its icy grasp as it tumbled, rolled, and gambled on the pliant surface. Multitudes of birds of strange appearance, with their elongated shapes so lean that they looked like metamorphosized ghosts, clothed in plumage, screamed in the air as if they were scared of one another. There was something agonizing in their shrieks that was in harmony with the desolation of the place. On every side of the vessel, monsters of the deep and huge alligators heaved themselves up heavily from their native or favorite element, and floating lazily on the turbid waters seemed to gaze at the intruders. It was a relief for the adventurers when, after having toiled up the river for ten days, they at last arrived at the village of the Bayagalas. There they found a letter of Tonti to La Salle, dated in 1685. The letter, or rather the speaking bark, as the Indians called it, had been preserved with great reverence. Tonti, having been informed that La Salle was coming with a fleet from France to settle a colony on the banks of the Mississippi, had not hesitated to set off from the northern lakes with twenty Canadians and thirty Indians, and to come down to the Balize to meet his friend, who had failed to make out the mouth of the Mississippi, and had been landed by Beaujeu on the shores of Texas. After having waited for some time, and ignorant of what had happened, Tonti, with the same indifference to fatigues and dangers of an appalling nature, retraced his way back, leaving a letter to La Salle to inform him of his disappointment. Is there not something extremely romantic in the characters of the men of that epoch? Here is Tonti undertaking, with the most heroic unconcern, a journey of nearly three thousand miles, through such difficulties as it is easy for us to imagine, and leaving a letter to La Salle as a proof of his visit, in the same way that one would, in these degenerate days of effeminacy, leave a card at a neighbor's house. 
the french extended their explorations up to the mouth of the red river on their return the two brothers separated when they arrived at bayou manchac bienville was ordered to go down the river to the french fleet to give information of what they had seen and heard iberville went through bayou manchac to those lakes which are known under the names of Pontchartrain and Maurepas. Louisiana had been named for a king. Was it not in keeping that those lakes should be called after ministers? From the Bay of St. Louis, Iberville returned to his fleet, where, after consultation, he determined to make a settlement at the Bay of Biloxi. On the east side, at the mouth of the bay, as it were, there is a slight swelling of the shore, about four acres, sloping gently to the woods in the background and on the bay. Thus this position was fortified by nature, and the French skillfully availed themselves of these advantages. The weakest point, which was on the side of the forest, they strengthened with more care than the rest by connecting with a strong entrenchment the two ravines which ran to the bay in a parallel line to each other. The fort was constructed with four bastions and was armed with twelve pieces of artillery. A few huts having been erected round the fort, the settlers began to clear the land in order to bring it into cultivation. Iberville, having furnished them with all the necessary provisions, utensils, and other supplies, prepared to sail for France. As the country had been ordered to be explored, Savole availed himself of that circumstance to refresh the minds of his men by the excitement of an expedition into the interior of the continent. He therefore hastened to dispatch most of them with Bienville, who, with a chief of the Biagolas for his guide, went to visit the Colapisas. They inhabited the northern shore of Lake Pontchartrain, and their domains embraced the sites now occupied by Louisbourg, Mandeville, and Fontainebleau. Iberville had been gone for several months, and the year was drawing to a close without any tidings of him. A deeper gloom had settled over the little colony at Biloxi, when on December the 7th some signal guns were heard at sea, and the grateful sound came booming over the waters, spreading joy in every breast. It was Iberville returning with the news that, on his representations, Savole had been appointed by the king, governor of Louisiana, Bienville, lieutenant governor, and Boisbriand, commander of the fort at Biloxi, with the grade of major. Iberville, having been informed by Bienville of the attempt of the English to make a settlement on the banks of the Mississippi, and of the manner in which it had been foiled, resolved to take precautionary measures against the repetition of any similar attempt. Without loss of time, he departed with Bienville on January 16, 1700, and running up the river, he constructed a small fort on the first solid ground which he met, and which is said to have been at a distance of 54 miles from its mouth. When so engaged, the two brothers one day saw a canoe rapidly sweeping down the river and approaching the spot where they stood. It was occupied by eight men, six of whom were rowers, the seventh was the steersman, and the eighth, from his appearance, was evidently of a superior order to that of his companions, and the commander of the party. Well may it be imagined what greeting the stranger received, when leaping on shore he made himself known as Chevalier de Tonti, who had again heard of the establishment of a colony in Louisiana, and who for the second time had come to see if there was any truth in the report. With what emotion did Thurville and Bienville fold in their arms the faithful companion and friend of La Salle, of whom they had heard so many wonderful tales from the Indians, to whom he was so well known under the name of Iron Hand? With what admiration they looked at his person, and with what increasing interest they listened to his long recitals of what he had done and had seen on that broad continent, the threshold of which they had hardly passed. After having rested three days at the fort, the indefatigable Tonti reascended the Mississippi with Iberville and Bienville and finally parted with them at Natchez. Iberville was so much pleased with that part of the bank of the river where now exists the city of Natchez that he marked it down as the most eligible spot for a town of which he drew the plan and which he called Rosalie after the maiden name of the Countess Pontchartrain, the wife of the Chancellor. 
he then returned to the new fort he was erecting on the mississippi and bienville went to explore the country of the yatassis of the nakatoches and of the wachitas what romance can be more agreeable to the imagination than to accompany iberville and bienville in their wild explorations and to compare the state of the country in their time with what it is in our days after these explorations iberville departed again for france to solicit additional assistance from the government and left bienville in command of the new fort on the mississippi it was very hard for the two brothers savole and bienville to be thus separated when they stood so much in need of each other's countenance to breast the difficulties that sprung up around them with the luxuriance which they seemed to borrow from the vegetation of the country the distance between the mississippi and biloxi was not so easily overcome in those days as in ours and the means which the two brothers had of communing together were very scanty and uncertain savole died august twenty second seventeen o one and louisiana remained under the sole charge of bienville who though very young was fully equal to meet that emergency by the maturity of his mind and by his other qualifications he had hardly consigned his brother to the tomb when iberville returned with two ships of the line and a brig laden with troops and provisions according to iberville's orders and in conformity with the king's instructions bienville left boisbriand his cousin with twenty men at the old fort of biloxi and transported the principal seat of the colony to the western side of the river mobile not far from the spot where now stands the city of mobile near the mouth of that river there is an island which the french had called massacre island from the great quantity of human bones which they found bleaching on its shores it was evident that there some awful tragedy had been acted but tradition when interrogated laid her choppy fingers upon her skinny lips and answered not the year seventeen o three slowly rolled by and gave way to seventeen o four still nothing was heard from the parent country there seemed to be an impassable barrier between the old and the new continent the milk which flowed from the motherly breast of france could no longer reach the parched lips of her newborn infant and famine began to pinch the colonists who scattered themselves all along the coast to live by fishing they were reduced to the various extremity of misery and despair had settled in every bosom in spite of the encouragements of bienville who displayed the most manly fortitude amid all the trials to which he was subjected iberville had not been able to redeem his pledge to the poor colonists but he sent his brother chateauguay in his place at the eminent risk of being captured by the english who occupied at that time most of the avenues of the gulf of mexico he was not the man to spare either himself or his family in cases of emergency and his heroic soul was inured to such sacrifices grateful the colonists were for this act of devotedness and they resumed the occupation of their tenements which they had abandoned in search of food the aspect of things was suddenly changed abundance and hope reappeared in the land whose population was increased by the arrival of seventeen persons who came under the guidance of chateau with the intention of making a permanent settlement and who had provided themselves with all the implements of husbandry this excitement had hardly subsided when it was revived by the appearance of another ship and it became intense when the inhabitants saw a procession of twenty females with veiled faces proceeding arm in arm and two by two to the house of the governor who received them in state and provided them with suitable lodgings what did it mean the next morning which was sunday the mystery was cleared by the officiating priest reading from the pulpit after mass the following communication from the minister to bienville quote, his majesty sends twenty girls to be married to the canadians and to the other inhabitants of mobile in order to consolidate the colony all these girls are industrious and have received a pious and virtuous education you will take care to settle them in life as well as may be in your power and to marry them to such men as are capable of providing them with a commodious home End quote. many were the jibes and high was the glee on that occasion 
pointed were the jokes aimed at young bienville on his being thus transformed into a matrimonial agent and patrifamilia the intentions of the king however were faithfully executed and more than one rough but honest canadian boatman of the st lawrence and of the mississippi closed his adventurous and erratic career and became a domestic and useful member of that little commonwealth under the watchful influence of the dark-eyed maid of the loire or of the seine end of section twenty nine Section 30 of Great Epochs in American History, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Great Epochs in American History, Volume 2. The Planting of the First Colonies, 1562 through 1733, by Francis Whiting Halsey. Section 30. Oglethorpe in Georgia. 1733 by joel chandler harris general james edward oglethorpe the founder of the colony of georgia was among the few really good and great men that history tells us of we need to keep a close eye on the antics of history she places the laurels of fame in the hands of butchers plunderers and adventurers and even assassins share her favors so that if we are going to enjoy the feast that history offers us we must not inquire too closely into the characters of the men whom she makes heroes of. We find, when we come to look into the matter, that but few of those who figured as the great men of the world have been entirely unselfish, and unselfishness is the test of a man who is really good and great. Judged by this test, General Oglethorpe stands among the greatest men known to history. Born in 1689, Oglethorpe entered the English army when 21 years of age, in 1714 he became the captain-lieutenant of the first troop of the Queen's Life Guards. He shortly afterward joined Eugene on the continent, and remained with that soldier until the peace of 1718. On the death of his brother he seceded to the family estate in England. In 1722 he was elected to Parliament from Haslemere, county of Surrey, and in this borough he represented continuously for 32 years. His parliamentary career was marked by wise prudence and consistency, and his sympathies were warmly enlisted for the relief of unfortunate soldiers and in securing reform in the conduct of prisons. In this way, Oglethorpe became a philanthropist, and without intending it, attracted the attention of all England. Pope the poet eulogizes his strong benevolence of soul. In that day and time, men were imprisoned for debt in England and those who executed it were cruel. There was no discrimination between fraud and misfortune. The man who was unable to pay his debts was judged to be as criminal as the man who, though able, refused to pay. This condition of affairs Oglethorpe set himself to reform, and while thus engaged he became impressed with the idea that many of the unfortunates, guilty of no crime and of respectable connections, might benefit themselves relieve England of the shame of their imprisonment, and confirm and extend the dominion of the mother country in the New World by being freed from the claims of those to whom they owed money on condition that they would consent to become colonists in America. To this class were to be added recruits from those who, through lack of work and of means, were likely to be imprisoned on account of their misfortunes. Oglethorpe was also of the opinion that men of means, enterprise, and ambition could be enlisted in the cause, and in this he was not mistaken. He had no hope whatever of personal gain or private benefit. The plan that he had conceived was entirely for the benefit of the unfortunate, based on broad and high ideals of benevolence. And so thoroughly was this understood that Oglethorpe had no difficulty whatever in securing the aid of men of wealth and influence. A charter or grant from the government was applied for, in order that the scheme might have the sanction and authority of the government. Accordingly, a charter was granted, and the men most prominent in the scheme of benevolence were incorporated under the name of the Trustees for Establishing the Colony of Georgia in America. Georgia in America was, under the terms of the charter, a pretty large slice of America. It embraced all that part of the continent lying between the Savannah and Altamaha rivers, 
and extending westly from the heads of these rivers in direct lines to the south seas so that the original territory of georgia extended from ocean to ocean in aid of this enterprise oglethorpe not only contributed largely from his private means and solicited contributions from his wealthy friends but wrote a tract in which he used arguments that were practical as well as ingenious on the seventeenth of november seventeen thirty two all arrangements having been completed the Anne set sail for the colony of georgia accompanied by oglethorpe who furnished his own cabin and laid in provisions not only for himself but for his fellow passengers on the thirteenth of january seventeen thirty three the Anne anchored in charleston harbor from charleston the vessel sailed to port royal and the colonists were soon quartered in the barracks of beaufort town which had been prepared for their reception oglethorpe left the colonists at beaufort and in company with colonel william bull proceeded to the savannah river he went up this stream as far as yamacra bluff which he selected as the site of the settlement he was about to make he marked out the town and named it savannah the site was a beautiful one in oglethorpe's day and it is still more beautiful now the little settlement that the founder of the colony marked out has grown into a flourishing city and art has added its advantages to those of nature to make savannah one of the most beautiful cities in the united states on the thirtieth of january seventeen thirty three the immigrants set sail for butford and on the afternoon of the next day they arrived at yamacraw bluff on the side of the town that had already been marked off they pitched four tents large enough to accommodate all the people oglethorpe after posting his sentinels slept on the ground under the shelter of the tall pines near the central fire watch as a soldier should he slept soundly he had planted the new colony and thus far all had gone well with him and with those whose interest he had charge of to bring these colonists across the ocean and place them in a position where they might begin life anew was not a very difficult undertaking but to plant a colony amongst savages already suspicious of the whites and to succeed in obtaining their respect friendship and aid was something that required wisdom courage prudence and large experience this oglethorpe did and it is to his credit that during the time he had charge of the colony he never in any shape or form took advantage of the ignorance of the indians his method of dealing with them was very simple he conciliated them by showing them that the whites could be just fair and honorable in their dealings and thus in the very beginning he won the friendship of those whose enmity to the little colony would have proved ruinous providence favored oglethorpe in this matter he had to deal with an indian chief full of years wisdom and experience this was tomo chichi who was at the head of the yamacraws from this kindly indian the georgia colony received untold benefits he remained the steadfast friend of the settlers and used his influence in their behalf in every possible way and on all occasions although he was a very old man he was strong and active and of commanding presence he possessed remarkable intelligence and this added to his experience made him one of the most remarkable of the indians whose names have been preserved in history thus with oglethorpe to direct it and with tomochichi as his friend the little georgia colony was founded thrived and flourished end of section thirty end of great epochs in american history volume two by francis whiting palsy